What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was in Marvel as Spider-Man? Conqueror of Multiverse. Part 6. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Wait! Loki calls out with a frown just as Natasha was leading Matt and Jessica out of the room. Everything was taken care of and signed, making both of them official members of the Avengers. All that was left was a tour of the tower, as well as the facilities that they would be using during Natasha's training lessons. Yeah! Peter asks as the group turns around. What's the matter, Loki? Jessica asks with a raised eyebrow. I. Loki starts, but soon goes quiet as a constipated look appears on his face. You know what? It doesn't matter. Loki stood up and walked past the group towards the elevators. I'll see you back at the office. Loki called out as he rounded the corner and disappeared from sight. What was that about? Peter turns to Jessica and asks. I don't know, but he seemed more annoyed and angry than usual. There's no way in hell I, Loki Odinson, former king of Asgard, would join a group of do-gooders. Loki thought, disdainfully, as he stormed down the crowded sidewalks of New York City. Earlier in the conference room, Loki was only inches away from offering to join up with the Avengers alongside Jessica. Sadly, his pride got in the way and stopped him from following the only woman whom he's ever felt something for. Well, besides his mother, though it was certainly a different kind of feeling. Loki just wanted to stay by her side, as she made his mortal exile exciting and worthwhile. That damn spider ruined everything. Loki muttered as he kicked a beggar's cup, spraying coins everywhere. Hey! What the hell, man? The beggar yelled as he scrambled to collect his daily earnings. Disgusting mortals? Loki comments with a sneer. Get a job, you filthy bum! Loki continued taking out his misguided anger on the passing pedestrians. Some saw Loki's actions as a man looking for a fight and gave him exactly what he wanted, though they were all beaten fairly easily. When Loki began to calm down, the sun started to set, and he found himself in Central Park, where a sort of fair seemed to be going on. Families rushed through the area, each of them pulled by excited children as they rushed to play games and line up for the rides. Loki sat on a nearby bench and watched the families and couples passing by. He wondered what it would have been like if he was taken in by a normal family, like these mortals. Being adopted into royalty was like being born into a job. Loki and Thor never had moments like this. Their father was a hard and stern man. Although he was loving and warm on occasion, those times were few and far between. Unknowingly, a small bit of jealousy invaded the banished Jotun's heart, as he watched the smiling children frolic around with their parents. Just I? Loki muttered in contempt. A passing family seemed to overhear his words and sped up their steps, pulling their children away from the unhinged man. Suddenly, as Loki was wishing death on all the happy families, multiple blacked-out cars drove into the park from all sides. Question mark. Loki and everyone else that noticed in time turned around in shock as they watched masked gunmen of all kinds step out of the cars, armed to the teeth with automatic weapons in hand. What appeared to be three separate groups took aim and started firing at one another. Each group was masked up, though their clothing and accents showed a possible gang affiliation. One group was dressed in all-black tactical gear, though they spoke nothing but Spanish, so that narrowed down their affiliation. Some sort of cartel. Another group was dressed in black as well, yet they didn't have any tactical gear, just huge guns. They spoke with heavy Irish accents. Irish mob perhaps? The final group was like night and day compared to the other two. Although they pulled up in blacked-out cars, each of them wore a decorated leather biker cut, which proudly said dogs of hell on the back. Are these mortals crazy? Loki was beyond confused as he watched this oddly set up firefight start with an entire fair full of innocent people in the crossfire. Just as Loki was watching the show unfold, a stray bullet flew by and embedded itself into his arm. Ugh. Loki grunted in pain as he grabbed his arm and jumped over the bench, taking cover behind a nearby trash can. Mortal trash. Loki wasn't the type of person to take an attack on his person lying down, though he wasn't exactly armed to compete with firearms. If they were armed with cold weapons, like swords or baseball bats, then Loki could enact his revenge in an instant, but sadly that wasn't the case. Thinking quickly, Loki grabbed the phone that Jessica gave him and made a call to the only number saved in his contacts. If I can't act myself, others can do it for me. Minutes earlier? On the opposite side of the fair, a man with a military-style haircut was seated at a picnic table alongside his beautiful wife and children. Insert picture of Frank Castle slash Punisher here, Frank Castle is an extremely skilled United States Marine. He recently took a leave of absence to spend some quality time with his family, as he's rarely home. 
He has served all across the world but mainly in Afghanistan as of late. Upon his return, Castle began to realize just how weary he had become from all of his time in combat and away from his own beloved family. I can't believe you're eating that deep-fried cheeseburger, Frank's wife, Maria, says with thinly veiled disgust, as her husband takes a large bite of the fried dough-covered monstrosity. Wah! It's good, what? It's good! Frank answers with food stuffed in his cheeks. Daddy, don't talk with your mouth full. Lisa, Frank's daughter, reprimands him as her mother does to her and her brother. Frank Jr., the Punisher's only son, just shakes his head as he throws a fried Oreo into his mouth. His mother wasn't happy about his food choice either, though she held her tongue as it wasn't as crazy as what his father was eating. Daddy, when do you leave again? Lisa asks sadly, knowing this reunion wouldn't last for long. Instantly, all eyes were on him, waiting for an answer. I don't know. Frank swallowed his food and spoke unsurely. I might stay a bit longer this time around. Really? Lisa and Frank Jr. exclaimed hopefully as they practically jumped out of their seats. Weren't you going to apply for another tour? Maria asks, as she didn't want her children to get their hopes up for nothing. After all, she knew that her husband loved being a Marine. No, I think I'm going to wait for a bit and then make a decision. Frank shakes his head as he goes back to stuffing his face. What Maria and his family didn't know, is that Frank lost a lot of his brothers in the last mission they took. What was supposed to be a surprise raid on a terrorist stronghold was actually an ambush that he and his men walked straight into. A part of him wondered whether he would ever want to return to the Marines again. After all, he served enough to live off of retired military pay for the rest of his life. The Castle family seemed to brighten after hearing this, as they sat and ate together with smiles on their faces. Even Frank, who is a fairly stoic man, was smiling as he enjoyed the atmosphere of family life. Soon enough, the unthinkable happened. Automatic gunfire tore through the park as bullets filled the fairground. Exclamation point. Frank instantly jumped into action, as his time in the Marines was full of situations like this, though he was a split second too late. As if the surrounding gunmen were purposefully aiming in their direction, countless bullets were hurled his way, drilling holes into his oblivious wife and children. Frank froze in horror as his family toppled over and hit the ground. Daddy. It hurts. Little Lisa cried out as she coughed up a mouthful of blood. Frank, the kids. His bleeding wife crawled to cover her children with her body as she looked to her husband to save them. Frank Jr. wasn't responsive as he lay there unconscious and covered in blood. Just as Frank was about to hop into action, a string of bullets peppered his chest, sending him crashing to the floor alongside his dying family. Having failed to act in time, Frank was forced to look on helplessly, in utter horror, as his own wife, son, and daughter began to bleed out on the cold hard floor. And lastly, this is one of the apartment floors, Natasha finished the tour by showing Matt and Jessica the apartments. As members, both of you are allowed to move in. Most of them are empty at the moment as well. How much is the rent? Jessica asks, as she doesn't have a lot of money. In fact, she's barely above the poverty level in yearly income. Although Matt is a lawyer, he was in a similar situation to Jessica. Though he has some money saved up from his time at his old firm. It's free, Peter says from behind. Seriously? Jessica asks as they walk through one of the apartments. All of this is free? Yes, Tony and I made sure that every Avenger would have a place to stay, though we may have gone a bit overboard. Peter says as he admired the lavish apartment. You should see the penthouses for the council members. Natasha says, remembering the first time that she saw Fury's apartment. They're ten times bigger than this, damn. Jessica mutters as she spins, admiring the large, open apartment. Do you help with moving as well? Sure. Although she wasn't serious, Peter answers with a nod as he opened a portal to her apartment. Is that? She points to the portal in shock. Yeah, just pick an apartment, and I'll open a portal for you to move. Peter nods. How do you know where I live? Jessica asks suspiciously, but before Peter could answer, her phone started going off. Hold that thought. Whipping out her phone, Jessica saw who was calling and sighed as she answered. What? She asked as the sound of gunfire and screams of pain and panic came from the other end. Question mark. Peter and Matt overheard everything as they listened in. Get that spider to my location. These mortals are crazy. Loki says in a pained tone. Loki? Are you okay? Jessica asks as she heard his strained voice. While the two were talking, Peter turned his attention elsewhere. Jarvis, track Loki's location, he orders. No need, sir, Jarvis says, as live images from surveillance cameras in some sort of fairground appeared on the TV. It seems as though a gang war is being fought in Central Park. That's, odd, Peter mutters as he remembered the backstory to the Punisher Netflix show. Is this the attack on Frank and his family? Peter wasn't completely sure, as his recollection of the MCU TV shows wasn't as good as the movies, though he was fairly certain. Okay, I'm heading out, Peter says as he opens a portal and leaps through. As soon as the portal opened, the sound of deafening automatic gunfire filled the room. Hesitating for just a moment, as they didn't have anything to hide their faces, Jessica and Matt second-guessed themselves before rushing to follow him through, but sadly, the portal snapped shut just before they could get in. Leaping through the portal, Peter quickly assessed the situation. 
all around, people were screaming and running as gunfire from all sides of the fairground converged inwards. Countless innocent people seemed to have taken stray bullets, as they littered the ground groaning and moaning in pain. A small portion of these people have already died as well. Let's end this quickly, Peter mutters as he didn't want to lose any more victims. With a wave of his hand, Peter conjured a spell circle, which quickly morphed into a golden dome that covered the entire fair, except for the gunmen, who were left outside the dome. What the? A random goon said as he and others started unloading on the barrier. Sadly for them, their bullets didn't penetrate or break the barrier, but they did bounce back and started slaughtering the surrounding men at random. Hold your fire. Someone yelled and soon everyone stopped shooting. As the surviving gunmen looked at the barrier in shock, some of them rushed to help those that were hit and load them into the cars. Let's get out of here, at least one person from each group said similar words. I wasn't paid enough to deal with this. When they all were getting ready to drive off, as the police would be arriving soon enough anyway, they noticed an odd golden color coming from behind them as well. Shit. Many of them cursed as they found a matching barrier blocking their escape. Crash, some tried to ram the barriers with their cars, but their efforts were useless. It was like running headfirst into a brick wall. The only thing that was destroyed was their cars. As the barriers went up and the gunfire stopped, everyone inside the fair finally noticed Peter's presence. Spider-Man. A child yelled, which started a chain reaction, as everyone started calling his name and begging him for help. Soon enough, the whole fair was filled with screams for help for those that were injured. Quiet. Peter bellowed and everyone shut up in an instant. Those that aren't hurt, get moving. I want everyone that's injured in front of me as quickly as possible. They hesitated for just a second before people started moving with purpose, rushing all across the fair to find any gunshot victims. Within seconds of his order, the first person was brought before him. It was a seven-year-old girl who was riddled with bullet holes. Her parents were nowhere to be seen either. Holding his hand out, Peter conjured a spell circle that vanished the bullets inside her body and closed her wounds in an instant. Even her internal injuries were fixed in seconds. Next, Peter called out, but no one moved. Everyone was too shocked by what they saw. They all knew Spider-Man and his powers, but they didn't know he could heal people with such ease. I said next. Peter yelled like a drill sergeant. We don't have time to spare. Move. Instantly, the shocked crowd took the girl away and another took her place. This continued for a few minutes as countless half-dead gunshot victims, from the elderly to children down to the age of four, were brought forward and healed over and over. Although Peter wouldn't be able to recognize Frank Castle's family, as they weren't shown much in the show, he was able to spot the man himself. He looks just like the actor. Peter thought as a barely conscious Punisher was brought up alongside a woman and two young children. All of them were in far worse shape than anyone else that was brought forward. Each member of the Castle family had at least eight bullet holes littering their body. Whereas Frank himself has more than 15 bloody holes in his chest and stomach. Makes sense. He and his family are the targets for this whole attack, after all. Peter thought as Frank was dropped before him. Wait. Frank spoke through strained breaths. My family. Save my family, first. As he spoke, he pointed at the woman and two children, who were currently in the queue behind him. Frank has no idea what was happening, as his mind was borderline delusional from the loss of blood, but he knew enough upon seeing Spider-Man alright. Peter agreed easily as he stepped over Frank's body and started working his magic on the castle family. As Peter's golden magic enveloped his dying family, Frank's vision slowly turned black as he drifted off into unconsciousness. After treating every living person in the fair, Peter could hear the sound of police sirens coming toward the area. Wait here. Peter called out to the crowd of survivors, as he ran off and opened a portal away from view. Healing and barrier making isn't a big deal, but I'd like to keep my portals a secret from the public. Obviously, it wasn't much of a secret, as S.H.I.E.L.D. and some other organizations already know about the portals, but Peter could only try his best to keep it away from the rest of the world for as long as possible. Opening a portal, Peter appeared on a tree above the trapped gunman and looked down at the bloodstained floor and injured bad guys. Did they start shooting each other? Peter wondered as he jumped down, landing boot first on an armed biker's face. It's the spider. Open fire. Another biker yelled as Peter planted his now unconscious friend's head into the grass. Although he yelled for them to shoot, everyone seems to have learned their lesson from earlier. After all, shooting with the barrier so close is far too dangerous. What's the matter? Out of bullets. Peter asks as he rushes forward and starts beating the shit out of each biker one by one. I said shoot, you idiots. The man that was throwing out orders before says as he pulls his trigger. Stepping to the side, Peter easily dodged the entire clip of bullets that came his way. Instantly, every biker that had a good head on their shoulders dived onto the grassy floor. As all the bullets ricocheted off of the outer barrier and toward the inner barrier, they began to zigzag back and forth. Some of them impacted the cars, while others hit some friendly bikers, sending them out of commission for the rest of the fight. Though, one of the strays dug itself into the head of the idiot that shot them in the first place, killing him in an instant. Huh? Now I know why you weren't shooting. With the barriers acting as a deterrent against the gunman's firearms, Peter made quick work of the three hostile groups. 
Although they committed a crazy, almost terroristic act, Peter captured as many as he could alive, sending them to the tower's detention center for later questioning. He knew this incident wasn't just a random gang war, as no gangs would be this stupid without reason, especially in New York City, so evidence was certainly needed. With that in mind, Peter also portaled the cars, guns, and any other belongings that were lying around back to the tower. The police, who arrived only a few moments after Peter finished cleaning up, could do nothing as they found a barrier blocking their way inside. Although they could see through the blockade, all they found upon their arrival was blood-stained grass, bullet casings, and tire marks. Once the area was cleared, Peter snapped his fingers, which dropped both barriers at the same time. When the barriers disappeared, Peter waved at the police as they breached inside with assault rifles drawn. Yo! He says as the police ignore him for the time being and clear the area. Spider-Man, it's good to see you again, a man in a formal police uniform comes waltzing over, speaking to Peter in a very respectful manner. Chief, how have you been? Peter says as he claps the man on the shoulder. Have you finished your list of the possible candidates that we talked about a while ago? Yes. The two spoke as police grunts move into the fairgrounds and assess the situation. The dead were cordoned off while everyone that was conscious was instantly detained for questioning, as that was the procedure in situations like this. So, what happened? The chief asks after a short conversation. Three gangs surrounded the park and started a war with a fair full of people in the crossfire. Peter says with a heavy dose of skepticism. You think there's something more to it? He asks curiously. You don't? Peter asks as he walks off before any more questions could be asked, waving over his shoulder. Don't worry, this whole thing has caught my interest, so I'll deal with it. The next morning, the sound of a heartbeat monitor filled a high-tech hospital room. As the sun beamed through the floor-to-ceiling windows, Peter walked into the room with his spider suit protecting his identity. Walking over to the hospital bed, Peter looks down at Frank Castle, who has been peacefully sleeping since the incident in Central Park yesterday. Since he was tired of waiting for him to wake up on his own, Peter reached out and tapped his finger on Frank's forehead. Zap from the top of Peter's clothed finger, a pulse of weak eldritch energy pulsed into Frank's skin and disappeared. Exclamation point. Frank's eyes shoot open as he swiftly sits up with a loud gasp. Good morning, sleepyhead. Peter welcomes him back to the world of the living with a little wave. Huh? Frank grunts as he takes in his surrounding. How am I? Maria? Lisa? Frank. Before Peter's presence could completely register in his hazy mind, Frank jumped out of bed and tripped on the bedsheets, falling to the floor with a loud smack. Where are they? Frank yells as he climbs up off of the floor and staggers to the door. Calm down, buddy. Peter says as he steps in front of the Punisher's path. Move. Frank orders in a cold and quiet tone. No, you need to calm down and take a minute to get yourself together. Peter shakes his head and stands unmoving. Exclamation point. Without waiting for another second to pass, Frank launched forward with a scowl ever present on his face. As Frank pulled his arm back to swing his fist forward, aiming at his opponent's unguarded face, Peter sighed as he raised his hand and caught the incoming blow with ease. Ugh. Frank grunts as he feels Peter's vice-like grip holding his fist in place. Please calm down. Peter continues to try to reason with him. Without uttering a single word in response, Frank tried to yank his fist free, though no amount of strength would help against the crazy amount of raw power that Spider-Man wielded. Aha. Frank starts to turn red as he thrashes around. You should really dash just as Peter was repeating his calming words once again, the door swung open and the sound of small pitter-pattering feet came running inside. Daddy. A little girl with messy brown hair rushed past Peter and dived into Frank's stomach. Ugh. Frank grunts and falls to the floor as Peter released his hand. Daddy. I met Spider-Man. Lisa, Frank's daughter, sat on his stomach as she excitedly smiled down at him. Instantly, tears began to well up in Frank's eyes as he reached up and held his daughter's head in the palm of his hands. Why you dash Frank stutters as two other footsteps come walking into the room. Dad, you're finally awake. Frank Jr. comes running over and joined his father on the floor. You're all okay? Frank mutters as he wraps his arms around his two children and looks up to find his wife, Maria, standing next to Peter. We have Spider-Man to thank for that. Maria says as she looks at Peter. Frank's looks toward Peter with a dumb expression on his face, unsure as to how to thank him. I'll leave you guys alone for the time being, Peter says as he walks to the door and turns back for just a moment. I'll be back in a few hours to speak with you. As the door closed, leaving the family of four behind, Maria let out a sigh as she rushed to join her family in a pile on the floor. The sounds of crying and laughter filled the room as the Castle family reunited after what could have been a horrible tragedy. Hours later, Peter returned to Frank's hospital room, with Pepper and Tony following closely behind him. Knock knock. After waiting for a reply, they entered the room and found the whole family piled up on the bed, snuggling together happily. Hello again, Peter says as the family gets surprised by the presence of Tony Stark, another famous superhero. Your Iron Man. Frank Jr. and Lisa exclaim as they point at Tony, who look behind him in mock confusion. Who? Where? Tony asks like a wacky uncle. Ahem. Pepper clears her throat as she steps in front of Tony. 
Would you two like to see Tony's Iron Man armor? Yeah. Yes. The two children shoot up out of the bed in excitement. Wait. Frank and his wife call out disapprovingly, unwilling to part with their children after such a horrific experience. As the children froze in their excitement, Peter stepped forward. I need to speak to you two privately, Peter says as he places a hand on Tony's shoulder. Tony will take care of. Stopping mid-sentence with a shake of his head, Peter removed his hand from Tony's shoulder and motioned to Pepper. Pepper will look after the kids, Peter says as Tony frowns in his direction. Trust me, you don't want them here for this. Hey, I can take care of a couple of brats, easily, Tony says as Pepper smacks him across the backside of the head. What was that for? Ignoring Tony, who was both confused and unhappy, Pepper turned to the parents in the room. We can wait in the hallway if that would be more acceptable, Pepper offers. Fine. When the kids were ushered out alongside Tony and Pepper, Peter closed the door and sat beside the bed, where Frank and Maria were sitting expectantly. What's this about? Franks asks gruffly. I'll get straight to the point, Peter says as he looks Frank in the eyes. Who would want you dead? Huh? What? Maria asks in confusion. I'm a Marine. A lot of people want me dead, though they aren't from this country. Franks answers with a questioning look. What are you getting at? Is this about the shooting yesterday? His wife asks in confusion. Didn't the news say that it was a poorly placed gang shooting? A gang shooting between three different groups, who all drove to the same location in masks and blacked out cars. Not only that, but they purposefully surrounded the fair, where your family just so happened to be. Peter voices his suspicions. There were hundreds of people in that park? Frank says unbelievably. The target, if there was a target, could have been anyone. True, but only you and your family took more than three gunshot wounds, Peter says as he sat back and crossed one leg over the other. Each member of your family was shot at least eight times, while you, Frank, were shot more than fifteen times. It was almost as if they were aiming at you, don't you think? The room goes silent as the two parents digest this newfound information. Frank, Maria asks as she turns to her husband. Is he right? Did someone try to kill us? Kill our children. Hearing his wife's questioning words, Frank remembered the smug face of the man that was responsible for the deaths of his comrades in their last mission. Instantly, Frank recalled jumping on the man and pounding his face in, doling out blame for the deaths of his friends with every punch, rupturing the stuck-up prick's eye in the process. I, Frank stuttered as a look of realization appeared on his face. No, it can't be, Frank says as he goes into denial. During his unit's most recent deployment within Afghanistan, Castle was assigned to a new task force under the supervision of Ray Schoonover, a colonel of the United States Marine Corps Force Recon Division, as well as an anonymous civilian commander known to the men only as Agent Orange. Castle was one of the two lieutenants taking command under the orders of Schoonover, leading the unit's two squads on that day, Frank sat with his comrades and listened as Orange and Schoonover explained their new objective. They were now part of Operation Cerberus and tasked to capture and assassinate enemy targets, based on Agent Orange's information. Upon hearing this, Frank questioned if the United States Congress had approved the operation, though Orange insisted they had. The task force participated in many operations, specializing in nightly raids for the purpose of kidnapping, interrogating, and then executing high-value targets of the United States of America, with the squad quickly becoming known as the American Taliban. Among the targets that were captured by Cerberus squad included a man named Ahmad Zubair. Zubair was brutally strung up and beaten down by the squad before Agent Orange then entered the room and began questioning him in his native tongue, so that neither Frank nor any of the other members of the squad could understand what they were saying. They all stood by and watched as Orange began repeatedly striking the clearly terrified and helpless man while wearing a pair of thick leather gloves. During the torture, Zubair spoke in English and insisted over and over that he was not a terrorist and that he had a family, though no matter how much he pleaded, the beating never stopped. Eventually, Agent Orange noted that Zubair clearly didn't know anything useful for them, and therefore turned to Frank, who understood and shot Zubair point-blank in the face, killing him instantly. Frank ended up burying the body in the desert with the help of one of his men, who questioned whether they were just ordered to hide evidence or not. Despite his own doubts, Frank was a model soldier and followed orders without question. Soon enough, the dreaded mission arrived and a new target, who was believed to be hiding in a compound within Kandahar, was designated. Although they were then ordered to go into Kandahar and capture this target, Frank warned against it, believing this was a trap for Cerberus squad. Agent Orange, however, ignored Castle's objections and insisted that they continue with the mission objective regardless. Just as Frank had predicted would happen, the surprise raid quickly turned out to be an ambush as their squad was hit with machine gun fire and mortar rounds, which resulted in Schoonover losing his arm, while many soldiers were killed. Soon enough, Frank decided that the only option remaining for their continued survival was for him to storm the enemy fort alone and clear a path for an evacuation. Frank then charged across the battlefield, amidst a hail of gunfire and explosive mortal shells. He then made his way uphill, firing upon any insurgents he encountered in order to keep his men safe. Making his way through the fort, Frank proceeded to use all of his military training and utter fury to charge through the enemy's stronghold, 
killing all those he encountered. As the enemies constantly closed in on him and the battle continued to drag on, Frank used everything he had on hand, including his opponent's weapons, to slaughter his way through the building. Out of ammunition yet still determined to save his fellow soldiers and return home to his family, Frank barely survived as he killed the last of the opposition with nothing but his bare hands. In the end, Frank was completely covered in his enemy's blood. However, he had successfully cleared the whole area, killing all hostiles, and saving what remained of his squad in the process. Upon their triumphant, yet damaged, return, Frank overheard someone asking for a mission update and saw Agent Orange looking at all of the wounded and severely damaged soldiers, as he calmly and uncaringly asked if they had successfully killed the target as he wanted. Mortified that Orange was more concerned for Operation Cerberus' mission than he was over all of the wounded and dead men, Frank charged forward and assaulted Orange for the deaths of his men, as it was his bad information that led them into a trap. As the beating took place, Frank meant to kill him as he ruptured Orange's eye socket after a flurry of punches, though soon enough, the nearby soldiers dragged the furious Lieutenant Castle off of the now horrified and beaten Agent Orange. Not long after this incident, Frank's tour in Afghanistan came to an end, so instead of immediately signing up for another tour, he returned home to his family, and a few days after his return, they were almost killed. I may have angered somebody, but he wouldn't. Frank says as he looks off into the distance in thought. Who? Maria asks, beating Peter to the question. A spook? Frank answers after a moment of thought. Some CIA guy. He gave us bad intel and got my men killed, so I beat his butt. I shouldn't even be talking about this. Well, the Avengers act at a higher level than the CIA or any government, so nothing you've done is out of reach for me. Peter says with a shrug. Whatever. Frank says as he takes a moment to think. It was only a fight, though. I'm sure he's angry, but not enough to kill me and my family. What Frank didn't know, is that Operation Cerberus was never sanctioned by anyone, so given its illegal nature, it had to fund itself, which it did by smuggling heroin into the United States through the corpses of dead servicemen, led by Agent Orange and Schoonover. Not only that, but Ahmad Zubair, the man Frank killed and buried in the desert, wasn't a terrorist but a policeman, who was investigating Cerberus squad and their link to heroin smuggling. Not long after his murder, Zubair's body was found, which awoke feelings of suspicion in Orange and Schoonover. Fueled by suspicion, as Frank was the one to bury the body, the two masterminds decided to have Frank killed as they believed that he leaked the torture and death of Ahmad Zubair. Using his criminal persona known as Blacksmith, Schoonover then arranged a deal between the Mexican cartel, Dogs of Hell, and Kitchen Irish. These groups started the firefight as a cover for the deaths of Frank and his family. Instead of the assassination of a US Marine airing on the news, it would be another act of senseless gang-slash-gun violence, which happens every day in America. I need to gather enough evidence to convince him, Peter thought. Peter knew all of this already, as he watched the show in his past life. The only problem was whether he could convince Frank and then help him with his inevitable revenge. Whether it's the man you thought of or not. It doesn't matter, Peter says as he stands from his seat. I have all of the surviving gunmen locked up and waiting for questioning, so I'll have some sort of proof soon enough. What should we do until then? Maria asks, afraid for her children's safety. You'll be staying in the tower for the foreseeable future, Peter says as he gets some unwilling looks from the two parents. After all, they don't even know for sure whether they were the targets or not. This isn't optional, Peter says and their faces look even more unwilling. I'd rather not have the deaths of two children on my hands, after all. You can't dash Maria goes to speak but Peter cuts her off. I can, Peter says with a shrug. As I said before, the Avengers operate above any government. We can break every law in the book without a single repercussion. Hearing Spider-Man talk about breaking laws and holding them captive was an odd experience, as everyone knows him as a shining selfless hero. It seems that we don't have a choice? Frank mutters, knowing that he can't do anything about it. Their little scuffle when he woke up clearly showed him that. It's good that you've realized that, Peter says as he smiles under his mask. I'll have an apartment allocated to you. If you need anything, like groceries or clothes, order it online or ask Jarvis. Who's Jarvis? Maria asks. You'll find out soon enough, Peter says as he walks to the door, waving over his shoulder. Enjoy your family vacation in captivity. As the Castle family was settling into their new apartment, Peter ordered the interrogation of every captured gang member, starting with those who seemed to be charged. Of course, he already went through their cars, phones, wallets, and other belongings, though this only confirmed their gang affiliations, which Peter already knew. Jarvis, find me the leaders of each gang. Mexican Cartel, Dogs of Hell, and Kitchen Irish. Peter says as he entered his office and took a seat. Feel free to hack into any government records as well. Although Peter has been fighting crime all over this city for almost three years, he always left the investigation work for the police. He knew all of the major groups, though their inner workings weren't something that Peter ever cared much about. The police can handle it? Peter always thought as he would usually leave evidence behind for them to follow. Not long after asking, Jarvis started rapidly firing off information. Sir, I've compiled the necessary details. Jarvis spoke as pictures and maps appeared on his computer screen. 
The Dogs of Hell are a biker gang with chapters in both Nevada and New York. Jimmy the Bear is the leader of the Dogs of Hell based here in New York City. They tend to gather at the Dogs of Hell bar. Next, the Kitchen Irish is a mobster group, led by a man named Nesbitt. Their headquarters is the Bayan Club, a restaurant in Hell's Kitchen. Lastly, the Mexican Cartel, also known as the Juarez Cartel, is a drug cartel based in Juarez, Mexico, mainly focusing on cocaine export to the United States of America. Their leader, Vicente Carrillo Fuentes lives in a heavily guarded compound in Juarez. They are the only group that isn't based in the city. Jarvis finished his information dump. Going over everything on screen, Peter sits back and thinks for a moment. Sent all of this to my phone, Peter orders as he walks to the door, feeling his phone buzz in his pocket. Sent, sir. Walking down to the gym, as he knew that Frank was there, taking his anger out on the equipment, Peter decided to delegate some work to the new recruits. Thankfully, almost every piece of equipment is enhanced to Peter's standards, so it was impossible for Frank to break anything. Yo! Peter calls out as he walks in, though no one seemed to notice his arrival. In the center of the gym was a reinforced boxing ring that Steve and Logan tended to use for sparing. Stood around the ring, Natasha, Jessica, and Loki watched as Daredevil and Punisher fought with boxing gloves on each of their hands. Though it wasn't really much of a fight, as Matt's enhanced senses made it impossible for Frank to land any sort of hit on him. Ugh. Frank grunted as he swung a fist forward, aiming for his opponent's solar plexus. Of course, Matt sidestepped the attack with ease and responded in turn, sending a matching attack to Frank's unguarded ribs, which landed perfectly and knocked him off of his feet. Frank remained silent in defeat as he felt pain in every organ of his body. And that's what happens when we underestimate our opponent? Natasha entered teacher mode as she lectured Jessica. I admit, he's quite the skilled warrior, for a cripple. Loki comments from the side. Thanks, I think. Matt says unsurely as he reaches a hand out to his fallen opponent. You okay? Yeah. Frank says as he ignores Matt's outstretched hand and picks himself up off of the floor. Don't be such a sore loser, Frank. Peter says as everyone turns, finally noticing his presence. In fact, you should get used to losing, as it'll be almost impossible to find a weaker opponent here. Spidey, what are you doing here? Natasha asks as Frank leaned on the ropes and sulked. Well, I thought that I'd invite all of you on a little field trip, Peter says with open arms, though no one looked as excited as he expected. Where to? Matt asks as he hops out of the ring. Well, Peter says as he turns to Frank. We have a few gang leaders to visit. Would you like to join us, Frank? After all, this pertains to the attack on your family. Am I allowed to leave this prison? He answers with a heavy bit of dissatisfaction. With my supervision, yes. Peter nods. Then I'm in. Frank nods as he slips out of the ring. Good. Peter says as he looks at Black Widow. Natasha, please outfit everyone with whatever they'll need and meet me in my office when you're ready to head out. Sir, yes sir. She says mockingly as Peter walks off. An hour passed and the group was brought to Peter's office. Each of them were suited up and armed with whatever they asked for. Jessica wore a bodysuit that matched Natasha's without a single weapon, as her strength was enough. Frank wound up dressed as a true marine, ready for war with his assault rifle and a plethora of other weaponry. Matt wore black hooded tactical gear, which made him look almost like a modern Assassin's Creed character. Across his back was a black katana, while all sorts of knives were strapped along his body as well. On top of all of their new gear, each of them wore masks, which would keep their identity safe. Loki, on the other hand, wore the same clothes as usual, though he was armed to the teeth with a machine gun across his back, two pistols holstered under his jacket, and multiple knives hidden across his body. Without his powers, Loki only had his body to use as a weapon, but his injury in Central Park the other day taught him a valuable lesson. He needed mortal weapons. Loki, will you be joining us? Peter asks, as he didn't expect the pompous prince to offer any assistance. Yes. Loki answers in a challenging tone. Is that a problem? No, you're always welcome. Peter was more than happy to have Loki around, as it would be easier to keep track of any of his mischief. Not only that, but Peter could do his best to turn Loki to their side. A friendly Loki would be a huge asset to the Avengers, after all. Alright, our first target is a man named Nesbitt. Peter says as the man's photo appears on screen. We need to capture him alive, so memorize his appearance now. After giving them some time to familiarize themselves with the target, Peter waved his hand and opened a portal. Stepping through to a rooftop in Hell's Kitchen, followed by Natasha and her group of ducklings, Peter motioned towards the restaurant across the street. He's in there. Peter says as he takes a seat at the edge of the building. Go get him. Natasha's in charge. Follow her orders or there will be consequences. You won't be joining us? Natasha asks. Nah, the newbies need the experience, Peter says with a shrug. Loki scowled and tightened his fists unhappily. Although he wanted to tag along in the first place, hearing Peter treat him like some sort of lackey was infuriating. Alright, let's go, Natasha calls out as she parkour down the building's fire escape. The group watched for a moment, as she descended the building with the grace of a master gymnast. You heard her, Peter's voice snaps them out of it. Get moving, 
Bayon club I said pack faster, you bumbling idiots. A bald Irishman in a fancy suit yells angrily as he paces back and forth across the room. All around him, men in lesser suits were boxing up all sorts of weapons and large stacks of cash. Ever since Spider-Man captured his men, Nesbitt was stuck with a choice. Either stay and fight a losing battle, or pack up and return to Ireland with his tail between his legs. Of course, he chose the latter option. After all, Spider-Man and the Avenger wasn't something an ordinary mob of criminals could deal with. I knew the risks. Nesbitt thought as he recalled the deal he made a few days ago. In exchange for an ungodly amount of firepower, Nesbitt agreed to kill a Marine and his family, which wasn't exactly risky on its own. What made the plan risky, was the fact that it would take place in New York City, the home of the Avengers. Earth's mightiest heroes. Sadly for him, the plan failed spectacularly, and now it was time to hit the road before his captured men could rat him out to Spider-Man sir, we're ready to go. A man calls out, but before anyone could reply, the windows broke open as multiple masked figures leaped inside. What the hell? A man with a thick Irish accent exclaims. The intruders didn't waste a single second as they took aim at the shocked group of Irishmen and opened fire, filling the building with the sound of gunfire. Hopping off of the building, Peter listens to the gunshots and chaos inside the restaurant, as he walks over to one of the broken windows and watches the show unfold. I need some popcorn. Peter thought as a bucket of popcorn appeared in his hand. Practicing spells without the circles was worth it. While Peter was figuring out how to eat food through his mask, Natasha led the future defenders on their first real mission. Frank maneuvered through the building like a machine, dropping bodies whichever way he looked. Loki seemed to be familiarizing himself with mortal weaponry as he kept to the shadows, attacking only when it was least expected. Jessica tore through the place like a pint-sized hulk, though she wasn't bulletproof, so her plan of attack required a bit more finesse than the angry green giant. Thankfully, her bodysuit was bulletproof up to a certain caliber of ammunition, so if she makes a mistake it wouldn't be fatal. Unless, of course, she gets shot in the head. Natasha, knowing this could happen, stood by Jessica's side, as she was the student that needed the most training and guidance. After all, Matt was trained by a man that could demolish the average shield agent and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her. As for Matt, he moved through the place like a martial acrobat, beating down hostile Irishmen with relative ease. Killing wasn't his forte, so he only incapacitated his opponents. Meh, these Irish guys are pretty weak. Peter was happy that he decided to delegate this work, as it would be a waste of time and effort for him. Within minutes, every mobster in the building was either killed or captured, while Nesbitt was strapped to a chair in the center of the room. What do you want? Money? Nesbitt started bartering for his life, unsure which group these people were from. I can give each of you a million dollars. Just untie me and we'll get you paid, eh? As the room descended into silence without a single person taking the offer, the front door swung open and Spider-Man casually walked inside. You guys open? Peter asks as he picks up a menu. I've always wanted to try haggis. Haggis is from Scotland, you damn idiot. Nesbitt couldn't hold his tongue as he turned to see who he just spoke to. Eh Spider-Man. Ignoring the man tied to a chair, Peter looked over at Natasha. If they don't sell haggis, then what do Irish people eat? Peter asks in mock confusion. Potatoes, sir. Natasha answers with a smirk. I thought they didn't have potatoes. Jessica joins in on the fun. Wasn't there a famine or something? Nesbitt was fuming at this point, though he kept his mouth shut in Spider-Man's presence. Yeah, hey Baldy. Peter throws the menu away as he turns to the bound Irishman. What kind of food do you serve here? Nesbitt took a moment to calm himself before speaking. I'd be happy to explain our menu, but I'm sure you're here for more important reasons. Even with Spider-Man right in front of him, Nesbitt was still looking for a way to weasel out of the situation. You would be right. After all, who cares about Irish food? Peter throws in another insult as he grabs a chair and takes a seat across from the Irishman. Tell me about the reason behind the shooting in Central Park and the hit on the Castle family. Ignoring the insult to the cuisine of his motherland, Nesbitt sits back and puts on a calm demeanor. What's in it for me? He asks tentatively. What's in it for you is we don't blow your brains out. Frank says as he rests the hot barrel of his assault rifle on the side of Nesbitt's bald head. What he said? Peter says with a shrug. Though I'd be willing to possibly let you walk, if your info is good enough. Frank looked at Peter with piercing eyes, unwilling to leave one of the men that ordered the assault on his family alive, but Peter just waved him off. Oh, I got good info alright. Nesbitt says as he leans forward intently. But I want your word that I'll walk. Sure, now talk. Peter nods as he leans back in his seat. I was promised military hardware, a lot of it. Nesbitt starts singing like a bird. For what? Peter asks, as Franks listens in intently. You already know what for? Nesbitt says with a roll of his eyes. You said it yourself. A shooting to cover the deaths of that family. Whatever their name was. Upon hearing real evidence to the attack on his family, Frank fumed as he wondered who could be behind it. The one thing was for sure, he now fully believed in Peter's allegations. Who paid for it? Peter asks. I don't have a real name, but we call him Blacksmith. Nesbitt reveals eagerly. 
He mainly deals in heroin, but I didn't need that, so he offered up military assault rifles, ammunition, and some explosives. Do you know what he looks like? Peter asks again. No, but the goods were delivered by some blacked out soldier looking guys. Real professional. Real deadly. He explains, causing Frank's face to scrunch up in contemplation. Where are these goods? Peter asks and Nesbitt immediately motions to the corner of the room with his bald head. In the corner were a lot of military-style containers, stacked up high. Anything else of importance to add? Peter asks as Natasha walks over to examine the crates and their contents. Yeah, you're going after the others for this, right? Nesbitt asks with a vindictive smirk on his face. I never liked those Mexicans. The dogs, on the other hand, are an alright bunch, but they won't be missed either. Ignoring what he said, Peter turns to Frank. Cut him loose, Peter orders. Frank stands there unmoving for a moment as he glared in Peter's direction, though soon enough, he followed orders like a good soldier and cut Nesbitt free. Well, this has been fun and all, but I'll be on my way, the unbound Irishman says as he gets up and paces to the door. Walking up to Frank, who was staring intently at Nesbitt's retreating figure, Peter pats him on the shoulder. I kept my word, Peter says as he indeed let the man walk. He's all yours now, question mark. Frank was confused for only a few seconds before realization struck him and a smirk formed on his lips. Yes, sir. Bang, Frank lifted his rifle and fired a single bullet at the back of Nesbitt's oblivious bald head, killing him instantly as his body toppled onto the restaurant floor. Aren't you supposed to be a hero? Jessica asks as she watched everything unfold. Killing can be heroic, too, Peter says with a shrug. That man ordered what amounts to a terrorist attack on a crowded fair dash he deserved worse than he got. Frank cuts in as he walks over to Natasha, who already had a few of the crates cracked open. That's definitely military grade. Frank stared at the assault rifles for a good moment, as they reminded him of the exact ones that Cerberus squad would use in Afghanistan. Okay, we have some information, so let's see if the other groups know anything more. Peter says as he opens a portal leading to the tower. Bring the crates through, and we'll have the cops deal with everything else. After supervising the group as they carried over the military crates, Peter called the police chief and had him take care of the rest of the cleanup. With their work done, Peter opened a portal to a building across the street from a noisy biker bar, where a long row of motorcycles was parked outside. Same as before, Peter says as he shoes them away. Peter watched as the group ran over to the bar, and Jessica kicked over a motorcycle with a vindictive smirk, starting a chain reaction, as every motorcycle fell one after the other, like dominoes, alerting the angry bikers inside. Due to the perfect lore, which dragged every enemy out of the bar, the dogs of hell were even easier to handle compared to the Irish. Once everything was taken care of, Peter came down and questioned their leader, Jimmy the Bear, who wasn't as talkative as the bald Irishman, though, after some time alone with Natasha, they couldn't get him to stop running his mouth. Sadly, his story was the same and so was his end. After Frank had his vengeance, they confiscated the military goods and left everything else for the police to handle. This is a waste of time, Loki says in annoyance as they return to the tower with the second round of crates. We're getting military-grade weaponry off of the streets, Matt says in confusion. How is that a waste of time? But it's so dreadfully boring, Loki whines as he flops down on a nearby couch. I want to know who this blacksmith character is. Peter watched as the group talked amongst themselves, shocked that Loki seemed somewhat interested in the mystery behind all of this. This is a good doorway into crime fighting for him. After the crates were safely stored and everyone was slightly rested, Peter opened a portal to Juarez, Mexico, where they would continue their little investigation. Arriving at an empty dirt road in Juarez, Mexico, Peter and the current makeshift group of defenders could see a large villa-looking compound in the distance. This is where we'll most likely find out some interesting information. Peter says to the group as he motions to the compound. Compared to the Juarez cartel, the dogs of hell and kitchen Irish might as well be stray dogs and leprechauns. They are the biggest exporter of cocaine on this side of the globe, so I expect them to have better information networks, which they've hopefully used to look into the blacksmith. Hearing Peter's quick description, each of them looks down at the picture they were provided earlier in the day. Vicente Carrillo Fuentes, a chubby older man with graying hair, who wore a very expensive looking suit. Unless there are innocent bystanders or children inside, everyone in that villa could die for all I care. Peter says with an uncaring shrug. After all, the Juarez cartel are known to commit some pretty vile acts, like killing the families of snitches and police officers, or just gruesome things, like carving off people's skin while they're still alive as a punishment before death. There's a reason why they are so infamous all around Mexico. Fear can bring any organization a lot of respect and influence. It's safe to say that Peter didn't hold an ounce of sympathy for the criminals in that compound. Everyone just took in the view as Peter finished taking. What are you waiting for? Peter asks as he makes a shooing motion toward the villa. Get going. As everyone was walking off, Loki turned toward Peter with a glare. Bossy prick. Loki huffed as he left to catch up with Jessica and the others. Fuentes Villa, Balcony. Sir, I think we should seriously consider abandoning Mexico and going into hiding. A casually dressed Spanish man in a cowboy hat says seriously. 
at least until we know that the Avengers have moved on to something else. News of the Avengers raiding the headquarters of the Dogs of Hell and Kitchen Irish reached the Juarez cartel's ear only moments ago. N Vicente Carrillo Fuentes, the big boss of the cartel, refused with an uncaring wave. This isn't the United States, where those mutant clowns can do as they wish, right? A younger man, who stood at the side of Vicente, exclaimed. This is Juarez. We own this land and anyone who steps out of line will know the consequences. As he says this, his hand goes toward his waist, where a golden desert eagle sat strapped to his hip. Good. Vicente smiles and places a hand on the young man's shoulder. You have the right mindset, my son. Shink just as the father and son were having a heartwarming moment, a black throwing knife flew through the air and landed in the forehead of the grunt with the cowboy hat. What the? Vicente mutters in shock as one of his most trusted subordinates fell to the floor, dead. As soon as his body touched the floor, the whole compound spiraled into chaos. Gunfire filled the air and alarms started blaring, calling the whole cartel into battle. Across the walls of the Villa Fortress, Juarez cartel members with assault rifles were being picked off one by one, as screams of pain and death grew closer and closer to the heart of the villa. Ah, uh, dad. His son shakes him out of his stupor, pointing over his father's shoulder. Hello. A beautiful woman with vibrant red hair laid out like a model on a long sunbathing chair, twirling two other matching knives between her fingers. I'm going to need you two to wait here patiently while we clean up the surroundings. The two men quickly shrugged off their shock, as what self-respecting cartel man would ever fear a woman? Especially such a stunning one like Natasha. You don't tell us what to do, bitch. Vicente's son shouts haughtily as he reaches toward his crotch and grabs his family jewels. Why don't you come over here and dash before he could finish his obviously sexual offer, Natasha flicked her wrist and one of the knives in her hand disappeared. Aya. The grotesque young man's smirk instantly disappeared as a black throwing knife pierced the back of his hand, pinning his hand to his crotch, which certainly took some damage as well. After all, Natasha's knives are quite long. I'm saving my chastity for God. Natasha smiles like an innocent nun. Or is it Jesus? I can never remember. Javier. Vicente shouts in alarm as his son collapses onto the floor. Aya. Javier felt excruciating pain as he tried pulling the knife out, his hand and crotch both leaking blood in the process. I would stop him if I were you. Natasha says as the sounds of gunfire in their surroundings slowly simmer down. He'll only bleed out faster if the wound is unclogged. Looking down at his son, who was writhing in agony, Vicente grabbed his hand and pushed, sheathing the knife back into place. Ah! Javier screamed as he looked at his father in betrayal. W.Y. Because you'll die otherwise. Vicente says as he looks between his son's golden pistol and the mysterious woman on his balcony. Reaching for the gun with as much stealth as he could muster, Vicente decided to take a chance. After all, he didn't run a trillion-dollar drug empire without winning some risky bets. Crunched just as he was about to grasp the Desert Eagle, a shadow loomed over him and a heavy military boot stomped onto his hand. Aha! Vicente joined his son in pain-filled screaming. As the sickening sound of breaking bones filled the air, a hand swooped down and grabbed the golden pistol before walking off, leaving a mangled hand behind. Seriously? A solid gold Desert Eagle. Frank mutters as he pops out the clip, wondering whether the bullets were of similar quality. These guys have way too much money. The cartel cocaine business is a trillion dollar industry. Matt says as he walks in behind Frank. You. Jessica groaned in disgust as she saw the man with a knife in his crotch and looks at Natasha questioningly. He was being a pig. Natasha shrugs. I wish that I could do that to a lot of men back in New York. Jessica admits as she averts her gaze. Women are scary creatures. Loki comments with a shake of his head, feeling sympathy for Javier's situation. You just figure that out? Frank asks with a raised brow. Didn't you say that you're a thousand-year-old god or something? Of course, Frank's voice carried a huge amount of sarcasm and disbelief. Want to find out? Loki says challengingly as a dagger appears in his hand. Without magic, he has had to rely on sleight of hand to have his fun. As the tension started to rise between both parties, a red and blue blur dropped down onto the balcony. That's enough, Spider-Man. Vicente grunts out as he climbs to his feet, cradling his broken hand in the process. What do you want? Straight to the point. I like that. Peter says as he walks over and takes a look at the man's emasculated son. Well, on the bright side, he could have a thriving career as a eunuch after this. I said, what do you want? Vicente grasped his fists tightly as he keeps his gaze trained on Peter. Right, my apologies. I'm sure he'll need a hospital as soon as possible. Peter says as he takes a seat on a padded outdoor chair. Tell me everything you know about the blacksmith. Vicente seemed to clam up for a moment as he looked toward his son. Well, come on. Peter says as he leaned back in his chair and crossed his legs. I'm sure he won't last much longer. I mean, how far is the nearest hospital anyway? The nearest hospital is 33.4 miles away, sir. Jarvis' voice echoes from Peter's phone. Hear that? Peter asks, snapping Vicente from his silence. Even if you leave now, he might not make it. Unless you have a helicopter dash boom, 
the helicopter that was parked in the courtyard below the balcony exploded with a fiery blast, sending a trail of black smoke up into the sky. Oops, Frank says as he held a detonator in hand. Vicente gnashed his teeth as he stared at Peter and his group with nothing but overwhelming hatred. Fine. After hearing everything Vicente had to say, Frank wore a look of pure betrayal on his face as he executed the cartel father and son with a single bullet to their heads. It's not possible. Returning to the tower, Peter and the rest of the group watched as Frank stormed off, knocking over random valuables and furniture along the way. He's pissed. Jessica comments as a chair flies across the room and impacts the wall. You think? Loki asks with a smirk, enjoying the destruction. Just as Frank turned the corner, leaving their line of sight, Matt looked at Peter with a worried expression. Should we follow him? He asks. No, he can't leave the building, and I'm sure his wife will calm him down. Peter says with a shrug as he turns to the remaining group. Good job, by the way. You all performed at a higher level than I expected. Just continue following Natasha's training, and you'll be full-fledged Avengers in no time. Hearing this, a feeling of accomplishment bloomed inside Jessica. She always wanted to help people as a hero, but her first attempt was hijacked by a maniac, so her dreams are finally beginning to form. Her dreams of being a hero may have been deflated by Kilgrave, but with him dead and gone, everything just kept looking brighter. As for Matt, he was coerced into joining the Avenger, though even he felt a feeling of accomplishment after their action-packed day. After all, just the Kitchen Irish alone was a name on his checklist of gangs to fight against, yet they were completely dismantled in a single day. Matt never thought that he could be a worldwide hero, like Spider-Man and Iron Man, so he set his sights on the small area of Hell's Kitchen, New York. Now that he has seen how much of an impact could be made as an Avenger, Matt found it hard to regret accepting Peter's coercive invitation anymore. Maybe this won't be so bad. Matt thought. Now head home and get some rest. Peter says as he walks out of the room, leaving the remaining defenders behind. Ugh. Frank stormed into his family's new apartment, cradling a bloody and broken fist. Stupid damn concrete walls. Ahem. Looking up from his throbbing hand, Frank found his wife sitting in the kitchen with their children, who were currently eating grilled cheese sandwiches with tomato soup. Dad. What happened? Frank Jr. asks as he hops out of his seat. No, sit back down. Maria, Frank's wife, reprimands him as she turns to her daughter next. Both of you stay here and finish your food. As the kids returned to eating whilst hiding their curious gazes, Maria grabbed Frank by his wrist and dragged him into their bedroom. Be careful. That hand is broken. Frank grunts in pain as she ignores his complaints and pulls harder. Oh, shut up. Maria yells in a whisper, so the children don't hear, closing the bedroom door behind her. What is this about? What? Frank asks back, unwilling to share his current dilemma. Don't what me. Maria says as she paces over to the bathroom and brings back a first aid kit. You come barging in like a crazy person with this? Reaching over, she grabs his hand, causing him to wince in pain as she starts working on his injuries. And then you curse in front of the kids as well. How many times have we talked about saying words like that in front of them? Maria says as she vindicatively cleans Frank's wounds with alcohol. Ugh. Frank grunts as he glares at his wife for a moment before calming himself down. Was dumping it like that really necessary? Do you want it to heal without an infection? She asks back, but he knew she was just mad at him. I'm sorry. Frank said as the room grew quiet. Maria didn't reply immediately as she worked on fixing his hand in silence. I guess I'm sorry about the alcohol as well. Maria replies as she finished wrapping his knuckles in gauze. So what happened? Frank wasn't talkative at first, but as most married men know, it's hard to say no to your wife. When Frank explained how Colonel Schoonover, his commanding officer, was a drug-dealing criminal who used his underworld contacts to put a hit out on their whole family, Maria was so shocked that she didn't speak for a good minute. You know the worst thing about all of this? Frank says with a smirk in self-deprecation. I saved that bastard's life in our last mission. When that piece of shit lost an arm, I took control and literally carried his butt out of there, yet this is how he repays me. By trying to kill my wife and children. It's okay, Maria says as she wraps her arms around Frank, resting his head on her shoulder. We're alive and unharmed. The kids may need a little therapy from the whole incident, but other than that everything is fine. She knew her husband and could tell that he was beyond furious. If she didn't do something to calm him down, then Frank would run headfirst at Schoonover and either get himself killed or locked up. No, everything won't be fine until that traitor is dead. Frank says as he separates from his wife. We can't even leave this tower in fear of another attack. How are the kids supposed to go to school and live their lives? Spider-Man is working on it, right? She asks, though Frank didn't seem to be listening anymore. Let's just leave this to the Avengers. They're far better equipped to deal with this, hey! Just as Maria was doing her best to calm her raging bull of a husband down, Frank stood up and rushed out of the room, leaving the apartment before anyone could say another word to him. Jarvis, are you here? Maria hesitantly asks. Don't worry ma'am. Jarvis' voice fills the apartment, shocking the two children. For your safety, your family has been blocked from going past a certain floor, trapping you in the upper portion of the tower. Your husband will soon learn this as well. Come on. 
Frank yells in frustration as he tried to open yet another stairwell, finding it locked like all the others. Before this, he tried to take the elevators down to the first floor, but soon realized that they didn't allow him more than five floors below his apartment. Bang bang bang, in a fit of rage, Frank started kicking the thick metal door, hoping to knock something loose, but no amount of power that he could give would make it budge. That bastard wasn't kidding when he said this was a vacation in confinement? Frank muttered between breaths as he tiredly leaned against the wall. No, I wasn't lying, Peter says, appearing beside Frank on the wall. Can you not pop up out of nowhere? It's creepy. Frank says as he slumps down onto the floor in defeat. So, planning to go and get yourself killed? Peter asks, completely ignoring Frank's comment. Frank didn't bother gracing Peter with a response. Aren't humans funny? You would rush off in a fit of vengeance because the family you love was almost killed, yet doing so could leave them without a father and husband for the rest of their lives, Peter says as he sits cross-legged next to Frank. You would give up the living family you have just for the chance at revenge against someone who's wronged you. He didn't just wrong me. Frank tries to add more reason behind it. He almost succeeded. Without you using your magic or whatever, all of us would have died in that park. He littered me, my wife, and my children with enough bullets to kill an elephant. Don't you think that's a good reason to stick with your family? Why try to throw your life away? Peter gives his thoughts. After all, if what you say is true, then I gave you and your family a second chance at a life together, why throw it away for some slimy scumbag, who'll be dealt with either way? Frank let out a resigned sigh as he picked himself up and limped down the hall. Not only did he hurt his hand by punching a concrete wall, but now his leg is damaged from kicking the stairwell door as well. Where are you going? Peter calls out as Frank walks off. You won't be able to go lower than this floor. I've made sure of it. I'm going back to my family. Frank replies without turning back. Good. Peter says as he stands up. Oh yeah, Frank. What? He turns back and asks. Wake up bright and early tomorrow morning. We'll be detaining Colonel Schoonover for questioning. Peter says, shocking Frank. But I thought. He mutters in confusion. What? That you wouldn't be involved? Peter asks back with a smirk under his mask. I never said that. I just didn't want you to throw away your life, like some brain-dead vengeful idiot. When Peter returned home that night, MJ was sitting at the center of the room in his computer chair, as if she were waiting for his arrival. The look on her face and general vibe screamed that a serious conversation was about to happen. Are you breaking up with me? Peter asks as he stood in the doorway, waiting for her to speak. No, of course not. MJ denies immediate, which smoothed over Peter's nerves quite a bit. Why would you think that? Well, I don't know. Peter shrugs unknowingly. Sigh. MJ holds her head in her hands and takes a deep breath. I want to meet Lily. Excuse me. Peter asks as he wasn't sure if he heard her correctly. Lifting her head, MJ looks Peter straight in the eyes. I want to meet Lily. She repeats loud and clear. I thought you didn't want to be a mom. Peter says as he walks in and takes a seat on his bed. Because meeting Lily means you accept her as your daughter. If you don't want to be her mother, that's fine. You two can meet when she's more mature and can handle it better. I never said that. MJ says with an annoyed look on her face. You dropped her existence into my lap without any warning. If you had explained and given me enough time to think, then you would know that I. The last portion of her rant was spoken in a hushed whisper. Say that again? Peter asks with a smirk. I said. MJ was upset, as she knew he could hear her. I don't mind being a mother. That's so hot. Peter muttered in a daze. Reaching his hand out, Peter caught his keyboard, which MJ threw at his head. Not like that, you idiot. She yelled angrily. What's going on? Aunt May came walking down the hall and peeked her head in. You two aren't breaking up, are you? No. MJ yelled one exasperation. Chuckling to himself, Peter looked toward the door, where his aunt was giving him a confused look. MJ wants to be the mother of my children. He reveals with a smirk. Oh, that's wonderful. May says as she grabs the door and starts to close it. Don't let me get in your way. That's not what I meant. Since Peter had a full day with the defenders tomorrow, he decided to introduce Lily to MJ after all of Frank's problems were dealt with. On the next day, Peter returned to the tower bright and early, where he found Frank waiting outside of his office in military uniform. You're early, Peter says as he checks the time. Better early than late. Frank shrugs as he was used to waking up early and standing around doing nothing in the army. Well, feel free to take a seat, Peter offers as Frank follows him into his office. While waiting for everyone else to arrive, Peter went over Colonel Schoonover's information. Other than the normal information that he already knew, Peter read through the files that Vicente gave him before his inevitable demise. First, Schoonover moved to New York City after his latest mission, so he was currently nearby. Second, using his position as a high-level officer in the army, Schoonover has been slowly and quietly removing any opposition, as he takes over the heroin trade in New York City, building his blacksmith persona up as the city's top drug lord. Shockingly, Peter had no idea that this was happening, as he mainly focuses on the obvious crimes that happen out in the streets. 
Anything that's done behind closed doors is a bit harder for him to stop, especially when more experienced criminals know how to not draw attention to themselves, like Schoonover. Although he was extremely careful, the documents that Vicente had in his possession are more than enough to charge Schoonover for all of his crimes. The Juarez cartel seemed to have been building up information on the blacksmith and his real identity for a while now, so they had everything from simple pictures to the voice recording of Schoonover ordering the hit on the Castle family. Now we just have to tie all of this to Agent Orange. Peter thought as he hoped that Schoonover would snitch on his accomplice. When everyone finally arrived, Peter opened a portal and they set off. I hope he resists. Frank's comments as he loads his assault rifle and steps through the portal. Me too. Loki smirks as he twirls a knife between his fingers. You men are too bloodthirsty. Jessica comments as she follows them through. Take a look next to you, sweetie. Frank says and jerks his head toward Natasha. That's what bloodthirsty looks like. Every time I close my eyes, I see the knife in that guy's balls. Matt comments in disgust. Aren't you blind? Natasha asks with a raised brow. While the group was bickering amongst each other, they arrived at Fort Hamilton, the only active duty military installation in the greater New York City metropolitan area. Walking up the long driveway past the guarded checkpoint, they drew a lot of attention, or rather Peter drew a lot of attention. After all, Spider-Man has never visited the military before, so instead of anyone trying to stop them threateningly, they were surrounded and bombarded with requests for a picture with Peter. Spider-Man. It only took one scream from a female officer to draw everyone in the vicinity over. Quiet. Peter yelled commanding, enhancing his voice with a bit of eldritch energy. Instantly, the trained soldiers shut their mouths. Even a few of them snapped into a salute, which was fairly fun to watch. Who's the highest ranking officer here? Peter asks as everyone looks at one another before pointing to a woman at the front. Good, everyone but her leave. I'll take some pictures with you all when we've finished what we came here for. Instantly, the crowd of soldiers dispersed, though they weren't too dejected, as they would get what they wanted soon enough. The remaining female officer silently waited to receive her orders, as if Peter were her commanding officer. Take us to Colonel Schoonover please, Peter says politely. Why yes, sir. She answers nervously and swiftly leads the way. Entering the main administration building at the forefront of the fort, she led them through the main lobby and hallways. All eyes were glued to Peter wherever they went, like a moving attraction. His presence caused everyone to whip out their cameras and start taking pictures as if he was a rare animal in the local zoo. He should be in here, she says as she knocks on the door and opens it a second later, revealing a conference room filled with high-ranking officers, including exactly who they were looking for. Don't interrupt our dash an older man, who looked to be an even higher rank than their target, stood up and complained, though he shut his mouth as soon as he saw Peter. Spider-Man? Is this a joke? I'm afraid not, Peter says as he strolls in. In order to prove that it was actually him, Peter reached his hand up and hopped, sticking himself to the ceiling for a moment before returning to the floor. Why are you here, sir? A different man asks with a lot of respect. Well, it's a long story, Peter says as he motions toward Schoonover, who was sweating rather profusely. Colonel, you're under arrest. Please surrender yourself peacefully. Or don't. Frank comments as he raises his assault rifle in Schoonover's direction. Frank, what's this about? He asks, pretending that he doesn't know anything. Yes, what is this about? The highest ranking man asks. What this is about is the fact that this dam put a hit out on me and my family. Frank says as he moves in and pokes Schoonover's head with the barrel of his gun. That, and he runs heroin out of the Middle East through the dead bodies of fallen soldiers, Peter adds, receiving an appalled gasp from his fellow officers. Got any proof? Schoonover asks confidently. I want Frank Castle and his family dead, do you hear me? Natasha strolls in and places her phone on the table, which played audio they received from Vicente. If kids are involved, then the price goes up. I'm sure you understand. Vicente's voice appears next. The price doesn't matter. Just get it done quickly and we won't have any problems. Schoonover's voice says uncaringly as the recording ends. That's fake. Schoonover exclaims as he slams the table angrily, though no one in the room believed a word out of his mouth. God, please pull a gun or a knife. Hell, I'll take a sharpened pencil. Frank mutters as he keeps his rifle next to Schoonover's head. Give me a reason? Of course, we have proof of his drug trafficking as well. Peter says, drawing everyone's attention especially since he was using the profits to fund an unsanctioned military operation. At this point, everyone in the room was looking at Schoonover with shock written all over their faces. I'm being set up. There's no way Dash Schoonover tried to stand, but all that awaited him was the butt end of Frank's assault rifle. Pow as the metal stock impacted the side of his head, Schoonover toppled over and hit the floor, unmoving. Really? Peter asks unhappily. What? He's not dead? After carrying Schoonover out of the military base, Peter left the rest of the detainment process to Natasha, as he reluctantly stayed behind to take pictures with as many people as he could. I shouldn't have promised anything. Peter thought as he took the hundredth picture before making up a random excuse and running off. With Schoonover detained, Peter texted Natasha to start his interrogation, as he left the tower to find his beautiful girlfriend. 
Jarvis, can you keep track of a man named William Rollins? He works for the CIA, and I believe him to be the blacksmith's accomplice, Peter says before leaving. On it, sir. Rolling up to school in his rundown car, Peter arrived just as the bell rang. Instantly, teenagers came pouring out of every exit, either heading to their bus, walking, or driving home. Thankfully, Peter fixed the problem with the exhaust, so black clouds doesn't shoot out of the tailpipe anymore. As he caught sight of MJ walking out alone, looking cute in one of his hoodies with her textbooks in hand, Peter honked his horn a couple of times to catch her attention. Question mark. MJ turned and saw the rust bucket. Shortly after getting the car, Peter told her that every great car needs a name, so she started calling it the rust bucket ever since. You skipped school, again. MJ commented as she walked over, pulled the creaky passenger door open, and took a seat. Well, I had a criminal colonel to capture. Peter says as he drove off. Does that mean? She asks cryptically. Yup, we're dropping off your books and then heading to see Lily, Peter says as they pull out of the school's parking lot. Instantly, MJ went quiet as she nervously stared out of the passenger side window. Watching MJ out of the corner of his eye, Peter smirked and grabbed her hand, entwining their fingers together. Don't worry, she'll love you. Parking in front of her house, MJ rushes out of the car and ran inside. Following her with an amused look on his face, they arrived at her bedroom, where MJ threw her books down and dashed into her closet. What are you doing? Peter asks as he leans against the doorway. I can't meet my daughter in the shitty clothes I wear to school, MJ says as she starts digging through her closet. I need something that shows I'm a proper mother. Proper mother? She's 17 years old. Peter bit his tongue, holding back any comments. Almost an hour later, Peter and MJ portaled into Lily's penthouse. MJ couldn't find a single outfit in her closet that was motherly enough, so she ended up wearing some jeans and a sweater. Daddy? Is that you? Lily asks as she heard footsteps from the microphone. Yup. Peter smiles as he walks in front of her camera and takes a seat. And I have a surprise for you, really? Lily exclaimed excitedly. What is it? Smiling into the camera, Peter reaches over and pulls MJ into the frame. Like a deer in headlights, she froze and didn't speak a single word. Mommy, Lily asks, matching her mother's current emotional state. It seems your mommy is nervous, Peter says with a laugh as he stands up and pushes MJ into the chair. Why don't you two spend some mother-daughter time together? Waving to the camera, Peter opened a portal and stepped through, leaving the two of them alone. Before either of them knew what happened, the portal snapped shut, and he was gone. Are you my mommy? Lily's hopeful voice asks nervously. Why yeah? Donning his spider suit, Peter portaled into the tower's detention floor, where he soon found Natasha, Jessica, Loki, Matt, and Frank standing outside one of the interrogation rooms. Learn anything interesting? Peter asks as he walks up to the group, surprising them. Yes, but we had to cut it short because someone wouldn't stop hitting him. Jessica says as she sends Frank an accusatory glare. What? That scumbag deserves it. He replies without a hint of remorse. What did you learn? Peter asks curiously as he peeks into the room through the window. On the other side of the door sat a slightly beaten colonel, who was strapped down to a metal chair. He had matching black eyes and a busted lip. All of which was most likely Frank's doing. Agent Orange was definitely involved. Natasha says as she hands him a file titled William Rollins. Everything in the file was rather mundane except for his job title of Director of Covert Operations for the CIA. Apparently, he rose through the ranks off the coattails of Operation Cerberus. All right, let's go and bring him in, Peter says as the day was still young. That's just what I wanted to hear. Frank says happily as he turns and picks his assault rifle up. What should we do with him? Matt asks as he motions toward the room with Schoonover. Just leave him to stew for a while. Peter shrugged as he wouldn't be able to escape. Jarvis, where is William Rollins? He's located in the unincorporated community of Langley in Fairfax County, Virginia, sir. Jarvis answers. Isn't that where the CIA headquarters is? Jessica asks. Yes. Stepping out of a portal, Peter and his group of future defenders appeared at the entrance of the CIA headquarters, which is a rather large government-style building. Well, let's see how welcoming they are compared to the military. Peter mutters as he walks up to the glass doors, pulls one open, and strolls inside. Instantly, guards in blacked-out suits with pistols on their hips came forward, though they stopped in their tracks as soon as they saw Peter. Sir, we're going to need some ID. One asks, not believing that it was the real Spider-Man. Sigh. Peter whips out his phone, which scared the security enough for them to draw their weapons, though he wasn't worried. Turning the phone's camera to himself, Peter took a selfie with the guards behind him, pointing their guns in his direction. A few seconds later, every phone in the lobby chimed with a Twitter notification. You should check that, Peter says as one of them reluctantly takes out his phone and sees the tweet. Spider-Man, visiting the CIA Today pistol, selfie here. The whole group of security guards shuffled around to look at the man's phone before someone finally took control. Lower your weapons now. An older man in a nice suit came running into the lobby with his phone in hand, breathing heavily to catch his breath. Why yes, sir. The guards quickly do as they were told and back up out of Peter's way. 
I apologize for the rude welcome, Spider-Man. The man in the suit says respectfully as he reaches out to shake Peter's hand. I'm John Brennan, director of the CIA. Spidey, nice to meet you. Peter gives his hand a quick shake. How can I help you? John asks curiously. Does this have anything to do with Colonel Schoonover's arrest? How do you know about that? Jessica asks in surprise. This is the CIA. It's our job to know. He answers smoothly. Can you take us to William Rollins? Peter asks. Sure, but why? The director asks curiously. Because we believe him to be Colonel Schoonover's accomplice, Peter replies easily. I can explain more when Rollins is in custody. Okay, let's dash John tries to speak but, director, one of the security guards calls out. Mr. Rollins left the building 20 minutes ago, before anyone could reply to the man, Jarvis voice echoed from Peter's phone. Sir, William Rollins has just purchased a one-way ticket on a flight to Qatar. He says loud enough for everyone to hear. He must have heard about Schoonover and ran. Frank utters as he kicks open one of the doors and angrily storms out of the building. As Peter's group was just about to follow Frank and rush out of the building, ready to chase down their prey, the director stopped them. Wait, he won't be at the airport? Question mark. Peter looked at him questioningly. Why do you say so? We're the CIA. If any of us want to disappear, we don't just buy a plane ticket. That ticket is nothing but bait to distract you while he slips away in some other way. Peter remained silent as he couldn't refute the man's logic. Jarvis, search through all train stations, private airports, car rentals, docks, and anything else you can think of, on it, sir? Jarvis replies. Is that Mr. Stark's artificial intelligence? The director asks with a hint of jealousy in his voice. I could use one of those. What are we waiting for? Frank comes running back with a pissed off look on his face. Sir, someone matching Rollins' description just boarded a train only 11 miles from your current location. Jarvis says before Frank could start ranting. All right, let's go check it out. Peter nods as he turns to the director. Want to tag along? He's your employee after all? Sure. As an outdated passenger train chugged along down the tracks, showcasing the beautiful greenery of the Virginia woodland, a bald man in a black suit stared out of the window with a hard glare. The cart he sat in was half-filled with other passengers, mainly families with children, who either cried or screamed the whole time. I hate kids. Rollins mutters in annoyance. Like karma for his words, a wet lollipop flies across the train and smacks him in his bald head, sticking in place on his skin. Sigh. Breathing heavily to hold his growing temper at bay, Rollins took the candy from his head and tossed it out of the window. Mommy. A random child yelled with tears in his eyes. That man threw my candy out the window. Rollins simply did his best to ignore his surroundings. He couldn't help but wonder where he went wrong, though the answer was fairly easy to decipher. We should have known better than to act rashly in New York City. Just as he thought of this, the whole train cart went deathly quiet, which was impossible with the number of children on board. Question mark. Rollins turned to the side and saw everyone looking at him in shock. Knock knock hearing a sound from the window, Rollins turns face to face with a familiar man in a red and blue suit. Mommy, it's Spider-Man. One child yelled as the rest of them started to shriek. Hello. Peter waves to Rollins, who slumped down in his seat, defeated. Days after Agent Orange's capture. In a dark room, Rollins and Schoonover were strapped to metal chairs. Both of them were a bit beaten up, but no amount of bruises and cuts could cover up the tired look of defeat on their faces. Outside of the room, Frank stared at Peter in disbelief. You're sure it's okay? Frank asks as he tightens his grip on the pistol in his hand. Yeah, as long as you agree to join the Avengers? Peter shrugs without much care. All right. Frank nods as he cocks his pistol back and storms into the interrogation room. Frank. Schoonover exclaims in surprise as he noticed the gun. Wait, don't dash bang. Without a shred of remorse or hesitation, Frank put a single bullet in the colonel's forehead, killing him instantly. Heavy breathing. Seeing this unfold, Rollins knew he was next and started hyperventilating. Please don't. Rollins begs as his breathing fastens. I'm sorry dash bang, once again, Frank executed Rollins in the same fashion as his accomplice, drilling a bullet into his skull. Holstering his pistol, Frank sighed as he finally completed his vengeance. You know how movies like to tell us that getting revenge isn't worth it in the end? Frank asks rhetorically as he walks out of the room. Well, they're full of crap. Walking past Peter, Frank made his way toward the elevators, ready to spend some quality time with his family. Jarvis, erase the security footage. Peter orders as he waves his hand, opening a large portal underneath the two dead bodies. Yes, sir. Jarvis says dutifully as the two were swallowed by the golden portal and shipped off to the sun. Laying in his bed, Peter hugged MJ close to his chest as they watched a movie on the flat screen TV. Hey, do you want to meet Thor? Peter asked as the movie ended. Ever since Loki was found, Peter planned to head over to Asgard, so that he could inform his family, though there was another reason for his visit as well. He needs to visit the dwarves of Nidavellir, as the Infinity Stones need some sort of conduit. The dwarves would be one of the very few in the whole universe with the means to craft something like the Infinity Gauntlet for him. Especially with the Reality Stone's appearance, which should happen in a few months' time. 
Although Peter has already found the coordinates for Nidavellir, having the King of Asgard's recommendation would most likely speed things along. In Asgard? She asks hopefully. Ever since Peter told her about the home of the Asgardians, MJ has always wanted to go and see the sights. Yeah, I'm leaving tomorrow morning though, so you'll have to ditch school, Peter says, knowing she would gladly do so. I can't wait. The next morning, Peter woke up to MJ running crazily around the room, getting ready to vacation in an alien civilization. She even packed a suitcase, as if he couldn't just portal her to her closet at any moment. You're finally awake. MJ exclaimed excitedly. After being rushed by his overly excited girlfriend, the two suited up and portaled straight into the throne room of Asgard's royal palace. Your Majesty, I see no reason why we haven't reclaimed the Nine Realms already. A young ambitious-looking warrior kneeled in front of Thor, as he sat on his father's old throne with his mother standing beside him, like a royal advisor. Baldur Freyson, we've spoken on this many times already. Frigga speaks up for her son. Many of the realms are peaceful and the outlook of Asgard is no longer focused on war. It hasn't been that way for a very long time. With all due respect, Queen Mother, I was speaking to the king. Baldur says with a small trace of disrespect toward Frigga. Turning his eyes back to Thor, who didn't look happy about his mother's treatment, Baldur spoke further. The realms have no respect or fear for their rulers any longer. Although they are our realms in name, each one has a ruler who governs as if they were king. There is only one king and he is of Asgard. Baldur's voice gets heated as he passionately spoke his mind. Baldur, I understand your position very well, Thor finally speaks. You're the third son in your family, so you won't inherit much, but you are a powerful soldier. A war would give you the opportunity to rise in the ranks and make a name for yourself outside of your family. Baldur flinched as he heard Thor speak all of his insecurities and motivations. I know this because I used to think in the same way, Thor says as he frowned at his past actions. I thought that I could never live up to my father, both as a king and a warrior, but war brings nothing but pain and death to all sides. Then what am I supposed to do? Baldur grinds his teeth and clenches his fists. Might I suggest something? Peter says as he walks up, making his presence known. Instantly, he and MJ, who was captivated by the architecture of the palace, were surrounded by spear-wielding Einherjar guards. Uh, MJ hummed as she poked the tip of a spear with her finger. Are you sure we're supposed to be here? My friend. Thor shot out of his seat and rushed over to Peter, pushing past his own guards. Yo! Peter waves as Thor picks him up in a powerful hug. What a wonderful surprise! Thor says as he drops Peter and looks toward MJ. Who might this be? This is my wife, Silk. Peter says with a smirk under his mask. No, we're dash MJ tries to clarify but, the spider has a wife. Thor shouts in shock. Yes, we've been married for 20 years. Peter says as MJ elbows him in the ribs. You said you had a suggestion? Frigga asks as Baldur stood there, annoyed that his audience with the king has been sidetracked. Yes, Peter says as he looks toward Baldur. If you want to make use of your power as a warrior, then leave Asgard and make a name for yourself somewhere else. The universe is full of conflict and opportunities, but I've sworn my loyalty to the king, he says uncertainly. You can be loyal to Thor without being in Asgard, Peter says with a shrug. Haha. <laughs> Thor laughs boisterously as he pats Peter on the shoulder. Good idea, spider. Looking at Baldur, Thor's demeanor shifted to that of a proud king. Baldur Freyson, I hereby order you to travel the universe and make a name for yourself. Fight for good and deliver justice to the wicked in my name. Thor decrees. Baldur stood rooted to the floor in shock. Be sure to visit your family before leaving. Frigga says with a stern look. I don't want to hear General Fry complain about us sending his son off without saying goodbye. Why yes, your majesty. Baldur stutters as he bows and paces out of the room, growing more excited by the second. Thank you, my friend. Thor says as the door shut behind Baldur. Maybe you should help me with Amora as well. She's been another thorn in my side lately. I'm not here to solve your woman problems, Peter says as he walks past Thor. Hello, Frigga. Has Odin's condition improved? Yes, Odin's sleep has done wonders without any interruptions, Frigga nods. Speaking of interruptions, Peter says as he takes out his phone and opens his photos. I met Loki on Earth. Holding out his phone, Peter showed a photo of Loki eating a slice of pizza on the busy streets of New York City. Exclamation point. Frigga rushed down the stairs from the throne to get a good look. He looks so different. Haha. <laughs> Thor laughed as he took a look as well. My pompous brother looks like a human. Yeah, he took after you as well, Peter says as he swipes to a picture of Loki and Jessica standing together. Is that his beloved? Frigga asks curiously. Not yet, Peter says as he swipes through a few more pictures. I see. Frigga nodded as she knew her son well. Yes, Loki has always been a bit of a coward when it came to women. Thor speaks the words that his mother held back. He once had a crush on Lady Sif for years, but never told her or anyone for that matter. He told me. Frigga says as she sends a reprimanding glare to her eldest son. Now stop airing your brother's private business. Well, at least we know Loki is doing well. Thor says as he looks away from his mother's glare. Yes, in fact, he's a sort of honorary member of the Avengers at the moment. 
Peter says, shocking the godlike mother and son. After answering a bunch of questions about Loki, Thor asked something unrelated to his brother. Are you only here to tell us about Loki or will you be staying? He asks, hoping to spend some time with his spidery friend. Actually, actually, I came to ask for a favor, though we will be staying to enjoy some sightseeing in Asgard. Peter says as he points over to MJ's suitcase. Silk has been excited for me to bring her here for a while. Spectacular. Thor's voice booms as he happily raised his arms. I will personally show you all that my home has to offer. You said something about a favor? Frigga speaks up from the side. Yes, whatever it is, it shall be done. Thor nods as his mother looks toward him disapprovingly. Thor, how many times do I have to tell you that your words as the king of Asgard mean far more than you can imagine? Do not agree to anything before you fully understand what's going on? Frigga says seriously. Although she didn't think Peter would take advantage of Thor, others with a more nefarious mindset would jump at the opportunity to swindle Asgard out of its countless treasures and powerful artifacts. Well, now that I know it can be anything. Peter says jokingly as he starts listing off impossible demands. Oh, and I'll take Mjolnir back. As he says this, Peter moves quickly and grabs the hammer off of Thor's belt, lifting it with ease. Huh, I guess she still likes me. Peter says and twirls Mjolnir between his fingers as lightning crackles all around his body. Mjolnir isn't a she. Thor says as he holds his hand out and called his trusty hammer back, ripping Mjolnir from Peter's grasp. Now, what do you actually need? You're so mean. Peter playfully whines like a child. I was finally reunited with Mjolnir and you snatch her away so suddenly. Sigh. Thor heaves a calming breath before throwing his hammer back to Peter, who caught it without trouble. Thor. Frigga looked at her son in disapproval. What? He's not going to steal it. Thor says as he looks toward Peter, who was covered in lightning again. Now, what's this favor you need? I need a referral letter or something so that the dwarves in Nidaveller will craft me a weapon. Peter says as he plays around with Mjolnir. Although I don't regret giving you your hammer back, as it never belonged to me in the first place, I found that I want a weapon of my own now. Of course, Peter was lying out of his butt, as he didn't want anyone to know about the Infinity Stones or his plan to wield them in the future. Even his plan for the dwarves will hopefully keep them in the dark as well, though that will be put to the test when they see the blueprints. That's it? Thor says, as if it wasn't a big deal to commission a weapon from Nidaveller. Even his mother didn't seem phased by Peter's request. I'll have something written up by the time your welcome feast begins. Thor says grandly. Welcome feast? MJ asked. Yeah, you'll find that Asgardians, like many humans in our world, love drinking, partying, and fighting. Peter says with a shrug as he tosses Mjolnir back to Thor, who was nodding along to his friend's assessment of his people. I take offense to that. Frigga says, knowing that this wasn't completely true. Yes, the warriors of Asgard like fighting and drinking, but the rest of our population are a different story. What percentage of Asgardians are warriors? Peter asks. 70% Frigga answers reluctantly. If the majority of your population loves drinking and fighting, then I think that is enough to represent them as a whole, Peter says with a shrug. It's not necessarily a bad thing, though. Frigga didn't look pleased, though she knew that Peter was correct. She only wished Asgard was a bit more refined. Partying and drinking was one thing, but the amount of duels between warriors, which the royal family has to sometimes oversee, depending on the status of the participants, is a lot. After speaking for a while longer, Peter and MJ were whisked off by Thor, who showed them around until the feast was prepared. MJ was awestruck for most of the tour, which was cute since she wasn't easily impressed by things like architecture. When the time came for the feast, Peter and MJ arrived early to find the throne room filled with long tables, chairs, and decorations. Servants ran here and there, like chickens with their heads cut off, working as fast as they could to lay out food and ale for the coming swarm of high-standing Asgardians, who would arrive within the hour. Looking up at the table placed in front of the throne, Peter found a very familiar woman seated next to Thor. Dr. Foster, it's good to see you again. Peter says as he and MJ could see the two of them talking intimately with one another. Are they together already? Since Asgard never lost its Bifrost, thanks to Peter's interference in Loki's schemes, Thor wasn't trapped in Asgard and separated from Jane, like their movie counterparts were. My friend. Thor bellows as he stood from his throne. Come and join us. As the room began to fill, Peter talked with Jane, wondering if she was looking into the Convergence yet. The Convergence is a cosmic event that occurs every 5,000 years when all nine realms are placed into alignment. This alignment causes the dimensional boundaries between each realm to become thin, resulting in various physical and hyperdimensional anomalies occurring at random. These phenomena include shifts in gravity, spatial extrusions, and the fabric of reality potentially tearing apart. During a convergence in 2988 BC, Malkith, the king of the Dark Elves, sought to take advantage of the weakened boundaries between the realms to use a powerful weapon known as the Aether to revert the universe to the primordial state of darkness in which his race had once thrived. These attempts were thwarted by the Asgardians under the command of their king, Borthor's grandfather. Following their crushing defeat, Malkith and the surviving Dark Elves retreated, entering a prolonged hibernation until the time of the next convergence in 2013. 
It's already 2013, Peter thought as he probed for information. Other than visiting your alien boyfriend, what have you been up to? Still studying wormholes? Hearing Peter call them out without any care or shame, Jane blushed a bit while Thor simply laughed and reached an arm around her waist. Well, I was working for S.H.I.E.L.D. for a while, but that didn't exactly work out. As for my recent work, that's a bit complicated. Jane answers, unwilling to divulge her secrets. Are you still traveling and chasing anomalies? Peter asks an important question. In the movie, Jane and her crew moved to London before the convergence took place. No, Selvig has been having a hard time lately, so I moved to London to look after him. Jane answers sadly. I'm sorry to hear that. Peter says sympathetically. Didn't he go insane in the movies or something? After enjoying the party for a while, Peter and MJ were ready to call it a night. As they made their way through the crowded hall, Thor ran up to Peter, smelling of alcohol and cooked meat. My friend. He says with a bit of a slur as he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a letter, which was sealed shut in red wax, depicting the crest of the Asgardian royal family. Bring this to King Eitri and he will make whatever you wish. Thank you, Thor. Peter says as he carefully takes the letter and throws it into a portal for safekeeping. If you need help with anything, just let me know and I'll be there. Haha. Ha. Of course. Thor says as he lifts a nearby barrel over his head and starts drinking from it. That night, while MJ slept and Thor partied in the throne room, Peter opened up a portal to the home of the dwarves, Nidaveller. Nidaveller is a neutron star, which is orbited by a multi-ringed megastructure that serves as the homeworld of the dwarves. Peter appeared in the lobby of a huge forge, filled with all sorts of dwarves, who all seemed to be working on their own projects. Some were hammering away at hot pieces of metal, while others were pouring giant vats of molten liquid into molds. For dwarves, they all looked to be of normal height with beefy bodies, except for one of them who appeared to be a giant version of Peter Dinklage from Game of Thrones. Insert picture of King Eitri here, intruder. One of the dwarves called out as they all turned in Peter's direction. Yo! As all of the dwarves turned their heads to see Peter and the golden portal closing behind him. Each of them took hold of their hammers or other nearby tools, ready to fight at any moment. What do you want? King Eitri's voice boomed as he stomped over, surrounded by an army of glaring dwarves at his back. I have a letter from Thor Odinson, Peter says as a small portal opens and the letter falls into his waiting hand. Give it here. Eitri holds out his hand expectantly. Walking up to him with the letter in hand, the smaller dwarves protectively stepped in front of their king and held up their weapons. I'll take it. An older dwarf stepped out of the crowd and held out his hand. Without making any comments, as Peter needed to make a good impression, he handed the letter to the elderly man and took a step back. Everyone shuffled out of the way as the elderly dwarf hobbled toward the king and handed off the letter. Pinching the small piece of paper with his giant fingers, King Eitri examined the seal before turning to Peter with a curious gaze. You are not a Scardian? Eitri says questioningly. No, I'm a friend of Thor's from Midgard. Peter answers with a shake of his head. I see. Eitri mutters as he breaks the seal and unfolds the letter. Hmm. Ha 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 ha. After reading the letter for just a second, the king burst out into uncontrollable laughter. Question mark. Peter and even the surrounding dwarves stared at Eitri in confusion. Do you know what this says? King Eitri asks as his laughter subsides. No idea. Peter shrugs unknowingly. Take a look. He says and tossed the letter back to Peter, who caught it with ease. Dear, King Eitri give my friend whatever he wants p.s., if you don't, he'll kick your butt Thor Odinson, King of Asgard and the Nine Realms. Peter didn't believe his eyes as he reread the letter for a second and third time. Sigh, if it makes you feel better, I believe Thor may have written this at my welcome feast, so he was most likely drunk. He takes after his father, I see. Eitri says with a small laugh. I've only met Odin once and can say for sure that I wouldn't make the same comparison. Peter comments in confusion. Well, Odin wasn't always the wise king. He was once a drunken buffoon too. Eitri laughs as he remembers times long forgotten. It's hard to picture a Thor like Odin, but let's just hope that Thor can go through a similar transformation as well. Peter says with a shrug. So, what do you want? Eitri asks as the dwarves start to slowly let their guard down. I have a few blueprints that I need forged. Peter says as another portal opens beside him. Reaching inside, Peter pulled out six large rolled-up blueprints. Each of them had different and confusing drawings in them, though everything was labeled with measurements and materials down to the smallest detail. This time, since the dwarves were a bit more relaxed, Peter walked up and handed over the blueprints himself. Eitri hummed as he skimmed over each blueprint one by one. What is this? Components to a few different projects that I've been working on, Peter says with a shrug. I don't have the skill or the means to make these parts myself, so here I am. I don't know. The king muttered as he usually didn't like making things without full knowledge of the final product. If the referral from Thor isn't enough, I can pay for your service in some way, Peter says enticingly. What do you have in mind? The king asks, though he wasn't very convinced. If you look at the blueprints, you'll see a material named Vibranium listed on every one, Peter says as Eitri looks them over, finding that exact material. If you personally accept and craft my order, I'll supply you with double the amount of Vibranium mentioned on the blueprints, what is this material? 
Itri asks as he has never heard of anything by that name. Vibranium is a supermetal? Peter says as he explains all that he knew. In a pure mass, vibranium forms a solid metal that is stronger than steel, but only a third of the weight, as well as being completely vibration absorbent. This makes it nearly indestructible, as any attempt to physically damage the material will be negated on a molecular level, as mechanical-slash-kinetic energy will be absorbed instead of breaking any bonds in its molecular structure. In general, this means that vibranium can absorb a wide variety of physical impacts, without taking any damage or weakening. Vibranium also deflects kinetic energy. Captain America's shield, for example, was able to deflect high-caliber bullets, Iron Man's repulsor beams, and even an impact from Mjolnir itself. Though, vibranium isn't just a metal, as the Wakandans sew it into their clothes and use it to power their city, technology, and weapons. The longer Peter talked, the more each dwarf, including King Itri himself, stared in his direction with hungry eyes and watering mouths. Basically, vibranium is a very useful and powerful metal. Peter finished his explanation. The room stayed silent for a moment before every dwarf in the forge started yelling, offering up anything they could for just a small chunk of vibranium. Ahem. King Itri loudly cleared his throat, signaling his underlings to shut their mouths, which they did. Do you have this metal with you? No, I have to get it, but it won't take me long, Peter says with confidence. All right, bring the metal and you have a deal, the king says as he stashes the blueprints into his pocket. I'll complete the order myself as well, sound good to me, Peter nods as he opens a portal behind himself. I'll be back when I have the vibranium. Stepping through the portal, Peter returned to his bedroom in Asgard, where he sighed in relief and flopped down next to MJ on the bed. That went as well as I could have hoped? Peter thought as the worry he felt slowly faded away. The reason for his worry was the blueprints, which took him a long time to make, mainly for two reasons. Firstly, the blueprints are pieces to a very complicated puzzle, which Peter spent countless days tweaking in order to make them as confusing and nonsensical as possible. Though he did this for a very important reason. When all six blueprints are put together with a bit of magical and technological assistance, they will create the perfect conduit, which can be used to wield the Infinity Stones. Well, Peter hoped it could be used to wield the stones. He would only know for sure after testing out the finished product. Without knowledge in the mystic arts, Itri shouldn't be able to figure out the true function of the things he's making. Peter thought reassuringly. Once the conduit is completed, Peter can use it to create the thing he'll use to wield the infinity stones. I wonder what I should make. Peter thought to himself as he cuddled next to MJ. A gauntlet, like Thanos, would be cool, but maybe I should make something a bit more original, like a necklace or... While thinking of possible ideas, Peter thought of the hidden and advanced city of Wakanda and his needed acquisition of their most precious metal. Should I just rob them or ask nicely? Peter asked himself as he stared up at the ceiling. Taking a few pounds of vibranium while under invisibility will most likely go unnoticed, as Wakanda has a literal mountain's worth of the stuff. On the other hand, asking nicely opens Peter up to the possibility of hearing the word no. Suddenly, as he was thinking this, Peter remembered another person who stole from Wakanda as well. Doesn't Ulysses Clow have a lot of vibranium? Peter thought as he remembered the black market arms dealer who stole from Wakanda in the 90s. A smile formed on Peter's lips as he came to an easy conclusion. Either steal from a peaceful nation or a wanted criminal. The answer was simple. Where is Clow? After spending a few days on Asgard, treating their whole trip like an actual vacation, Peter and MJ said their goodbyes to Thor and Frigga before heading back home to Earth. Visit anytime, my friend. Thor says with a wave as Peter and MJ step into a portal. You too, Peter says as he turns back, looking at Thor through the portal. After all, Loki can't be the only Asgardian Avenger. Hearing Peter's invitation, a look of surprise appeared on Thor's face, though that soon morphed into a smirk as the portal closed. An Avenger, huh? Thor thought with interest. That was amazing? MJ comments with a happy sigh as she flopped down onto Peter's bed. I'm glad you had fun, Peter says with a smirk as he lays down next to her and their hero suits disappear. After spending some alone time with his girlfriend, as they didn't have the luxury of such intimate times on Asgard, Peter suited up again and went to the tower. Jarvis, Peter called as he entered his office. Yes, sir. Jarvis answers back instantly. I need you to find me a man named Ulysses Clow. Peter explained as he took a seat. He's a wanted arms dealer from South Africa, who should have a large quantity of metal in his possession, so look into any boats, planes, warehouses, homes, or anything similar. I'm not sure if he travels with the metal or not, so you'll have to figure that out for me. I'll start searching now, sir. Jarvis agrees easily. Thanks, but there's one more thing. Peter says as he plugs a USB into his computer. Instantly, a loading bar appeared and began to fill as another window popped up, showing a map of London with a red blip on it, labeled Jane Foster. After knowing that Jane was already living in London, Peter planted a tracker on her phone. Thanks to his knowledge and skill in the mystic arts, even Tony wouldn't be able to find the tracker. I also need you to surveil Dr. Jane Foster, Peter says as he leaned back in his chair. 
Give me daily updates on her activities and immediately inform me should any odd occurrence start happening in her surroundings. Yes, sir. Two weeks passed and Jarvis carried out Peter's orders perfectly, though he still hasn't found Clow. While waiting for information on his target, Peter started a new division in the Avengers, which would put Matt's law firm to work. Flashback what are you doing? Peter asks as he saw Jessica in one of the conference rooms of the tower. She sat there in front of a laptop, surrounded by boxes full of files, like a lawyer preparing for the case of her life. I'm looking into Kilgrave's victims, Jessica says as she leans back in her chair, stretching her stiff arms. He ruined a lot of people's lives, so I'm trying to build a list so that I can help them. As she says this, Jessica turns the laptop toward Peter, showing him a news article about a woman, who chopped off her husband's family jewels. You think Kilgrave made her do it? Peter asks as he felt nothing but pity for the husband. I know he did. She says and clicks on a video, showing a brief sighting of Kilgrave and the same woman inside a nightclub. And now she's in an insane asylum? Okay, I see your point. Peter says as he took a seat and contemplated a fix for this. Obviously, she can't do this on her own. Exclamation point. Instantly, Peter thought of a good idea. How about I start a new division in the Avengers called the Victims Relief Division? Hearing Peter's words, Jessica looked up at him in interest. We'll start off small. You, Matt, and his partner Foggy will research any captured criminals that the Avengers dealt with, compile a list of victims, and a description of what happened to them. Peter explains his thoughts. Once someone is added to the list, the Avengers will act to help them, either monetarily or otherwise. You can get her out of the asylum? Jessica asks doubtfully as she motions toward the woman on the screen. There's a lot that I can do, though it would depend on how sound her mind is. Peter answers thoughtfully. As long as she isn't a danger to herself and others, then clearing her name and setting her free is doable. We just have to be 100% sure that these are victims before acting. Flashback end. For the past week, Nelson and Murdoch have finally been put to work alongside Detective Jones, who took a leading role in the group. Already, they've identified a list of three victims of Kilgrave with proof of their innocence. With a few tweets, meetings with high-level government officials, and generous donations to the Democratic Party, Peter was able to get these people the help that they needed. I wonder why I never thought of this before. Peter thought as he reviewed a file about the woman who cut off her husband's. Thanks to Jessica's work, she was now being evaluated for a possible discharge from the asylum. As long as she passes the test, she will be allowed out, though regular checkups will always be needed. After all, the human brain is a fragile thing, and she has been through a lot. As Peter woke up alone in his bed, as MJ stayed at her house last night, his phone instantly went off. Sir, I found Ulysses Clow. Jarvis says, waking Peter up faster than a cup of coffee. Ha, Peter grunted as he snatched his phone off of the bedside table. Say that again? I found Ulysses Clow. Jarvis repeats himself. Where is he? Peter asks as he hops out of bed and rushes to get ready. Clow is currently on his way to Saudi Arabia, where he plans to meet oil prince Mohammed bin Nayef for some sort of transaction. Jarvis explains as Peter brushed his teeth. Is he traveling with a lot of cargo? Peter asks hopefully. Yes, not only a plane full of cargo, but a boat that I've linked to him is also moving toward the same destination. Jarvis informs. Good job, Jarvis, Peter says as he turns on the shower. Send everything I need to know to my phone. Yes, sir. Once Peter finished his morning routine, he donned his spider suit and opened a portal. I hope this goes well. Peter thought as he stepped through the portal and appeared in a beautiful throne room, which looked to be constructed by extremely advanced technology. Though the ornate tribal chairs, which sat on a carpet in the center of the room, didn't look advanced at all. Peering out of the large windows at the back of the room, Peter admired the extremely advanced city. Insert picture of Wakanda's throne room here, if I didn't see Asgard, this would be a shocking experience, Peter thought as an alarm starts to sound. Did they detect me already? Without caring for the alarms and the marching footsteps coming his way, Peter strolled over to the giant window at the back of the room and enjoyed the view. Soon enough, the door swung open and rows of bald African women rushed into the room with spears in hand. Rushing up to Peter, who didn't even turn around, the Dora Milaje surrounded him, holding their spears to his back. I never thought that such a celebrity would visit my small country. An aged voice with an African accent says. Well, I wouldn't call all of this small, Peter replies as he turns to see the spears around him. Are all of these made from vibranium? How could we use such a finite resource so wastefully? The voice says again as the crowd of dutiful female warriors parted, revealing King Chaka in an ornate robe. Insert picture of Chaka here, well, we both know vibranium isn't exactly finite, is it? Peter says as he leans against the window. It's nice to meet you, King Chaka. You as well, Spider-Man. The king says as he motions for the Dora Milaje to ease off. My daughter is a huge fan. I wouldn't mind saying hello once we've finished our business. Peter says as the warrior women removed their spears from his vicinity, though they stayed close to their king. After all, Chaka isn't the Black Panther anymore. He needs the extra protection. Father. A familiar voice yells as the current Black Panther storms in, ready to fight. I heard there's an intruder. 
Insert picture of Chala here, Chala stopped in his tracks as he saw who the invader was. Spider-Man. He asks himself in confusion. Hello. Peter says with a wave as he turned back to Chalia's father. Is there a place where we can talk in private? As Peter asked this, he could see the disapproving looks of everyone, including Chala. The current Black Panther is welcome to join us, of course, Peter motions to Chala before they could refuse. How do you know that? Chala felt like he was dreaming right now. I've known about you guys for a while, Peter says with a shrug. I just didn't have a reason to visit until now. Soon enough, the throne room was cleared out, leaving only Chala, Chaka, and Peter behind. The Dora Milaj were reluctant to leave, but they couldn't disobey Chaka. Knowing that Chala would be there, as he is the current Black Panther, certainly eased the warrior women's minds though. As the doors were shut tightly, Chaka took a seat on his throne with his son by his side. Now, what can Wakanda do for you? Chaka asks curiously, though he was unsure about how to deal with such a high-level outsider knowing all about their secrets. And how do you know about us? Chala asks suspiciously. How I know about you doesn't matter. Peter stood in front of Chakia's throne, as he didn't know if using the surrounding seats would be seen as disrespectful or not. Taking out his phone, Peter holds it face up and taps a button. Instantly, a foot-long hologram of Ulysses' claw appeared. And it's not about what Wakanda can do for me, but what I can do for it. Peter says as Chaka frowned at the image of his most slippery enemy. Ulysses' claw stole from us and triggered a bomb at our border to escape. Many lives were lost. Chaka says as he looks at Peter in interest. You know where he is? Yes, and I'll deliver him to you, for a price, Peter says as the hologram disappears. I see, you're just like everyone else, Chala says as he realized why Spider-Man was really here. You want our sacred metal? Yes, Peter answers with an uncaring shrug. Though, I'll settle for the vibranium in Klaus' possession as my payment, why even come to us? Chaka asks as he motions for his son to calm down. You could have simply robbed Ulysses and had exactly what you wanted, two reasons actually, Peter says as he holds two fingers up. First, the vibranium in Klaus' possession doesn't belong to him, so I would still be in possession of stolen goods. Second, I want to have a good relationship with Wakanda. Feeling odd about standing while everyone else was seated, Peter sat back onto open air, as chair manifested out of nowhere, catching him before he could hit the floor. In fact, I'd like to offer you a position on the Avengers Council. Peter offers King Chaka as he watches the current and future kings of Wakanda stare at his chair in shock. Did he just? Chala asks in shock. Calming himself, Chaka ignores Peter's act of magic. As you seem to know already, I'm not the Black Panther anymore. I don't believe that I'm qualified to join the Avengers. Being on the council isn't about having superpowers. Peter shakes his head as he motions to Chala. Although your son would make a good Avenger, I wouldn't offer him a position on the council. Chala didn't seem to like hearing that, though he kept his mouth shut. It's about experience, leadership, and ability, Peter says as he leans back in his seat. Your son may fit the position in a few years or more, but until that day comes, Wakanda could use some representation on the council. Why would we need that? Chaka asks curiously. Wakanda is an isolated country. We stay out of the world's business and they stay out of ours. True, but the world is expanding, Peter says, confusing the two Wakandans. Do you know how many metahumans have been surfacing lately? Question mark. Neither father nor son answered, as they stayed out of the business of the outer world. Of course, they knew about metahumans and their array of possible powers, but they haven't been looking into it much past that. In the USA alone, about 47 children manifested their X-gene last year, and the number is only growing. It was at 36 in the year before that, Peter explains. Not to mention the aliens that tried to invade our planet. What does that have to do with us? Chaka asks, unconvinced. That is the problem right there, Peter says as he points to the king. It may not be your problem now, but that doesn't mean you can hide in your little barrier forever. Is that a threat? Chala asks as his face hardens. No, it's an inevitable truth, Peter says with a sigh. Sooner or later, either the problems of the outside world will spill over to you, or your own problems will spill over to the outside world. Especially with the new changes that the outside world is currently going through. I see your point, but I'm afraid that the decision isn't up to me, Chaka says as he motions toward the multiple seats around them, representing the many tribes that make up Wakanda. The tribal council would have to vote and they've always favored isolationism over anything else. Even I think similarly, Yes, but I'm not asking you to reveal yourselves to the world, Peter says as he leans forward and looks Chaka in the eyes. I'm offering you a place on our council, so that the future reveal of Wakanda, which I know is inevitable, can have the support and backing of the world's most powerful organization. Do you not factor Wakanda into that statement? Chala asks, as he thought his home had no equal. I hope you understand that this isn't a threat, because it's not. Peter says as he looks at Chala and his father seriously. But I would only have to send out one of our council members to deal with your entire country, should the need ever arise. Though I doubt it will. Eric would have a field day in Wakanda, especially after he found out how useful the literal mountain's worth of vibranium is. A vibranium-armed magneto would be a hard enemy to beat. Peter thought as he watched the king and his son react to his words. 
Chawa looked like he was about to leap from his seat and attack Peter at any moment, while his father seemed to take in this information with a much calmer demeanor. Whether that is true or not Dash Chaka speaks but he was instantly interrupted by a commotion outside. Princess, no. A woman yelled as the doors to the throne room flew open and a 12-year-old girl rushed inside with an excited smile. Insert picture of Shuri here, behind her stood a couple members of the Dora Milaje, who tried to stop her from getting in. It's really Spider-Man. She shrieked and ran over as fast as she could. I'm Shuri, and I'm your biggest fan. I watched every video and follow all of your accounts. Do you want to see my Spider-Man collectibles? I made a lot of them myself. As if a switch was flipped, the tension that once filled the throne room disappeared, like it was never there in the first place. You weren't kidding when you said your daughter was a fan, huh? Peter comments as he peeks past the little girl toward her father. She was one of your first hundred subscribers on YouTube, Chaka explains as Shuri nods enthusiastically. I see, Peter says as he turns back to Shuri. Why don't you get the collectibles ready and I'll check them out when I come back later tonight? You're leaving already? Shuri whined disappointingly. Yes, I have to go and catch a criminal for your father, but it won't take long, Peter says as he pats the cute girl on the head. Maybe I can introduce Shuri to Lily. She could use a friend to play with, though it would have to wait until Lily is more stable. Fine, King Chaka says out of nowhere. I accept your deal. Bring Cloud to me alive and you may keep what he stole. As for your other offer, I need time to think before giving an answer. Alright, I'll be back in a few hours at most, Peter says as he waves to Shuri and opens a portal, leaving the nearby Wakandans shocked as he left. Daddy, what was that? Shuri exclaimed as the portal snapped shut and the chair Peter conjured earlier disappeared as well. I don't know. As Peter returned to the tower, Jarvis immediately updated him on the situation. Sir, Ulysses Clow has landed in Saudi Arabia. A military convoy just picked him up and they're taking him to meet the prince, Jarvis says. All right, let's go and get my vibranium. Following the coordinates given by Jarvis, Peter opened a portal to the front deck a small shipping boat. Using his senses, Peter could feel a lot of guards moving along the boat with assault rifles in hand. Meh, I don't feel like dealing with these guys, Peter thought lazily as he turned himself invisible and maneuvered through the boat. Searching the whole vessel with relative ease, Peter found a ton of illegal weaponry. Every metal shipping container on the ship was filled to the brim with assault rifles, sniper rifles, shotguns, huge machine guns, and the largest cache of explosives that Peter has ever come across. Damn, Peter thought as he used a quick spell to seal each shipping container's door, keeping them locked away so that no one can use them. At least, for the time being. After searching for about 10 minutes, Peter sealed every single container and made his way down below deck, where the security jumped up to a whole new level. Cameras, motion sensors, thick metal doors with keypads. Whatever Clow was hiding down below deck was worth far more than the millions in weaponry that he stored up above. Vibranium perhaps? Peter thought as he simply opened portals to get past the key-coded doors. As for the cameras and motion sensors, being invisible made them absolutely useless. Bypassing the heavy security as if it weren't there, Peter no longer encountered any human guards. Clow must not trust them with the vibranium? Peter thought as he arrived in a sort of makeshift bedroom. Is this where he sleeps? Ignoring all of Clow's personal belongings and furniture, Peter could see something big in the corner of the room, which was covered by a large tarp. Walking over with an excited gait in his step, Peter yanked the tarp off, revealing stacks of shiny platinum-colored bricks. Vibranium. Why do I feel the urge to laugh like a lunatic right now? Peter muttered as a smirk formed under his mask. Holding back his villainous cackling, Peter opened a portal below the glistening bricks and watched them fall inside with glee. May POV kiss already. May exclaimed as she watched a Korean drama on the TV in the living room. Just like all TV shows with romance, the writers somehow find a way to drag out everything, so she has been waiting multiple seasons for her favorite couple to finally kiss. They teased it happening in the latest trailer, and now the cold CEO had his poor secretary pinned up against a wall. The two stared into each other's eyes longingly as they moved forward in tandem, heatedly eyeing each other's lips. Bang! Exclamation point. May jumped from her seat as a huge load of metal bars fell through a portal and landed in the center of the living room. What the? Turning her head back to the TV, May saw the credits rolling. She missed the kiss. Peter. Peter's POV. Based on eyesight alone, Peter estimated that there is around 700 pounds of vibranium now in his possession. Clow must have sold the other 300 pounds already. Peter thought, as it was mentioned in the movie, that Clow stole half a ton of vibranium from Wakanda. Or he has some more stashed elsewhere? After giving the room a quick search, Peter whipped out his phone. Jarvis, Peter calls. Yes, sir. Jarvis answers dutifully. Anonymously contact any nearby military ships and inform them of this ship's location and heading. Tell them it has a ton of explosives on board, which the occupants plan on using in a terrorist attack when they reach their destination. Peter orders as he opened a portal and left the ship. Message sent, sir. Hoping that the plane, which Ulysses Clow used to fly to Saudi Arabia, would have some more vibranium, Peter portaled there next. The plane was parked in a private single-strip airport in the middle of the Arabian desert. 
Once again, like the shipping boat, the plane was completely surrounded by armed guards, though Peter was still invisible, so he simply walked past them and started searching the plane. Sadly, every crate inside the plane was filled with nothing but weaponry and explosives. Not a single shiny metal brick in sight. Whatever. Peter shrugged as he pulled the pin on a few grenades and portaled off into the distance to watch the fireworks. Boom, as he appeared on the roof of a nearby hangar, Peter saw the plane explode, sending the nearby guards flying from the shock wave. Before leaving, Peter waved his hand and opened portals under each downed guard, sending them to Klaus' room in the boat, which would be intercepted by military forces soon enough. Alright, I got what I wanted. Peter muttered as he opened a portal beside himself. Time to finish the job. Do you have the medal? A Middle Eastern man in a headdress and long white shirt asks, as many armed soldiers escort Ulysses Klaus up to him. Muhammad bin Nayef, a prince with enough money to live like a god, which was all thanks to the oil deposits that blessed his family's land. Can we do this inside? Preferably with some air conditioning? Klau asks as he wipes the sweat from his brow. I don't know how you people live in this heat. We are already here. Muhammad replies uncaring as he snaps his fingers. Instantly, a servant comes forward with a laptop and hands it over. Opening it up, the prince logs into his bank account and prepares a wire transfer for an ungodly amount of money. Show me the medal. He says as he shows the laptop screen to Klau. Hee hee, how generous of you. Ulysses laughs as he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a single brick of vibranium. Hand it over for authentication. One of the prince's men held his hand out expectantly. No can do, Klaus says with a shake of his head. Send the money first? You do not make the rules dash the man says, but was soon stopped by Prince Mohammed. Type your account number? The prince says as another one of his men holds the laptop for Klau. Typing in a long number, which lead to a secure overseas bank, Klau watched as the prince tapped the enter key, filling up his bank account in an instant. I'll take my vibranium now, the prince says, as every soldier in the surroundings took aim at Klau. It was good doing business with you, your highness, Ulysses Klaus says with a smirk as he finally hands over the brick. Just as the prince was about to take the brick from Klaus' outstretched hand, a golden portal opened below the arms dealer, causing him to fall through with the vibranium still in hand. Exclamation point. Before anyone could fully realize what happened, the portal snapped shut, leaving Prince Mohammed and his men in the desert with shocked and confused looks on their faces. Aha! Uh -huh. Klaus screamed in surprise as he fell through a golden portal and crash-landed on a sandy desert hill. Yo! Peter says with a wave as Klau climbed out of the hill while spitting sand from his mouth. S. Spider-Man. He utters in shock as he turned to see Spider-Man holding the prince's brick of vibranium. Yep, now please surrender peacefully, or I'll be forced to restrain you. Peter gives Ulysses a chance to do things without violence. Seeing where this was going, Klau stealthily reaches behind his back. Alright, I don't want any trouble. Knowing what was happening, Peter rolled his eyes under his mask. Why do they always choose the hard way? He sighed internally. Suddenly, Klau pulled a shiny, futuristic-looking gun from behind his back and fired in Peter's direction. Instantly, a powerful sonic blast shot toward his chest. Acting quickly, Peter leaped into the air, dodging the blast as he spun forward and kicked his attacker across the side of his head, sending the man tumbling down the sandy hill. Picking up the vibranium gun, Peter looked it over in interest before tossing it through a portal for later study. Seated in the Wakandan throne room once again, Peter waited for the king to arrive. Tied up at his feet, Ulysses Klaus slept peacefully with a big bruise on his head and sand all over his clothes. Only seconds later, marching footsteps were heard as the doors burst open, revealing the king with many Dora Milaje warriors at his back. Hello again, King Chaka, Peter says with a wave. The king didn't know how to reply as he froze at the sight of his most hated enemy, unconscious and bound in web in the middle of his throne room. Okoye, take the prisoner to his cell, King Chaka orders. Okoye, the general of the Dora Milaje, which is tasked to guard the royal family, also known as the Golden Tribe. A familiar bald woman stepped forward and motioned to Klau. Instantly, two of the Dora Milaje grab Ulysses from under his arms and drag him out of the throne room. You should have them search his body, Peter comments, stopping Okoye who was about to leave the room. I wouldn't be surprised if he has some gadgets and trackers on or in his person, which he will no doubt try to use to escape. We will be thorough in the prisoner's detainment. Okoye says as she follows after her subordinates, leaving the king with the rest of her trusted warriors. Well, that completes our deal, Peter says as he turns back to the king. Yes, but might I ask how much sacred metal was in his possession? The king asks, hoping to know how much Klaus sold off, as he could still recover some of their sacred metal. I can weigh it and let you know, Peter says as he didn't have an exact number. What's your phone number? While Peter was putting the king of Wakanda's cell phone number into his phone, rapid footsteps pitter pattered towards the throne room. You're back. Shuri rushed past her father and his guards. Before Peter could reply, Shuri jumped into him like a missile. Whoa! Peter uttered as he caught the little princess and set her back down on her feet. Can I show you my Spider-Man collection now? You promised. Shuri looked up at Peter with the hopeful eyes of a child. I can't exactly say no, can I? 
Peter thought as he could see the amused look on her father's face. While Peter was being dragged around the palace by Shuri, who was constantly followed by guards from the Dora Milaje, a meeting was called between the tribal council of Wakanda. The border tribe, river tribe, mining tribe, and merchant tribe leaders all swiftly arrived due to the Golden Tribe summons. As for the Jabari tribe, they removed themselves from mainstream society long ago, and wouldn't be attending any meetings, no matter who called them. It's been a while since anyone has called an unscheduled meeting, one of the tribe leaders comments as they look toward the king. Why have you summoned us, your majesty? Is this about Ulysses Clow? Another tribal leader asks. I heard he was captured. Every other tribal leader turns to Chaka, awaiting his answer. That is true, though we have Spider-Man to thank for his capture. Chaka reveals, surprising every member of the tribal council. All of you were summoned for a different reason. I was offered a position in the Avengers Council. Although they all preferred isolation, each one of them knew about the outside world to a certain extent, and all of them knew about the Avengers. Especially since their children are all obsessed with Spider-Man and a few other members of the superhero group. Why? A female tribal leader asks. You are not the Black Panther anymore? After explaining everything that Peter said earlier in the day, as well as the deal he agreed to for the capture of Ulysses Clow, Chaka watched the faces of the tribal council go through an array of emotions. On one hand, one of their most hated enemies was now in custody, but on the other hand, it cost them a good amount of vibranium in return. Though the border tribe leader didn't seem all that perturbed by it, as it was his people who were killed by the bombs that Klaus set off during his escape all those years ago. Losing some vibranium was nothing if it meant that justice could be served. But that wasn't all. Chaka also recounted Peter's words about their isolation and the fact that only one of his council members could easily subdue their entire country. I say you decline and throw him out of Wakanda. One of the more proud tribal leaders says angrily. Why? He might be right? The border tribe leader argues. Instantly, the throne room was thrown into chaos as each elder had their opinion, which disagreed with another elder's opinion. Meanwhile, Chaka sat back on his throne with a resigned look on his face. He wanted to use their input as a driving force to make his decision to either join the Avengers Council or not. Sadly, he only seemed to make matters worse. Wow, this is amazing. Peter commented as Shuri showed him her most prized collectible. A solid vibranium figurine of him swinging through New York City. Wakanda likes to pretend that they barely have any vibranium, meanwhile they have enough to waste on a child's toy. Peter thought as Shuri smiled pridefully at her most prized possession. Once Shuri finished showing everything off and asked Peter every question that she could think of, it was finally time for him to leave. After all, he had some materials to deliver. Do you have to leave? Shuri asked as she gave Peter her best sad puppy dog eyes. I'm afraid so, Peter said as he pat her on the head in sympathy. But when I come back next time, maybe I'll bring my daughter. She could use a friend to play with after all. Before Shuri could reply, Peter opened up a portal and stepped through. See you next time, princess. He waved as the portal closed. Spider-Man has a daughter? Arriving back at home, Peter found his pile of vibranium exactly where he left it, though his Aunt May was ready and waiting nearby with a lecture to end all lectures. You can't just portal random junk into the living room. How could you be so thoughtless? Get this metal out of here. I missed the best part. May let out all of her pent-up frustration. She really wanted to see that kiss. Once she was done with her outburst, Peter moved all of the vibranium to his room and calculated the weight as promised. After weighing a single brick and counting the rest, Peter found out that he has exactly 727 pounds of vibranium, which meant that Klaus sold exactly 273 pounds of vibranium. Of course, his calculation included the gun as well. He must have made tons of money. Peter thought as he wondered what Klaus wanted all of that money for in the first place. After sending a quick text to King Chaka, as he wanted to know this information, Peter grabbed two bars of vibranium and opened a portal to Nidaveller. Stepping through the portal, Peter was immediately crowded by excited dwarves who wanted nothing more than to trade their most prized possessions for the tiniest bit of vibranium. Of course, their enthusiasm magnified tenfold as soon as they saw the metal bricks in his hands. I'll give you anything. How about I give you my daughter? She needs a husband anyway. I'm willing to forge anything you desire. As Peter listened to their pleas, he suddenly had a good idea. That's enough. King Itri came storming over and shooed his subjects away. Back to work. Actually, wait a second. Peter says as he opens a portal and pulls out a blueprint of a human skeletal system. I may have a job for all of you. Tossing the blueprint to the group of dwarves, Peter watched as they huddled together and looked over the design. You want us to make some bones? One of the dwarves asks as King Itri looms over them, checking out the blueprint as well. Yes, and I'll pay in vibranium for your finest work? Peter says as he tosses over the two bricks in his possession. One for the alloy mixture you'll be using and the other as payment. As the two bricks flew toward the dwarven group, Peter watched as they all jumped and fought over the bricks. That's enough. King Itri shouts as he lifts two of the dwarves up and takes possession of the vibranium in their grasp. No fighting until the order is complete. You can decide who gets what once the job is done. As he finished lecturing his subjects, King Itri handed the two bricks over to an older-looking dwarf, who lead the group away to start their work. 
I hope you have more of that vibranium? King Itri asks as Peter opens a portal and pulls out two more identical bricks. Good, one of those should be enough for the materials and payment? Peter tossed the giant of a man both bricks. Keep the extra brick as an incentive to work hard. Peter says as King Itri caught the vibranium with a smile. I don't know what the hell I'm making, but it will be my best work yet. Don't you worry. Originally, Peter planned to make Lily's body all by himself, though having bones that were forged in the heart of a neutron star just sounded too good to pass up. Especially when the dwarves were so willing to do anything. Now I just need to figure out the rest of her body. Peter muttered thoughtfully as he lay on his bed. Peter's plans for his daughter's body were far more than just your average robot. In fact, the only metal portion of her body would be her bones and possibly her brain, or at least that is the current plan. The rest of it from her organs, blood, nerves, skin and everything else would be made from human tissue. Preferably a mixture of his and MJ's genetics, which Peter would grow in a lab, making Lily their real daughter. The only problem with this was the fact that Peter had no idea how he would grow organs and other body parts in a lab. He knew it was possible, but getting it done was an entirely different story. Even after all of the fleshy parts of Lily were made, Peter would still have a hard time putting everything together, as he would be literally creating life from nothing. I need to buy some books on genetics and cloning. Peter thought as he ordered some books on his phone before going to sleep with a pile of vibranium in the corner of his room. Seeing as Peter had at least a few months before the convergence would take place, he decided to use that time to figure out Lily's body situation. After reading up on the science behind the subject, Peter had a restricted lab cordoned off in the tower and started playing around with his newfound knowledge. Currently, nobody working in this field has been able to grow a functional organ from scratch. However, there has been great success in growing mini-organs from pluripotent stem cells of course, Peter hacked all of the experimental data from those who have been working on this for years and studied it thoroughly. Where the hell do I get stem cells from? Peter wondered. Though he soon found out that with Tony's money and connections, placing an order for a batch of stem cells was as easy as calling for a pizza delivery. Within a week of work, Peter was able to make miniature organs with ease, putting his work at the same level as scientific leaders in this field. Now I just need to figure out how to make them a normal size. Peter thought as he stared at a small human heart, which pumped blood with the help of a machine. Time skip, three months while Peter was working on creating Lily's real body. Ned finally got to a point where he could go out into the field. After months of constant training in martial arts, parkour, gun control, and a plethora of other useful skills, Peter called Ned over to his house and gave him a wrapped present. What is it? Ned asked as he shook the box and put it against his ear. Open it and you'll see, Peter says with a smile. With the enthusiasm of a child, Ned tore the wrapping paper off and opened the box, finding some black clothing inside. Hot, Ned grunted in surprise as the clothes disappeared with a touch of his hand. What the, no, yes, Peter says with an amused look on his face. Is this what I think it is? Ned asked as his clothes swapped with a black superhero suit. The suit looked almost exactly like Batman's suit, except for a few slight alterations. There is no cape, bat symbols, or pointed ears on his head. The mask also covers his entire face, leaving no openings for his eyes or mouth. Waving his hand, Peter conjured a long mirror directly in front of Ned, who jumped in fright at his own reflection. Exclamation point. Ned stared at the mirror in shock. Is that, me? Yeah, do you like it? Peter asks. Ned looks back and forth between the mirror and his very generous friend. I love it. Good. Peter says, happy that his work was worth the effort. Why don't you check out your belt? Ha! Ned grunted as he looked down to see a utility belt around his waist. Did you copy Batman? Sort of. Peter says as Ned starts playing with his belt, finding the pouches to be much larger on the inside. Ned froze in shock as a quarter of his arm fit into one of the tiny pouches before reaching the bottom. Cool. I thought you'd like that. Peter says with a smirk. Batman-style gadgets not included though. I thought you'd like to make them yourself. Maybe some smoke capsules for a quick retreat, or whatever you want. Hee <laughs> hee. Ned laughed like a maniac. I have so many ideas. Just don't make anything too dangerous, please. Peter couldn't help but worry. After showing Ned almost everything about his suit, including all of the functions that his and MJ's suits have, Peter drew Ned's attention to his boots. So, you know how MJ and I can pretty much swing away from every problem? Peter says and receives a nod from his friend. Well, you don't exactly have the same luxury as us, so I decided to add something special to your suit. Waving his hand, Peter opened a portal and gestured for Ned to follow him through. Ah, uh, why are we here? Ned asks as they appeared in an empty field in the middle of nowhere. Because I don't need you destroying my house, Peter answers with a shrug. Now, I want you to jump while thinking of the word boost. Just remember to land on your dash before Peter could finish his explanation, Ned jumped and soared up into the air at a rapid pace. Ah, Ned screamed as he reached a whopping 30 meters before losing momentum. Flailing around like an idiot, Ned came crashing down and hit the floor back first with a loud thud. Feet. Peter finished his sentence with a sigh. Ouch. Ned said as he picked himself up after a moment of rest. Thankfully, he is enhanced enough to make a fall from that height mean nothing. 
As you probably guessed already, I enchanted your boots to boost your jumps on command. They also reduce the impact of falling from high heights, so just land on your feet next time, or else it's going to hurt again. Peter explains fully. Ned doesn't reply as he jumps and launches off the ground. Luckily, he landed on his feet this time. Cool. Ned commented as the boots reduced the impact of landing to almost nothing. Thanks. Peter took his words as a compliment to his work. Once you get used to using it, you can control the height of the jump as well as the impact of your landing. After letting Ned practice with his new boots, Peter donned his own suit and opened a portal to the top of a tall building in Times Square. Are we? Ned utters as he looks at Peter expectantly. Yup, why do you think I gave you the suit? Peter says as Ned started vibrating with excitement. You're ready now. Finally. Ned exclaimed loudly. If you tap your right ear, the police radio will turn on, Peter says as they start looking for crimes to stop together. Of course, Ned may be ready, but Peter would still rather chaperone his first few days as a superhero. After all, anything could go wrong. After running all over the city multiple times, Ned sat dejectedly at the top of a building alongside Peter, who felt bad for his friend. Sometimes there's just no crime, Peter says as he placed a comforting hand on Ned's shoulder. For the past few hours, Ned has done nothing but small acts of kindness, like walking old ladies across crowded streets and saving cats from trees, which he felt good about. Though, he was expecting something a bit more exciting for his first day. You made this city too safe? Ned complained as he looked down at the peaceful city below. That's not exactly a bad thing. Peter laughs as an idea came to mind. Why don't we try another city? London. Jane Foster was looking over a menu in a restaurant, when a handsome man unceremoniously sat across from her. Hi. He greets her a little flirtatiously. Can I help you? Jane asks in confusion. You looked lonely, so I thought we could eat together. He says, without a care for what she wants. So, what's the story with you? Get out of here, slimeball. Jane's trusty assistant, Darcy, appeared and shooed the pushy man away. She's already taken. Oh, the man seemed to come to a realization. I'm sorry, I didn't know you were. Yes, I'm in already in a relation dash Jane says, though she was cut off. A lesbian? He says as he looks between Darcy and Jane. Yeah, so stay away from my woman? Darcy says as she sends Jane a teasing smirk. When the man finally left, Darcy took his seat, ignoring the glare from her boss as she starts stuffing her face with free bread. Thanks for the help, but why are you here? Jane asks. Right. You know that scientific equipment thingy in the corner of your bedroom? You might want to start looking at it now. Darcy says as she pulls out a small radio-sized gadget, which was going haywire. It's malfunctioning. Jane sighed in annoyance. That's what I said. Darcy nodded as Jane gave her the gadget back. You can go now. Jane says, as she wanted to eat without any of Darcy's craziness. I'm sure it's nothing. Jane thought as Darcy grabbed a handful of bread and walked off. I'm sure it's nothing. I'm sure it's nothing. I'm sure it's nothing. I'm sure it's nothing. Jane repeated over and over before jumping out of her seat and running after Darcy, whose retreating figure was still in sight. I am not getting stabbed in the name of science. Darcy comments as she follows Jane into an abandoned factory. Ever since Jane caught up with her, they've been following that haywire gadget of hers, which has dragged them all across London. As they made their way through the factory, a group of children came running in from the opposite side. It's okay, we're Americans. Darcy yelled as she saw the scared looks on the kids' faces. Is that supposed to make them like us? Jane asks with a roll of her eyes. Maybe they can make it go away. The only girl in the group whispers. SSH. The leading child shushed her. Are you the police? Another kid asks. No, we're scientists. Well, I am. Jane says as Darcy huffs. Why? We just found it. The leading kid says nervously. Found what? Jane asks curiously. Can you show us? Nodding their heads, the kids lead Jane and Darcy to a truck outside of the factory. One of the boys touched the truck, pushes it up with two fingers, and they all watch in amazement as the truck floats in mid-air. That doesn't look rigged. Darcy comments as she eyed the levitating truck for any hidden wires. After studying the truck for some time, the kids then took them to a stairwell in the factory, where one of them threw a bottle. As the bottle flew down the stairs, they all watch as it disappeared into thin air. Where did it go? Darcy asks in shock. Answering her question, the little girl pointed upward. Following her gesture, they look up to see the same bottle reappear above them and continuously fall and disappear in the same spots in the air over and over. That's, that's incredible. Jane commented as she picked up an empty can and drops it down from the same spot. Just like before, the tin can disappeared into thin air, but when she looked up to watch it reappear, nothing happened. Why didn't it work? Darcy asked in confusion. Sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't. One of the kids says with a shrug. I want to throw something. Darcy's eyes wander for a nearby object. Jane, give me your shoe. Ignoring her assistant's idiocy, Jane picks up her gadget and starts looking over the readings. I haven't seen readings like this since. She mutters. Your last visit with that muscly boyfriend of yours? Darcy says with a teasing tilt to her voice. Don't touch anything. Jane orders as she rushes off to study the nearby area. 
While she got busy and Darcy played with the portal alongside the children, none of them noticed the CCTV cameras that followed their every move. Did you see the look on that guy's face when we caught him sneaking off with that old lady's TV? Ned laughed as he and Peter split a pizza in Central Park. After spending a good portion of the day fighting crime in other cities, where Ned finally got the superhero debut that he was looking for, the two returned to New York to celebrate Ned's big day. Of course, they were dressed normally now, as they didn't want anyone to interrupt their celebration. Yeah, his eyes practically popped out of his head, like some cartoon character. Peter smirked as he grabbed another slice of pizza. I should visit other cities more often. They're always so surprised to see me. Today was amazing? Ned comments as he leans back with a content smile on his face. I'm glad it was worth the wait, Peter says as he remembered something important. Oh, yeah. Have you come up with a superhero name yet? How did I forget that? Ned shouts as he shoots off of the bench and starts pacing back and forth. How about blackout? Peter offers his hundredth idea for Ned's name. Because your suit is all black. Eh. Ned grunts, unconvinced by every single name that Peter has offered up thus far. Suddenly, their brainstorming session was interrupted as Jarvis' voice echoed from Peter's phone. Sir, you asked me to notify you should any anomalies appear in Dr. Foster's surroundings, Jarvis informs. What does that mean? Ned asks as Peter whips out his phone from his pocket. Nothing. Peter says as he rushes off. I gotta go. Text me any new superhero names you come up with. Leaving the group, Jane follows the readings on her gadget, which takes her to another part of the factory. As the readings get stronger and stronger, a gust of wind pushed her forward and Jane found herself teleported into another realm. Darcy. She calls out in fright. Her new surroundings appeared to be dark stone ruins, which littered the ground, like the remains of some lost civilization. Hot, a familiar voice sounded behind her, causing Jane to jump and whip her head around. You really know how to find trouble, Dr. Foster. S. Spider-Man. Jane stuttered in realization as her nerves start to calm down. After all, who better to show up in her time of need than the guy who can open a portal to literally anywhere? Well, she may have found Thor's company more appealing, though that would be for an entirely different reason. You should really be more careful, Peter says as he looks over the dark space. As the possible future queen of Asgard, your safety is pretty important. I'm actually quite surprised that Thor hasn't sent guards to follow you around yet. He tried, but I refused. Jane says as she completely ignored the queen of Asgard's comment. I don't need men in golden armor following my every move. I have a feeling that he won't take no for an answer after hearing about this. Peter muttered as he opened a portal, leading back to Darcy and the kids. Go, I'm going to investigate this place. Wait, this is my discovery. Jane tried to argue, but Peter wasn't having it. Without wasting words, Peter waved his hand. Instantly, the portal swiped to the side and engulfed Jane before snapping shut, leaving Peter as the only person in the dark ruins. I'm sure she'll be pissed at me later. Peter muttered to himself as he started to explore the area. Looking around for a minute, Peter found the column holding the ether. It was a large stone pillar that was separated from the middle as if the top portion was floating, leaving a few inches of a gap between the top and bottom. Not only that, but an ominous red glow emanated from the thin gap. Well, here goes nothing. Peter muttered as he walked up and peeked inside. Inside, Peter could see an ominous sludge moving around, as if it had a mind of its own. This may not be a smart idea, but whatever. Peter commented as he reached his hand inside. Suddenly, the red sludge shot toward him, wrapped around his hand, and entered his body in a matter of seconds. Of course, Peter felt all of this with his spider senses but chose to do nothing about it, becoming the host of the ether. At least, he wouldn't do anything about it for the time being. After all, he should be able to remove it with a bit of the mystic arts, and even if he can't, the Ancient One could definitely do it for him. Hopefully, I don't regret this. Peter thought as he felt lightheaded all of a sudden. Somewhere in space, a large dark elf warship floated along, looking like a stranded shipwreck, as not a single bit of power was being used. It merely drifted through space, like a slow asteroid. Though that would soon change. Inside the ship, hibernation pods filled with pale-skinned and sharp-eared dark elves started opening one by one. The first to open was a pod away from the others, containing a man with distinguished and regal features for a dark elf. Insert picture of Malkith here, the king of the dark elves, Malkith awakened, and with his awakening, the whole ship powered back on. Rows and rows of lights brightened, illuminating countless pods filled with his loyal soldiers, who were ready to fight for the cause once again. The ether awakens us, Malkith mutters as he instinctively felt the exact location of the reality stone. The convergence returns. Feeling an overwhelming sense of lightheadedness, Peter hastily opened a portal and fell through, leaving the dark ruins behind. We both know that Peter is hiding something in his penthouse. The only question is what could it be? Tony sat alone in his workshop and spoke to his computer. As I've said before, sir, I have no access to that penthouse, nor can I acquire access, Jarvis answers, as he was already tasked to get some answers for his creator long ago and failed horribly. It's as if the whole room is a black hole, stopping any scans, signals, images, and even sounds from entering or escaping. It could be a sex dungeon? 
Tony thinks out loud, but soon shakes his head negatively. Nah, Peter isn't that kind of guy. Suddenly, as Tony was thinking up all sorts of crazy theories for his friend's secrecy, a golden portal opened over his Bugatti, which for some odd reason was parked inside more than 100 floors higher than street level. Out of the portal, a familiar man in a blue and red spider-themed suit falls out, heading straight for the very expensive supercar. Crash, landing in the center of the roof, the impact of Peter's body broke all the windows and dented the car considerably. A slash in, in a Romanian prison cell, a single tear rolls down the top G's cheek, Peter. Tony exclaims as he jumps out of his chair and rushes to Peter's side. Hey, sorry about the car, Peter says as his vision starts to get hazy. What happened? Are you hurt? Tony didn't care about his car. He could buy a hundred Bugattis to replace this one, and it wouldn't even put the smallest dent in his bank account. I'm fine, Peter says, as he didn't expect to sleep for long. Well, he wasn't sure if he would sleep at all in the beginning. In the movie, when Jane absorbed the ether she immediately lost consciousness, but he wasn't sure how he would react. After all, Jane is a normal human and Peter as well. Spider-Man. Here take this. Peter sluggishly reached into his pocket, pulls out a sealed letter, and hands it over to Tony. That will explain, good night? Instantly, Peter lost consciousness atop the wrecked Bugatti, as if it were a cloudy mattress. Acting quickly, Tony lifted Peter's body off of the deformed car and rushed over to an open table. Jarvis, run scans. Tony ordered as he gently placed Peter on the table. Yes, sir. Jarvis answers dutifully as a blue light shoots down from the ceiling and envelopes Peter's unconscious body. While Jarvis was doing his work, Tony opened the letter and found a note with his name on it alongside another sealed letter. Of course, Tony read the note before opening the second letter. Tony, if you have this letter, something which I won't be talking about has knocked me out as I suspected it would. I should wake up soon enough, but if I'm not awake within 12 hours, then please take the second letter to, 177A Bleecker Street in Greenwich Village. Ask for the ancient one. Hugs and kisses, Peter, love P.S., if any elves come knocking, keep them away from my body. Elves? Tony laughed for a moment. What is this? The Lord of the Rings. Scan complete. Jarvis calls out as the light disappeared from Peter's sleeping body. Unknown energy found. Unknown energy? Show me. Tony asks as he walks over to a nearby table, where a hologram of Peter's body appears, showing a sort of liquid moving through his bloodstream. Is that what he won't talk about? After studying the liquid energy, which coursed through his best friend's veins like blood, Tony didn't find anything that would help explain what the energy was exactly. It's not hurting him. Tony muttered as he looked down at the second letter. Maybe I should read it? Just to be safe. As if the devil himself whispered into his ear, Tony managed to convince himself that reading the second letter was best for Peter's well-being. Though, the real reason was much simpler. Tony is a nosy bastard without an ounce of self-control. Ripping the letter open, Tony was greeted by another note alongside a third letter. Nosy bitch, stop being a prick. Love, Peter. Tony froze as he wondered if Peter could see into the future. There's no way he did it to the third letter too. Out of pure spite for his friend's words, Tony opened the third letter and once again found a mean-spirited note with his name on it alongside another sealed letter. This game continued another ten times before Tony realized that magic was involved. Smart little shit. Tony cursed as he set a timer for 12 hours and turned the tower's defenses up to maximum. What did he mean by elves? In a large hall, Melkith sat regally atop a dark throne, looking down at the newly awakened dark elf soldiers, who have slept for 5,000 years. Your Majesty, every soldier has safely woken from stasis without issue, and all ships are fully operational. An elf grunt reported as an image of 15 ships appeared before the king. Insert picture of dark elf harrow ships here. Good, how close are we to Asgard? Melkith asks as he and every Dark Elves blood begins to boil at the mere name of their most hated enemy. Half a day's flight, sir. The kneeling elf answers instantly, ready to go to war once again. <laughs> Melkith hummed as he contemplated whether to strike the Asgardians early, as a swift surprise attack could deal a fatal blow to their enemy. If they were to try and wait until the ether was in their hands again, the time for a surprise attack could disappear forever, leaving them with a much harder war to fight. Especially since Asgard has had 5,000 years to recover from the old war and build their army up to an even higher standard than before. Meanwhile, all Melkith has is a small fraction of his old army. Even Svartalfame, the home world of the Dark Elves, was nothing but an empty planet, so they couldn't even recruit more soldiers. Although they were still fairly powerful, the unknown threat of a much more deadly enemy lingered in the back of Melkith's mind. Though, if he knew how soft Asgard has become since Odin's daughter was imprisoned, Melkith wouldn't be so worried. Especially since Odin was still in hibernation, peacefully napping the months away. Which way is Asgard? Melkith asks, and a huge hologram appears, showing a map of the universe. This way sir. An elf says, as a red line appears, showing the direction. Seeing the trajectory they would take, a wide smile bloomed on the king's face. Not only was Asgard only hours away, but it was also on the way to the ether. Melkith could feel it clearly. 
killing two birds with one stone, they could launch a surprise attack on Asgard, retreat when the time was right, and then rush to the Aether, which would give his small army a much better chance of destroying the Asgardians. Though, other than reducing the enemy's numbers, the attack could also be used for intelligence gathering. After all, they knew nothing about the Asgard of this day and age. Set course for Asgard and initiate camouflage when we're within range, Asgard. The golden bifrost fires as Thor and Jane appear on the rainbow bridge. Welcome back. Heimdall greets the couple as he pulls his sword from the pedestal, deactivating the bifrost. We were worried about you, Lady Jane. Yes, apparently you've been spying on me. Jane says unhappily as she glared between Thor and Heimdall. The second Jane was pulled into the separate dimension with the ether, Heimdall lost sight of her and alerted his king, who immediately rushed to Midgard to find her. Luckily, Peter sent her back unharmed. I said I was sorry, Thor says awkwardly. Yet you won't stop, will you? Jane asks with a pointed stare. I will do as my king orders, Heimdall answers dutifully. And I will not leave you completely unprotected? Thor argues, hoping that she would understand his side of things. Look at what happened today, for example. If the spider wasn't there to save you, then you may have been lost to me for eternity. Your safety is of the utmost importance, Jane. Jane huffs and storms off across the rainbow bridge towards Asgard. Why does she not understand the dangers? Thor asks with a tired sigh. Women are an enigma, my liege. As the hours ticked by, Peter didn't awaken, nor did he move very much either, though all of his vital signs were normal. Well, about as normal as an enhanced human with superpowers could be. Staying up the entire time, Tony paced back and forth in front of Peter's sleeping form, always vigilant for any sudden complications or elven assaults on the tower. Though, he wondered what that would look like? When Peter slept for a whole ten hours without waking, Tony tried shaking him, smelling salts, electricity, and a few other ways to jolt him back to consciousness. Sadly, they all failed without eliciting a single twitch from Peter, who even slept while Tony dumped an entire glass of water over his face. This may be worse than I thought. Tony muttered as he cleaned Peter up and put his mask back on. Jarvis, call for a council meeting. Message is sent, sir. An hour later, the Avengers Council was convened, minus one very important member, of course. What's this about, Stark? Fury asks as he and the other members look to Tony for an answer. Well, Tony took a deep breath and explained everything from Peter's sudden appearance in his workshop, coma, letter, elves, and the odd energy coursing through his veins. How long has it been? Eric asks. A little over eleven hours? Tony answers as he grasps the letter in his hand. And you can't wake him up? Charles asks. I tried everything that I could think of, Tony says with a shake of his head. I say we stop waiting and simply take him to the address, Fury says, as he wanted to learn more about Spider-Man. For all we know, waiting could make matters worse. After arguing for a few minutes, everyone soon agreed to just take Peter to the address specified in the note. With the threat of some sort of elvish attack, the council decided that it was pertinent that every member went along. Though the real reason for this was simply curiosity. After all, the Avengers Council is mostly made up of nosy old men. Loading Peter into a blacked-out SUV, all five council members hopped in and took off toward Greenwich Village, which was close by. As Charles drove, Eric and Fury looked curiously at Peter's sleeping form, both wondering whether they should pull up his mask. After all, Spider-Man's true identity was a very large secret, which only those extremely close to him were allowed in on. As Eric reached out to take a peek, a hand softly moved and tightly grabbed his wrist. Keep your hands to yourself, Tony says as a dangerous glint shines in his eyes. Easy for you to say? Magneto scoffed as he pulled his hand free and turned to look out of the window. You already know. Yeah, and I didn't learn his identity through breaking his trust? Tony says pointedly. Want to know? Then show him that he can trust you. The rest of the car ride remained silent, as everyone thought over Tony's words. They may spend a lot of time together, as co-workers, but none of them were fairly close to Peter, besides Tony of course. They were typical work friends. Is this it? Charles asks as he parks on the side of the road. 177A. Bleecker Street. Tony reads the number on the door as well as the nearby road sign. Looks right to me. Unloading Peter from his seat, Tony carries him princess style, as he didn't trust the others after Eric's actions in the car. Knock knock, climbing the stairs, Fury tapped the door with his knuckles. No one came to answer. Should we dash Charles speaks but didn't finish as Magneto stared at the metal handle of the door, as if he were constipated. Need the bathroom, old man? Tony asks jokingly. I'm trying to open the door. Eric says in a strained voice. Giving up on the metal handle, Magneto angrily lifted his leg and kicked the center of the door, hoping to break it open with his super soldier strength. As his foot made contact with the door, a blue light lit up around the wood, and Eric was launched backward onto the sidewalk. Huh, that's, interesting. Tony comments as Magneto picks himself up, mentally lifting the nearby mailbox with him. Without a word, the metal mailbox shot like a bullet toward the door at amazing speed, but just as it was about to make contact, the door opened. Huh? A man grunted as a figure ducked, dodging the big public mailbox as it soared into the building and crashed into the stairs behind him. 
What was that for? Turning to the door, the Avengers Council found an Asian man in an orange monk robe standing in the doorframe, looking pissed off. Insert picture of Wong here, wait, is that? Wong asks as he saw Peter sleeping in Tony's arms. Spider-Man. Although few of the more trustworthy high-level members of Kamartage know about Peter's real identity, most of them only know Spider-Man as the Ancient One student. Wong being one of those people. Yes, he said to ask for the Ancient One, Tony barges in, as they were starting to draw a crowd of fans outside. Right? Wong says as he waves the others inside and closes the door, leaving the onlookers locked outside. Wait here and don't touch anything. Leaving that warning behind, Wong opens a portal and steps through, leaving the Avengers behind in shock. After all, for many of them, the idea of opening a portal like that was impossible for anyone besides Spider-Man you knew about this. Fury questions Tony as he saw the calm look on his face. Well, he told me a little, Tony says as he motions toward Peter. Did he tell you what this place is? Eric asks as he tried to use his powers on some nearby metal trinkets without any luck. This place is the Sanctum Sanctorum. A new voice says as a bald woman in golden robes appears at the top of the nearby staircase. Looking down at Peter, who slept soundly in Tony's arms, the Ancient One instantly felt the power of the ether emanating from his body. I see that my student has been up to trouble again, she strolls down the stairs and stops in front of Tony. It's good to see you again, Mr. Stark? Ah, uh, you as well ah, uh, ma'am. Tony spoke like an idiot, as he didn't know what to say to the mystical Ancient One. After all, many of the books that Peter gave him to study were written by her, and a few of them were thousands of years old. Of course, this odd behavior from Tony only made the others more curious about who this person was. Tony was never this respectful to anyone. The Tony Stark that they knew would rather swallow a flaming sword than treat anyone with as much respect as he just showed this bald woman. Now, what to do with you? The Ancient One mutters as her eyes land on Peter, ignoring the rest of the room. I should have known he would take Dr. Foster's place. With the smallest gesture, Peter was torn from Tony's grasp and floated in front of the Ancient One, who studied his body in silence. Let's wake you up. Winding back her palm, the Ancient One smirked evilly as she eyed her sleeping student. This may hurt, a lot. Asgard, it's good to see you again, Jane. Frigga says with a smile as Jane storms into the palace alone. Why are men so infuriating? Jane practically shouts. Your son has Heimdall watching my every move. Do you know how creepy that is? What about my privacy? What if I'm on the toilet? Well, Odin is very much the same, so he must get it from his father. Frigga says with a sympathetic look. I remember when Odin was courting me all those years ago. The same day we met, I had a contingent of Einarjar guards following my every move. I had to use a spell to keep them out of my bedroom. Ah, but I don't have magic. Jane mutters as the doors behind her swing open, revealing Fandral and Valstag, who escorted several prisoners, including a masked man with pale skin and pointed ears hidden under a hood. Queen Mother. The two of them shout respectfully, as they didn't expect to see Frigga. The masked prisoner's eyes narrowed as he glared at Frigga, grasping his fists tightly. Flashback. The King of the Dark Elves stood over the bleeding stomach of one of his most trusted and loyal subordinates. You will become darkness, doomed to this existence until it consumes you, Malekith states, as one of his dark elves placed a molten rock in his hand, which he stuffs inside the elf's open stomach. And then no power of our enemies will stop me, I'll destroy their defenses and resurrect the universe, the bleeding dark elf says reverently as Malekith places a familiar mask on his face. Flashback and, this may hurt, a lot, the ancient one said as her palm glowed in a golden light and jutted out, impacting Peter directly on the forehead. Arg. Peter grunted as his eyes snapped open, and his body flew across the room, crashing through a wall. Damn. Tony muttered in sympathy as Peter picked himself up and staggered out of the human-shaped hole in the wall. What the hell was that for? Peter asked as he felt a bit wobbly on his feet. To wake you up of course, the Ancient One says with a smirk on her face. You could have done it without hitting me, Peter says, knowing that she was using this as a way to take out her frustrations on him. After all, he was now in possession of three Infinity Stones, which further ruins all of her plans. Though, the Ancient One's plans have been turned upside down for a long time now. The question was whether she would jump on the Peter train, or continue to stew in annoyance at his plans. I would never purposefully hurt my disciple. It hurts my feelings that you would even insinuate that. The Ancient One says as she wipes a non-existent tear from her cheek. Oh, shut up. Peter says in annoyance, though, something odd happened. A piece of sticky duct tape appeared over the Ancient One's lips, sealing them shut in an instant. Question mark. Peter watched in shock as he felt a sudden power drain in his body, though it wasn't anything significant. Holy shit. The Reality Stone, which Peter has essentially merged with, allows the user to alter reality in effectively any way they see fit. This includes changing reality in ways that would normally be impossible. The laws of physics basically no longer apply when the Reality Stone is concerned. If Peter wants 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 to be the new law of math, then he can make that happen. The Reality Stone, perhaps more than any other Infinity Stone, is much more limited by the imagination of the user than anything else though.
The Ancient One sighed as she ripped the duct tape off, which crumbled into dust between her fingers. Great, now I have to deal with this. Wait, did you make it disappear? Peter asks out of curiosity. N the Ancient One shook her head, refusing to help him any further than that. Is it not permanent? Peter thought out loud. The one real limitation that the reality stone has is that the changes it makes to reality are generally not permanent without the power stone to use as a sort of fuel. This explained why he felt a small loss of energy from the ether after creating the tape. Peter only had so much power to work with. Suddenly, Peter remembered when the Guardians of the Galaxy attempted to attack Thanos on Nowhere, and he turned Drax into cubes, and Mantis into a spring. Luckily for them, they revert back to normal after the Mad Titan left, since he didn't use the power stone in conjunction with it, which would have made their new changes permanent. That makes sense, Peter muttered as the rest of the Avengers stared at the teacher and student in confusion. It's good that I already have the power stone, though I'm still not messing with that thing without a conduit. Infinite power in your bare hands is an explosion waiting to happen. Can either of you give me some context? I have no idea what you're talking about, Tony asks, drawing Peter's attention to him and the others. Huh? Why is everyone here? Peter asks as he turns to Tony with a questioning look. I don't remember writing anything about inviting the council along. Hey, I was. Tony says as he held up the letter and realized something. He didn't give it to the Ancient One. Seeing the sealed letter in his hand, Peter couldn't help but sigh. You didn't even give her the letter, did you? Peter asks with a sigh. Well, we didn't really need it, and she kind of just smacked you awake after saying hello. Tony says with a shrug as he glares at Peter. Why aren't I getting any thanks? I watched over you for hours, waiting for house elves to attack at any moment. They're dark elves. Peter corrects as Tony gives him a pointed glare. And thanks, I guess. No problem. Tony says as he tosses Peter the sealed letter. Well, I guess this was a waste of time, Peter says as he tosses the letter into a portal. So, no elves or spaceships have shown up, right? No, it's actually been boring. Tony says as Fury steps forward. What's this about elves? Fury asks as he needed to prepare if another invasion would be happening. They're an alien race, which should be coming to Earth as we speak, unless. Peter says as he remembered their hatred for Asgard, the people that destroyed them 5,000 years ago. Maybe they stopped somewhere else first? Where? Charles asks. How do you guys feel about visiting Loki's brother, Thor? Asgard. Shortly after being imprisoned in his cell, Algrim, the loyal dark elf, dug his hand into his stomach and pulled out a bloody stone. The same stone that Melkith gave him only hours ago. Crushing it in his fist, the stone melted into lava and was absorbed into Algrim's entire body, merging his clothes and helmet into his skin, and turning him into a giant beast. Insert picture of Kerr slash Algrim here, the other prisoners in his cell began banging on the cell's walls and calling upon the Einherjar for help, horrified by the sight. Sadly, before they could make much noise, the new beast unleashed an explosion within the cell which killed everyone inside. The impact of the explosion easily broke the cell open, releasing the new hideous dark elf, though he didn't stop there. One by one, Algrim quickly broke open every cell in the entire prison, releasing all sorts of dangerous and deadly criminals. In order to cover his movements, a distraction was in order, and these people would do just fine. With their release, it didn't take long for chaos to ensue, as a war for freedom broke out between the guards and their former prisoners. And in the shadows of this war, a grotesque dark elf snuck out of the prison in search of Asgard's shield generator. Soon enough, loud alarms filled the palace as guards rushed to the prison to quell the sudden prison break. What's that? Jane asks as she heard the alarms. The prison? Frigga mutters as Thor comes running into the room. Mother, have you seen Jane? Thor sighed as he found who he was looking for. Good, you're here. Go, I will look after her. Frigga shoot her son off, as the king would be needed at a time like this. Fine, just don't leave the room. Thor agreed as he kissed Jane on the cheek and rushed off, closing the door behind him. Turning to Jane, Frigga grabbed her shoulders and spoke seriously. Listen to me now, I need you to do everything I ask and no questions. Frigga states strictly, as she felt something weird about this whole situation. Yes, ma'am. Bifrost as Heimdall stood in his usual guard post at the end of the Rainbow Bridge, he suddenly heard something odd. A metal creaking sound drifted to his ears. Acting quickly, he turns and runs out onto the Bifrus bridge and jumps off into open space. Though, as he expected, instead of falling off into nothing, Heimdall landed on one of Maelkitha's ships, which was cloaked in invisibility. As soon as his feet touched down, the elven ship instantly became visible to the world. Before he could even act, Heimdall turned and found a fleet of giant ships behind him, releasing countless smaller stack ships, and they were all headed toward Asgard. Without a second thought, Heimdall pulls his sword and activates the shields but, Arriving at his destination with a trail of mangled Asgardian guards in his wake, the monstrous Dark Elf found the room that held Asgard's shield generator, which was guarded by many highly trained Einherjar guards. Though, sadly, they stood no chance against the thing that Algrim has become. Using his new powers, the monster elf tore apart all Asgardian guards he crossed, despite their best efforts to stop him. Approaching the generator with blood and guts covering his entire body, 
Algrim used his newfound strength to destroy it with a few powerful hits, allowing his king's dark elf army to invade Asgard unimpeded. Heimdall watched as the shield failed and a fleet of 15 huge dark elf harrows surrounded by hundreds of smaller assault ships invade his home. The larger ships crash-landed into the palace, opening holes for their invasion force as they were designed to do, while the smaller ships caused chaos among the civilian population, slaughtering innocents indiscriminately. My king, we are under attack. Heimdall mentally transmitted the details of the situation to Thor, before rushing to join the fight. As Heimdall ran off to defend his home, a golden portal opened up inside the Bifrost. After Melkith's ship crashed into the Asgardian royal palace, the doors opened and dark elf soldiers poured out, easily slaughtering the Asgardian soldiers, as most of them were dealing with a prison break at the moment. Leaving his ship while enjoying the one-sided battle, Melkith wanders off to find any members of the royal family, hoping to dye his hands red in the blood of Bor's children. Ha, huh, looks like I was right? Peter muttered as he looked across the Rainbow Bridge, where Asgard was embroiled in what appeared to be a losing battle. At least, for the time being. Damn, that's not good. Tony commented as he and the other Avengers Council members walked up behind Peter. I'm going to need my suit. Here. Peter waves his hand and opens a portal to the tower. Hitting a button in his watch, small pieces of Iron Man armor come flying through the portal and attach to Tony's body. Should we head out? Charles frowns as he could feel the emotions of all the dying innocents. Yeah, you guys deal with everything outside the palace, Peter says as he opens a portal and steps inside. I'll handle the rest. The All-Father twitched in his sleep, sealed inside his private chamber. His wife and queen, Frigga, learned from her youngest son's schemes and sealed her husband's room with all sorts of ancient magic, keeping the former king of Asgard safe from any harm. Thanks to this, no dark elves would be able to breach his chambers. Though, Odin wasn't exactly having a peaceful nap today. Although he may be asleep, Odin could watch the world around him and enjoy life as a fly on the wall, spying on anyone he had an interest in watching. As long as they weren't cloaked in magic, of course. Today was the hardest day of his most recent Odin sleep, the All-Father was forced to helplessly watch as his home was invaded, and his people were massacred. What made it even worse was the fact that he couldn't risk waking up early again, or else the consequences would be far worse than last time. Death would be a real possibility. Though, Odin soon started to seriously contemplate whether the risk would be worth it, as he could see every death that took place within Asgard's borders. Not a single man, woman, child, or soldier was overlooked. The image of every single one of them was burned into Odin's mind, never to be forgotten. Even his wife, who he always tried to protect, was currently locked inside her chambers with his son's mortal lover. Just seeing his wife treat Jane as her daughter-in-law irked the former king of Asgard to no end, though he didn't exactly have time to think of his son's human fling. After all, a powerful figure was currently skulking toward his wife. Do we just stay here? Jane asked as Frigga locked the doors to her chambers with a quick spell. Yes, we dash Frigga replies, but the palace began to rumble. Multiple explosions were heard as the floor shook with the power of a strong earthquake. Looking out of the grand windows, Frigga and Jane could see the war raging on outside as well as the larger dark elf ships, which have forcefully docked into the palace. Who? Frigga asked, as she didn't recognize the enemy. Boom, before she could think on it for much longer, the door that she just spelled shut only moments earlier broke open, sending pieces of wood and metal flying. I knew I sensed high-level Asgardian magic in here. Melkith says as he strolls into the room alone and unafraid. The stench seems to be coming from you. Melkith ignored Jane completely as his glare landed on Frigga, who materialized a thin silver sword in her hand. Stand down, creature, Frigga says as she stands ready to fight. Otherwise, you won't leave this room alive. I have survived worse, woman. Melkith lazily draws his own sword, not impressed at all by his opponent. Who are you? Jane asks from the side. I am Melkith, and I would have my vengeance. He states and casually walks closer to Frigga, who ignited her sword in blue fire and strikes out at him. As the two exchanged blades, Jane thought it was an even fight at first, though the strained look on Frigga's face contrasted with the calm and unbothered expression on the intruders. I am Melkith, and I would have my vengeance. Odin's blood ran cold when he heard the invader's words. He was just a young boy at the time, so Odin never encountered Melkith and his army of dark elves, but his father would tell him stories. Stories of a hard-fought war and the man that equaled his father in power, Melkith. Odin's hands gripped into tight fists as he watched his father's most hated enemy toy with his wife, enjoying the one-sided beat down, which would no doubt end in Frigga's death. I have to. Odin thought as he prepared himself for the backlash that waking up would give him. Ugh. Frigga grunted as she was sent flying across the room by a boot to the gut. I see that my worries were for nothing. Melkith comments as he strolls forward and rests his razor-sharp blade on Frigga's neck. Asgard has grown weak in my absence. Bor would be disappointed. Crash as he was speaking, Jane picked up an expensive-looking vase and smashed it onto the back of Melkith's head. Exclamation point. Seeing an opportunity, Frigga reached over and grasped the bottom of a long curtain, which came to life and tried to wrap itself around Melkith's neck. Die monster. 
Sadly, a fragile case wasn't exactly the best weapon Jane could have chosen, as it did nothing but surprise the Elven King, so when Frigga made her move, Slash Melkith merely swiped his sword, bisecting the curtain, which fell to the floors, lifeless once again. How pitiful. Melkith mutters as he continues to ignore Jane and pulled Frigga to her knees, resting his blade against the back of her neck. Any last words, Asgardian ho? One thing. Frigga looks up at the Elven King and spits directly into his face. That's all? Hee hee. Melkith chuckles as he wipes his face clean with his offhand. You remind me of my wife before Bor killed her. Raising his blade, Melkith mimicked the motion of an expert executioner. No. Jane yelled in horror, while Frigga stared at the floor unflinchingly, accepting her fate. Frigga. Odin roared in his mind, though he didn't awaken. After all, he didn't need to. As the blade made contact with Frigga's neck, instead of the gruesome sound of slicing meat and bone, everyone heard what amounted to a wet towel slap. Ha! Huh? Melkith muttered as he looked down in shock. Question mark. Frigga breathed heavily as she felt something cold on her neck. At first, she thought it was blood, but upon hearing Melkitha's reaction, Frigga looked at the sword that almost took her life. The blade of Melkitha's sword has somehow turned into a long wet napkin, which was still connected to the hilt, hanging like a limp noodle. Sorry, was that sword important? A voice asks from the door. Turning to the door, everyone found Peter leaning against the wall casually. Spider-Man. Jane exclaimed as all of her annoyance with Peter disappeared in an instant. It seems that I owe you a debt once again? Frigga says with a thankful look on his face. Eh, don't worry about it. Peter says with a shrug. Thor and Loki would be sad if their mommy died, after all. Why you? Melkith interrupts the wholesome moment as he glares hatefully in Peter's direction. You have the ether. Is that what that angry sludge is called? Peter pretends not to know. Hand it over, and I'll spare your worthless life. Melkith threatens as he kicks Frigga aside and storms over to Peter. No, thanks. I'm finally starting to understand how it works. Like that? Peter says as he points to Frigga, who fell into a pile of pillows, which Peter created with a single thought. Isn't it quite handy? Arg. Melkith grunts angrily as he dashed toward Peter but, splat he ran headfirst into a thick wall of bulletproof glass. You should really watch where you're going, Peter says as Melkith shatters the glass with a kick. Oh, look out. Bang a metal anvil fell from the ceiling and landed directly on Melkith's head, knocking him to the floor. This reminds me of Tom and Jerry. Peter comments as Frigga looks toward him in shock. I is that the... She mutters in shock. Why don't you guys go and sit with the old man? I'm sure he's been worried sick. Peter says as he waves his hand and opens two portals, which swallowed Frigga and Jane, sending them to Odin's chambers. Are you dead? Peter asked as a long stick appears in his hand, which he uses to poke Melkith's body from a distance, like a child that discovered a dead body in the woods. As the stick touched his pointed ears, Melkith's eyes snapped open, showing a furious anger raging deep inside. Outside of the palace, Asgardian soldiers did their best to defend against the Dark Elf invasion, though it seemed to be a losing battle. Thanks to the surprise attack and the destruction of the barrier, Asgard's forces were caught completely off guard, leading to a sporadic and rather weak response, which completely crippled Asgard's military. Though, one man has been fighting back successfully while slowly building up Asgard's forces. Follow me. Heimdall exclaimed as he leaped off of a bridge and landed on one of a dozen small ships, digging his golden sword into it. Seconds later, countless Asgardian soldiers followed him down, attacking the other ships with spears. Due to the sudden damage, each ship spiraled out of the air and crash-landed under the bridge. Of course, Heimdall and his soldiers managed to jump off just in time, landing a few meters away from the crash site. Keep moving. Heimdall ordered, but before they could leave, loud humming filled the air and a huge shadow dwarfed the group of soldiers. Looking up, Heimdall found a giant dark elf hero ship floating above them, as hundreds of smaller assault ships shot out, circling their location menacingly. Sir, what do we do? A fearless Asgardian warrior asks, ready to die for his people. Heimdall remained silent as he watched each and every assault ship prepare to fire in their direction. Creak, just as the ships were about to let loose, a loud creaking sound filled the air. What is that? A soldier asks as the giant ship above them twists and turns. In a matter of moments, the menacing ship folds in on itself and explodes, knocking the smaller assault ships backward, which causes them to fire their attacks everywhere but Heimdall and his soldiers. Many of the ships actually shot each other, cutting their numbers in half in an instant. He's really showing off, isn't he? A metallic voice mutters as a red and gold armored man shot overhead, toward the surviving ships. A smile formed on Heimdall's lips as Iron Man hovered in the air and fired a bright beam from his chest, destroying dozens of ships with a single turn of his body. Now who's showing off? Another voice comments as two men float over to Tony. One balding and the other in a metal helmet. The balding one closed his eyes for a moment and seconds later the remaining dark elf pilots passed out in their ships. Instantly, the remaining smaller ships spiraled out of the air, crash landing in fiery balls of smoke. Okay, that was definitely showing off. Magneto says as he looks at Charles with a smirk on his face. Hey, where's Fury? 
Tony asks as he looks around, finding Heimdall and his group down below. Who knows? Charles says with a shrug. He's probably skulking around somewhere. Eric comments offhandedly. Avengers, thank you for your assistance. Heimdall calls out, drawing their attention downward. You know us? Charles asks in confusion. Yes, but now may not be the right time for this. Heimdall nods as he turns to see countless other elven ships headed their way. In the palace, Thor and his Einherjar guards finished subduing the prisoners and immediately rushed to combat the invading elven forces. Just as they were leaving the prison, which was now locked up tightly, a towering figure stood in Thor's path. Who might you be? Thor asks as the ugly monstrous form of Algrim comes into view, grunting like an angered animal. Erg. Roaring like a mad dragon, Algrim runs over to Thor and his men, shaking the palace floor with every pounding stomp. All of you go on ahead. I'll take care of this thing. Thor spins his hammer in one hand and launches forward, slamming it down on the monster's chest with a loud bang. Though, to Thor's absolute shock and surprise, the impact did absolutely nothing to Algrim, as if Mjolnir was a movie prop made of foam. How? Thor uttered as a giant fist smacked into his face, launching him backward toward the Einherjar guards, who haven't left yet. Your Majesty! They exclaimed as Thor smashed into them, knocking the armored men to the floor. Thor spat out some blood as he rose to his feet, turning to his disheveled soldiers. Go back and find another way around, but your majesty? One of his men spoke up. Leave. Thor commands as lightning dances from his hammer to his body, covering him in winding streams of blue energy. Seeing their king's real power appear, the Einherjar army reluctantly turn and flee through the prison, where they would find another way out and assist the army outside. Gurt. The mutated dark elf growls and stomps over to Thor, who checked one last time to make sure his men have left, before giving all of his attention to the beast coming his way. If strength isn't enough, let's try lightning. Thor said as storm clouds rolled in and covered the palace. In the face of Thor's impressive light show, Algrim simply roars once again and rushes forward like a pissed rhino. On the other hand, Thor remained unmoving as the lightning on himself gathered at the end of his hammer. Take this. Thor swung Mjolnir forward, launching all of the built-up energy at his opponent. Of course, the stampeding monster had no thought of dodging, so the beam hit him square in the stomach, slowing his charge but certainly not stopping him. Exclamation point. Seeing that he didn't have enough power, Thor pulled on the storm clouds above and slammed Mjolnir to the palace floor. Instantly, all of the lightning outside came together to form a huge pillar, which crashed down through the palace rooftop. Tearing through the palace floor by floor, the pillar of energy hit Algrim, completely covering his hulking body. Aag. The monstrous elf screamed in agony, as its body was quickly torn apart from the sheer amount of energy that enveloped it. Once the lightning pillar cleared, nothing was left of Algrim but the dust that floated in the air where he once stood. Thor, on the other hand, collapsed to the floor, exhausted and breathing heavily with sweat pouring down his body. Never before has he wielded that much lightning at a single time. That was, a lot. Thor muttered as he took a minute to catch his breath. Are you dead? Peter asks as Melkith jumps to his feet, glaring hatefully in his direction. What? You aren't still mad about the ether thing, are you? I will rip you open and take back what belongs to me. Melkith see that as the wound on his head from the anvil healed, closing completely in a matter of moments. Darkness shall return. I'd rather not. Peter comments as Melkith held out his hand with a serious look on his face. Question mark. As a few seconds passed, Peter watched as Melkitha's expression contorted and strained from whatever he was doing. You okay? Peter asks as he wondered whether he may have given the guy brain damage. How is this possible? Melkith stared at Peter in shock. The ether won't respond. What did you do? Due to his close understanding of the ether, which he built up through thousands of years of use, Melkith should have been able to control the red sludge inside of Peter's body. Though sadly for him, the ether wasn't responding to his call whatsoever. No matter how hard Melkith tried to rip the ether from Peter's chest or possibly pull it out through his mouth, nose, eyes and ears, the ether didn't budge a single centimeter. As if it found a new master. Maybe it likes me more? Peter said with a shrug. I would like me more too. After all, you abandoned the poor little goo for 5,000 years. I'm tearing up just thinking about it. Instantly, a tissue appeared in Peter's hand, which he used to jokingly wipe under the eyes of his mask. Melkith boiled in anger as his teeth ground together. I will not allow Dash, just as he was speaking, a train whistle echoed through the room, surprising the elven king. Hot, Melkith turned to see a bright light on his face. Splat, a huge Harry Potter-style train came out of nowhere and barreled through the room, hitting Melkith head on at full speed. I wonder where that came from? Peter says sarcastically as he felt a considerable pull on the ether's energy. Maybe I should keep things small from now on. After hitting Melkith and sending him into a nearby wall, the train crumbled into nothing and disappeared. Hey, you aren't dead this time, right? Peter asks as a bloody Melkith falls from the wall and begins to crawl in his direction. I won't let you have it. He says in a raspy voice. The ether belongs to me. Alright, this is just getting sad now. Peter comments as he opens a portal under Melkith, who was too beaten to retaliate. Have a nice bath in the sun. I'm sure it's warm. 
After the death of Melkith, Peter walked through the palace, helping the Einherjar guards with the remaining Dark Elves that were still sieging the place. While Peter was dashing through the halls, killing Dark Elves left and right, he ran into Thor, who was covered in sweat and tiredly making his way through the palace. Yo! Peter called out with a wave. What happened to you? That doesn't matter. Thor shook his head as he looked at his friend curiously. What are you doing here? I came all the way here to defend your home, and that's all you have to say? Peter says as he playfully sulks. Thanks for the help. Thor smiled as he started walking again. We need to get to Jane and my mother. I've already sent them to your father's chambers. Peter says as he follows behind Thor, who sighed in relief. Thank you, my friend. Thor says genuinely. No problem. Peter shrugs as he explains everything that has happened so far. As for the army outside, I brought some backup? Just as Peter says this, the two of them arrive at the front balcony of the palace, where Thor was welcomed by a saddening sight. This is horrible. Thor muttered as he saw smoke rising from the once prestigious city of Asgard, as well as the invasion force that flew all over the place, bringing chaos and destruction with them. Boom before Peter could utter any comforting words, hundreds of small enemy assault ships exploded, while one of the few remaining gigantic Dark Elf Harrow ships folded in on itself before squishing into a giant ball of metal. What was that? Thor asks as he watches in awe at the decimation of Asgard's enemies. I told you that I brought some backup, didn't I? Peter says as the figures of Magneto, Professor X, and Iron Man rise up above the destroyed ships. Haha. <laughs> Thor started to laugh as he wiped a single tear from his eye. It seems that my debt to you only keeps rising. Do you want to be king of Asgard? Because at the rate you're going, that's the only thing I can offer. Eh, don't worry about it. Peter says as he smiles under his mask. I have enough problems to deal with on Earth as it is. No, you must be rewarded Dash Thor tries to offer but. Suddenly, thousands of spears flew up into the air and rained down on a large group of Dark Elf assault ships, destroying hundreds of them at a single time. Question mark. Looking closely, Thor and Peter found Heimdall leading thousands of Asgardian soldiers, who all waited for the ships to crash before retrieving their spears. It seems that your subordinates are fighting back as well, Peter comments as Thor starts spinning Mjolnir in his hand. I can't just sit on the sidelines, can I? Thor says as he throws his hammer and launches out of the palace. Meh, I don't think they'll need my help. Peter muttered as he strolled back into the palace, where he found Fury skulking around like a thief in the night. Yo, find anything interesting? Peter asks as he appears behind the sneaking baldy. Exclamation point. Fury jumps slightly as he turns to see Peter looming over his shoulder. What? Don't be so angry. Peter commented as a large group of dark elves came running their way. I'll leave these guys to you. After giving Fury a quick shove toward the incoming enemies, Peter walked off and left him behind. It was easy for him to tell that Fury was up to no good. He was most likely trying to steal Asgardian technology or find some worthwhile information, so Peter decided to throw him to the wolves as punishment. Looking back, Peter watched as Fury fought his way through the swarms of dark elves, who seemed to have no end to their numbers. He'll be fine. Peter thought to himself as he strolled off. Within a few hours, thanks to the combined effort of Asgard's forces and the Avengers, every Dark Elf was taken care of, leaving nothing but dead bodies and wrecked ships behind. Sadly, Asgard was significantly damaged, but they would be able to rebuild with enough time and effort. Though, they wouldn't be able to bring back those that were lost in battle, as well as the innocents who were slaughtered like animals in their own homes, neighborhoods, schools, and workplaces. The city could be rebuilt, the dead would always remain that way. Once Thor was sure that every last enemy was finished off, the cleanup officially began. Every Asgardian came together to clean up their home and mourn the loss of their loved ones. Luckily, Asgard has many sorcerers in their ranks, so the cleanup was quickly taken care of. Of course, rebuilding would take much longer, but at least there won't be any rotting bodies laying around to spread diseases. Speaking of the bodies, the Asgardians were all brought together for a proper funeral ceremony, while the Dark Elves were simply burned in large piles, leaving nothing but ash and dust behind. And I would like to thank our Midgardian friends for their assistance in Asgard's time of need, Thor mentioned Peter and the others in his speech at the ceremony for the Fallen. Due to the fact that a funeral was being held, the Avengers Council hadn't returned to Earth just yet, as they wanted to show their respect before leaving. Without them, we may have lost far more than those here today. Thor started as he turned to look at his mother, who was still alive thanks to Peter's interference. Well, I couldn't just let her die. Peter thought as he was saddened by her death in the movie. Frigga always came off as a loving mother, who wanted nothing but the best for her children. It's certainly possible that she made some mistakes with Loki, as it couldn't be all Odin's fault for the way he turned out, but that isn't enough to warrant her death. In short, Frigga didn't deserve the end that she got, which is why Peter made sure to find her and save her as soon as possible. Once Thor's speech came to an end, the dead Asgardians were loaded onto ornate boats and pushed across a large lake, where they were each set ablaze with fiery arrows from a distance. This part of the ceremony took a long time, so Peter ended up sending Eric, Charles, Fury, and Tony back home. They all had responsibilities to attend to, after all. Though Peter stayed behind, as Thor asked him to stay for some reason. 
So, what's up? Peter strolled into the throne room and asked. Thor, who just finished with the funeral proceedings, sat on his throne with his mother, Frigga at his side. Spider, come forward and kneel. Thor orders in his serious kingly tone. Ah, uh, do I have to? Peter asks as he walks over. Just do it. Thor sighed as he felt like the atmosphere that he was cultivating was completely ruined. Reluctantly following his friend's words, Peter knelt down on one knee. Spider, as thanks for your many deeds in service of Asgard and its people, I hereby grant you citizenship as well as the noble title of Duke, second only to members of the royal family. Thor states as a smirk forms on his face. Ah, thanks. Peter answers unsurely. No problem, my friend. Thor smiles happily on his throne. It's the least we can do after all that you've done, Frigga says from the side. I don't have to do any work, do I? Peter asks, completely ruining the moment. Haha. <laughs> Thor started laughing instantly. See, mother. I told you he would say that. No, you won't have any duties, unless you want them, of course. Frigga says with a sigh. Good. Peter sighed in relief. I don't mean to be disrespectful. It's just that I'm already extremely busy on Earth, so my schedule doesn't have room for any more responsibilities. It's alright, my friend. Thor says with one last laugh. We mainly gave you this title for the respect of it. No Asgardian can afford to look down on you now. Were they doing that before? Peter asks curiously. Some? Frigga spoke up. You have to understand that Midgard isn't exactly known for its strength. It will take time to change people's minds. Well, whatever. Peter shrugs uncaringly. It's not like I care what other people think. I see, well at least you can enjoy the perks of citizenship. You did say that you wanted to buy a vacation home here. Thor says with a shrug of his own. Since we have your reward out of the way, let's talk about the ether. Frigga says as the room turns serious in an instant. What about it? What about it? Peter asked as he knew that they would bring up the reality stone sooner or later. What are your plans with it? Frigga asks worriedly. She knew what the ether really was, the reality stone. Knowing this, Frigga and her sleeping husband didn't know how to handle the situation. Thankfully, Odin was still hibernating. Nothing much. Peter answers with a shrug. Probably learn how to wield it and use it for my usual hero stuff. That's about it. Frigga pursed her lips together in contemplation. I don't see what you're so worried about mother. Thor says uncaringly. Even if the ether is powerful, the spider is a good man. He wouldn't use it for any nefarious purposes. Of course, Thor stuck up for his friend, though he didn't know the true power of an infinity stone. It's not him that I'm worried about. Frigga says as she looks at Peter seriously. There are some in our universe that would kill for the power you've been granted. Wielding the ether will call these people to your doorstep, and they will do all they can to rip the reality stone from your body. Reality stone? Thor asks curiously. That is the true name of the ether. Frigga explains briefly. If you're talking about Thanos, then you don't have to worry, Peter says, surprising the former queen of Asgard. How do you know that name? She asks suspiciously. Because he sent an army to Earth looking for something called the Tesseract, but we destroyed them before they could land. Peter says, earning an impressed look from Frigga. Do you have the Tesseract as well? Frigga asks as she knew what was inside the glowing cube. At this point, Thor was merely listening along, as he had no idea who Thanos was nor anything about the Tesseract. No, but Thanos seems to think it's on Earth. Peter lies smoothly. Either way, Earth has already drawn some unwanted attention, so the ether or reality stone, whatever you want to call it, won't change much. Frigga remained quiet for a moment as she tried to figure out how to handle this. On one hand, she didn't want to make any demands of her savior, and on the other hand, she knew her husband wouldn't like this. Odin would want the ether hidden once again. That way it could remain forever out of the hands of people like the Mad Titan. Fine, I will not interfere, but you should know some important information before making any decisions. Frigga says as she goes into a long-winded explanation about the Infinity Stones and their origin. So there are six gems out there that can grant anyone godlike powers, and my friend here has one of them? Thor summarizes everything simply. Yes. Frigga nods as she starts to second-guess herself. Do you see why I'm so reluctant now? Although Frigga had some thoughts of confiscating the Reality Stone, she knew that Peter would simply overpower her should she try to take the Aether by force. No, if anyone can handle such a burden, then it's the spider. Thor disagrees with his mother instantly. Thanks, Thor. Peter says genuinely. I wouldn't exactly call it a burden though. Yeah, having to worry about people like Thanos, and the possibility of blowing up from using infinite power was alarming, but the pros far outweigh the cons fine, I will not speak on this anymore. Frigga says with a sigh. Just remember to be careful. Thanos will most definitely attack Midgard once again, and he most certainly won't be the only one. And Asgard will be there to defend its allies. No tyrants may attack the Nine Realms without retaliation. Thor says as he grasps Mjolnir and lightning began to spark randomly. And I will defend Asgard again should you need any help? Peter says with a smirk under his mask. I would be happy to fight by your side when the time comes. Yes, as fellow Avengers. Thor bellows happily. Sure, does that mean you want to join? Peter asks. Of course. How could I not? Thor says with a laugh. 
I can't let Loki upstage me, after all. Alright, then you're hereby a member of the Avengers, Peter makes it official in an instant. Usually the council would vote on any new recruits, but I already know that they'll say yes. I'll bring over some paperwork on another day, and you'll have to go through some training, but we can figure that out later. Training? I do not need training. Thor said as he had more training time than every Avenger combined. Everyone has to go through basic training. No exceptions, Peter says with a shake of his head. Thor's dash Frigga tried to argue for her son but. Fine, I'll accept the training. Thor agreed reluctantly. Good, I'll bring over some paperwork tomorrow and assign you a trainer as well, Peter said as he opened a portal. Anything else before I go? No, just remember to be safe. Frigga says, knowing the ether will bring him nothing but trouble. I will. As soon as Peter returned home, he finally had some time to sit back and think properly. Firstly, he now has three out of six of the Infinity Stones, one of which he can actually use without any adverse side effects, making him a bona fide powerhouse. What was even more shocking was how loyal the Reality Stone seemed to be. Based on the way it could move on its own, and ignore the call of Malekith in their fight, Peter came to the conclusion that the Red Sludge liked him somehow. At least, more than the dead Dark Elf King. Peter wasn't sure whether that was playing a part in how easy the ether is to use for him. This could explain why I slept for so long. Peter thought, as Jane only passed out for a moment in the movie. The ether must have agreed with me being its wielder, and kept me asleep for some reason? Maybe to get accustomed to my body? Although Peter thought that this was the likely answer, at the end of the day he had no idea if it was actually correct or not. After all, Malekith must have had the ether's consent at one point as well, yet Peter doubted that the Dark Elf King had similar control over the Red Sludge. Or else he would have easily won against Asgard all those years ago. Maybe if he had a conduit, like the one Peter was trying to build, then he could have possibly wielded similar powers. Speaking of conduits, Peter opened a drawer in his room, revealing six tiny wire-like pieces connected to small metal indents, which were made specifically to hold the Infinity Stones. It only took King Itri a few weeks to forge his order, and it only took that long because of the metals used as well as the intricacies of the blueprints. I may not need one of these anymore. Peter muttered as the Reality Stone found a home in him somehow. Maybe I can use the extra conduit for something else? As for the rest of his order, the other dwarves worked together to forge all 206 bones perfectly, earning their vibrabium, which they split between themselves after a huge brawl to decide who would get the larger cuts. Opening a larger drawer, Peter found the bones that would make up Lily's body. If I use the reality stone, I could make her a body today. Peter thought, though he knew it would disappear without the power stone's help. Not only that, but using the power stone could also alert Thanos. Otherwise, how would the mad titan know that the space stone was on earth? He has to have some sort of tracker that lights up every time the energy of an infinity stone is detected. Suddenly, Peter realized something. He probably knows about the reality stone, Peter thought with a frown. After all, Peter used it once in the New York Sanctum and a bunch of times on Asgard. Though, the Sanctum is most likely warded, so he may not know that it was originally on Earth. As for Asgard, Peter wasn't so sure. The reason Peter was so worried about Thanos knowing is that he didn't want to scare the Mad Titan away. He would rather let Thanos underestimate him than anything else. After all, it's the enemy you underestimate who kills you. If the Sanctum is warded, then he may just think that the Reality Stone is in Asgard. Texting the Ancient One, Peter quickly found out that the New York Sanctum, much like all of the other Sanctums around the world, is completely warded to hide any energies. So thankfully, Thanos shouldn't know that the Reality Stone is on Earth at the moment. Though, that opens up Asgard as a definite target of the Mad Titan and his armies, which isn't good either. As long as Odin is alive, Thanos will have a hard time. Peter thought, as the Mad Titan would have to use a lot of manpower to take Asgard. I just hope the old man wakes up soon, as his sleeping disorder could prove to be a real problem. Though the current problem at the top of Peter's list is how can he use the ether without lighting up Thanos' gem radar like a Christmas tree. I need to get some books. Peter thought as he portaled over time Kamartage and ransacked the library. After spending the whole night reading up on barriers and other ways to hide certain energy signatures, Peter suited up and went over to the tower, where he collected all of Thor's paperwork and called in Hawkeye. You wanted to see me? Clint says as he walks up to Peter, who was watching TV in Tony's living room. Yeah, follow me. Peter opens a portal and walks through. Stepping through the portal, Hawkeye was met with the sight of an ornate throne room, filled with guards in golden armor. Hey, where is Thor? Peter asked as the throne was empty. The king is in the dining hall, Duke Spider. An Einherjar guard answers respectfully. Thanks, Peter says as he walks off with Clint following closely behind. Duke Spider? Seriously? Clint asks, finding the title amusing. Shut up, I didn't pick it, Peter says with a small hint of embarrassment. It's not that bad, whatever you say. Clint tries hard to hold in his laughter. Arriving at the dining hall, Peter spotted Thor and the warriors three eating and drinking together. Yo, Peter calls out with a wave. My friend, you're back already. Thor seemed happy. 
After saying hello to everyone, Thor and the Warriors 3 seem to notice Clint standing awkwardly in the background. Thor, this is Clint. Peter introduces the two of them. He'll be in charge of your basic training. As Peter says this, he slaps the paperwork down in front of Thor and hands him a pen. Meanwhile, Hawkeye stood to the side with a shocked look on his face. Peter didn't explain anything before dragging him here, so learning that he would be training a new member, who happened to be the king of an advanced godlike alien civilization, was a bit startling, to say the least. Sign here, here, here. Peter starts flipping through the many pages as Thor confusedly signs his name over and over. That's it. You're officially an Avenger. Do you want us to send your paychecks to Jane? I get paid. Thor asks in surprise. Of course, every member has a generous monthly paycheck. Peter explains as Clint nods behind him. Being an Avenger is the most lucrative job that Clint has ever had, and he isn't paid nearly as much as those with enhancements. Yes, send my money to Jane. After all, I have no use for it here. Thor says, happy that he could help make Jane's time on Earth easier. Sure, now you and Clint need to come up with a schedule and decide whether you will be coming to Earth for your training or the other way around. Peter says as he steps back to allow the two to talk. Are you sure he needs training? Clint asks, as he felt weird about traveling across the universe for something like this. Even now he's just realizing that this isn't planet Earth anymore. I told him I didn't need it. Thor nods his head. Everyone has to go through training, you know that. Peter says as he looks over at Clint who reluctantly nods. Can't Natasha handle this one? Clint asks as he looks at Thor uncomfortably. No offense, but this is an alien planet right? To you, yeah. Thor laughs. Natasha is busy with other recruits, Peter says with a shake of his head. If being off-planet makes you uncomfortable, Thor will just have to come to the tower for training. That's fine. Thor agreed easily. I've been meaning to visit my brother anyway. After settling the deal, Clint became Thor's trainer. Their first day of actual training would take place on the following day. Of course, Peter decided to stop by and welcome Thor. Though mainly he wanted to enjoy the show. After all, Thor planned to meet with Loki, which would certainly be entertaining to watch. Arriving at the tower the next day, Peter hung out with Lily as he read through one of the books that he took from Kamartaj, waiting patiently for the time Thor would arrive. What are you reading, Dad? Lily asked, sounding a bit more mature than before. Compared to her earlier childlike voice, which sounded like a five-year-old girl, Lily now sounded around nine or ten-year-old. The change wasn't huge, but one thing was certainly different. She doesn't call me daddy anymore. Peter thought sadly. It started a few weeks ago. Lily suddenly started thinking of herself as an adult, even though she isn't, and refused to call him daddy anymore. It was like a switch flipped and his favorite word disappeared in an instant, leaving him no chance to ever get it back. When the tragedy first took place, Peter came crying about it to MJ, though that was a huge mistake on his part. She only made matters worse. What are you? A pervert. She asked half-jokingly. Of course, Peter defended himself, but she refused to sympathize with him. Why would she? Lily still calls her mommy. Peter thought as he felt pain in his heart. Life is so unfair. It was like his name disappeared and he couldn't fight for it, as Lily's mother would just call him a pervert even though it wasn't about that. Hearing the sudden change in his name just made Peter realize that his cute cybernetic daughter was growing up extremely fast, which he started to regret more and more. I should have locked her at a normal human growth rate. He thought in sorrow. Of course, he knew that this was just his emotions talking. Lily isn't a human so limiting her to a normal human's learning and development speed would be torture for an AI. He just missed his old name. It's a magic book about hiding energies, Peter explained as he showed her a page, which was filled with spell circles. Wow, can I learn magic too? Lily asks as she has seen Peter do a few spells over the month she's been born. Maybe, Peter answers unsurely. We'll have to test it once you have a body. I'm so excited. Lily exclaimed, as Peter pictured her jumping around with a smile on her face. When do I get my body? I want to try so many things. Like pizza and clothes. I wonder what a hug feels like. Well, I'll try my best to get it done. Peter smiles warmly at her excitement. Though you have to promise that I get the first hug? Okay, but mommy might be jealous. After talking to Lily for a while, Peter was alerted to Thor's arrival, though it wasn't hard to miss, as the Bifrost's beam shot down and impacted the tower's roof. I wonder if Loki is here. Peter thought as the banished prince tends to follow Jessica to work almost every day. Leaving Lily to one of her newest TV shows, Peter walked up to the roof, where he found Thor waiting alongside Jane, who must have come along with him. Yo! Peter waved as he saw them. Ready for training? Sitting around with a bored look on his face, Loki waited for Jessica to finish with some paperwork. Ever since Jessica joined the Avengers, she moved her entire alias investigations office to the tower, which has been extremely good for business, though she didn't have much time for normal cases anymore. While the two of them sat in silence, the tower suddenly started shaking, like a small earthquake was taking place. Though those thoughts disappeared as Loki noticed a very familiar pillar of light, shooting down from the sky. Oh, shit. Loki muttered as he saw the angled beam from a nearby window. What? Jessica turns to look where he was looking and her eyes go wide in shock. 
Is that? I think my brother is visiting. Loki mutters as he gets up and paces out of the door. What? Wait. Jessica jumped out of her chair and rushed to catch up with Loki, who was already at the elevators. Where are you going? I'm leaving before the king of pompous muscle heads can find me. Loki says as he hits the down button on the elevator and waits for it to arrive. Why? He's your brother? Jessica asks as the elevator doors open. No, he isn't. Loki argues and he steps into the elevator and hits the button for the ground floor. Yes, he is. Jessica argues back as she follows him inside. I'm adopted too, but my sister is still my sister. I don't know everything about your family, but you shouldn't write them off like this. That's exactly right. Loki turns to Jessica as the doors close, locking them inside alone. You know nothing so keep your mouth shut. Silence fills the small space as the two of them glare into each other's eyes. Wait. Jessica says in confusion as she turns to look at the doors. What about keeping your mouth shut didn't you understand? Loki scoffs as he leans against the wall. We're going up, you idiot. She informs him with a vindictive smirk on her face. Ha! Loki grunted as he looked above the door and saw the displayed number climbing higher and higher. Looks like we're meeting your brother after all? Jessica says, enjoying the look on Loki's face. Exclamation point. Loki hopped into action and started spamming the buttons, hoping to redirect the elevator back downward somehow. After a few moments of failing to redirect the elevator, Loki watched in horror as the elevator doors opened, revealing a smirking Thor on the other side. Brother. Thor exclaims as he pulls Loki out of the elevator and into a big hug. Get off of me. Loki says as he struggles to escape Thor's grasp. That's the scowl I've been missing. Thor smiles warmly as Loki pulled away. Why are you here? Loki asks, looking at his brother as if he were a nuisance. Shouldn't you be sitting on your throne, enjoying the perks of sovereignty? Eh, being a king has its pros and cons, Thor says with a shrug as he reaches out to place a hand on Loki's shoulder. But enough about me. How have you been brother? Fine. Loki answers simply as he steps back into the elevator and hits the button for the ground floor for a second time. Now, if you'll excuse me, sadly for him, the elevator didn't respond, remaining open and unmoving. After waiting for a few moments, Loki's glare turned to Peter, who stood behind Thor, leaning against the wall casually. This is your doing, isn't it? I don't know what you're talking about. Peter feigns ignorance as Jessica walks up to Thor. So, you're Loki's brother. She says as she eyes him up and down. You don't seem that bad. Well, I wouldn't trust much of what comes out of my dear brother's mouth. He tends to make himself out to be the victim. Thor says rather eloquently. What? Loki asks incredulously. Don't presume to know how I think. You may burst a blood vessel. Loki glares at Thor for a moment before shooing him away. If your plans were to see me, then be on your way. I have no need for you. Loki says dismissively. Nah, mother is handling everything for me today, so I'm free all day, Thor says with a smirk. Speaking of our mother, she told me to give you this. Thor hands over a sealed letter, which had Loki's name written in cursive on the front. Tell your mother that I'm not interested, Loki says as he makes no move to take the letter. I was never her son, nor was I your brother. Do you see what I mean now? Thor turns to Jessica with a look that said I told you so. Yeah, I think I am. She nods as she looks back at Loki in confusion. Loki, stop acting like a petulant child and take the letter from your mother. I'm sure she's been worried sick. Rolling his eyes, Loki ignores Jessica and looks to Peter once again. Either you let me go or I will make your life a living hell. I may be powerless at the moment, but I assure you, that won't stop me. Sigh, you're no fun, Loki. Peter mutters as he looks at a nearby security camera. Jarvis, let him go. Yes, sir. Jarvis answers as the elevator doors close, leaving Peter, Thor, and Jessica in the hallway. Loki has changed. Thor says with a fond smile, surprising Peter and Jessica, who didn't know Loki as well as him. He seems the same to me, Peter says in confusion. The Loki I know wouldn't run away so easily. He would stay and annoy me to no end with quips and insults, Thor says as he looked down at his mother's letter and sighs. I just hope that he'll continue to change for the better. I can take the letter to him, if you want, Jessica says as she reaches out to take it. Sure, I don't know how mother would react if I came back with the letter, so this may be for the best, Thor says as he handed it over. Don't worry, he'll read it, Jessica says as she hits down on the elevator, ready to go after Loki. Just as it opened again, Thor called out to her. Lady Jess, Thor says, stopping her in her tracks. Try to be patient with Loki. He has always boasted about being the smarter brother, but when it comes to love, he's an absolute idiot. Question mark. Jessica was shocked by Thor's words of advice. Thankfully for her, the elevator doors swiftly closed, cutting the conversation short and leaving Thor and Peter alone in the hallway. Well, that was entertaining, but Clint is probably waiting. Peter says as he walks off. Come on. Shaking off Thor's words, Jessica rushed to catch up to Loki, who she found walking down a crowded sidewalk with a deep scowl haunting his face. Hey, prick. Jessica called out as she rushed over and grabbed him by the neck. Huh? Loki grunted as he was lifted off of the ground by a single hand and thrown into a dark alley. 
Holding his neck and coughing, Loki sat up off the ground and found a very familiar woman standing in front of him with her hand on her hip. Why must you act like an animal? Loki says as he glares up at her. Shut up and read your letter? Jessica says as she holds it out to him why do you care so much? Loki asks, but before she could answer, a taunting smile appears on his face. What? Does poor little Jessica want to live vicariously through me? Maybe experience some motherly love? Jessica's mother died alongside the rest of her family when she was younger, and Loki knew this. You really are a spoiled little shit, aren't you? Jessica uttered in frustration. You have a mother who loves you? I would kill for that. My mother is long dead, and the adoptive one I got afterward was a vindictive bitch. You should appreciate what you have while it lasts, instead of acting like some coddled teenage girl. Ignoring the wide eyes of Loki, who had no words to argue back, Jessica tore Frigga's letter open and read it aloud. If he isn't going to read it, then I'll force him to listen. Jessica thought as she spoke. Dear, Loki. During your time away, I have done nothing but worry. I know some punishment is needed for what you've done, but this may have been a bit much. Though, maybe I'm wrong. After all, your father would always say that I spoil you and Thor too much. I just wish that you could come home already. Everything feels so empty without you here causing trouble. As Jessica read more and more, Loki's eyes began to water. I've always tried my best to be a good mother, but recently I've started to second-guess myself. I look back on simpler times and wonder, did I give you enough love and attention, duh? A single tear rolled down Loki's cheek, though he quickly wiped it so no one could see. I know for a fact that your father didn't. He was always such a distant man, but I worry that I didn't show you just how much I truly love you. Did I say it enough? Did I hug you enough? Did I spend enough time? I can't answer these questions, and that scares me. Jessica paused for a moment to wipe a few stray tears from her eyes before continuing. Peeking over the paper, Jessica looked into the red eyes of Loki, who was doing his best to hold back tears. Please come home soon. I need my son back. If your brother can find his way back, then so can you. Don't keep us waiting long. It's lonely here without you. I love you, Loki. Signed, your mother, Frigga. Jessica lowers the paper and looks Loki in the eyes. Wow, it must be so horrible having such a loving family. I couldn't even imagine it. Loki doesn't reply as he stared off into the distance. Without another word, Jessica throws the letter in Loki's face and storms off. After sitting in on Thor's training, and watching Hawkeye get his butt handed to him for a while, Peter left them to their business and went on his way. He had to work on masking the Reality Stone's energy and also figure out Lily's body, so Peter didn't exactly have time to laze around forever. At least, not at the moment. That night, whilst Loki drowned his sorrows in liquor, a familiar man took a seat beside him at an empty bar. What can I get you? An elderly bartender asks from behind the bar top. The same as my brother? Thor says as he turns to see Loki glaring down at the bottom of his glass. I don't remember you being much of a drinker. Loki didn't bother responding as he downed his glass and snatched the drink that was meant for his brother. I thought we could have something in common for once. Loki says jokingly as he downs Thor's drink next. Without a word, the older bartender refilled both glasses and gave the two brothers some space. Hee hee, well I haven't had much time to drink like I used to. Thor laughs as he grabs both glasses and downs them within seconds, matching his little brother. Throughout the night, both brothers drank enough liquor to kill lesser men. Neither brought up any family drama nor politics, merely keeping each other company while using liquor to help ease the situation. By the end of the night, Loki passed out in his seat, sleeping soundly while hugging an empty glass like a treasured teddy bear. I hope you come home soon, brother. Thor says genuinely as he pats Loki on the back and stumbles out of the bar. As he left, Loki picked his head up from the bar top just in time to see a glimpse of the Bifrist's light, shining through the windows. Sigh, dash one month later. After spending a lot of time researching, Peter crafted his own spell, which could block the Reality Stone's energy signature from leaking past a certain distance. Looking down at his new tattoo, Peter sighed as he could finally use the ether without worry. The tattoo itself looked like a very complicated spell circle that sat on Peter's right shoulder. Its function was rather simple. The spell binds itself to the Reality Stone's energy in Peter's body, muffling it like a sort of pistol silencer. Though, like a silencer, it doesn't completely hide the energy's signature but lessens it to a certain extent, so that no one outside of Earth would be able to pick up on it. I think this is as good as I can get it. Peter thought as he summoned a bag of chips and started eating. Of course, the possibility of earthly adversaries coming for the ether was always likely, but that was far better than an entire universe. I'd much rather have some weak metahumans come looking for it than alien armies or godlike entities, Peter thought. Finishing his chips, Peter tosses the bag to the floor, where it crumbled into nothing. One good thing about the Reality Stone's lack of permanence is the fact that all foods will disappear from his stomach soon after being eaten, allowing Peter to eat whatever he wants without any fattening repercussions. Of course, Peter never had to worry much about that, but the woman in his life certainly found the ability extremely appealing. When May first found out, she spent the day pigging out on whatever she could think of, yet she actually lost weight in the process. Of course, she couldn't do so regularly, as a healthy diet is important, 
but may certainly enjoyed a few reality-bending snacks every now and then. As for the other Infinity Stones, Peter would have to get a separate tattoo for each of them, as the one he has now would overload if it had to mask the energy of more than one of them. Especially the Power Stone, which would break just about any spell with its raw energy. Though, that was alright, as Peter didn't mind getting a few interesting tattoos in the future. This one's pretty cool. He thought as he stared at himself in the mirror. I wonder what MJ will say. When Peter figured out how to mask his use of the reality stone, an idea popped into his head. With a single thought, a working normal-sized clone heart appeared, floating in front of him. The heart is a perfect mix between Peter's and MJ's DNA, and had no defects or other issues. It may disappear, but that doesn't mean I can't study it and learn what I'm doing wrong. Peter thought as he portaled over to his lab and started working. Another month passed, and Peter was finally starting to make real progress with Lily's body. Thankfully, only a tiny bit of the ether's energy was used to make a single organ, so Peter was able to constantly produce them for study. Sitting in a machine, which mimics the functions of a human circulatory system, a healthy heart sat pumping blood into tubes, which would simply recycle it back to the heart over and over. I finally did it. Peter thought with a victorious smile. Today, the first lab-grown heart was created, bringing Peter one step closer to fulfilling Lily's wish. Oh, what's that? A familiar voice asks as footsteps come pacing over. Looking over his shoulder, Peter couldn't help but roll his eyes at the intruder in his lab. Tony, you should really respect other people's privacy, Peter admonished, as he knew that Tony either hacked his way through the doors, or had Jarvis do it for him. Don't be such a shut-in, and I won't have to break into your lab, Tony says as he ignores Peter and looks over the heart curiously. Are you growing organs? What for? Sigh. Peter let out a frustrated breath as he didn't bother replying. Come on. You can tell me. Tony pleaded as he made a sign with his hand. I won't tell a soul. Scout's honor. You know what, okay. Peter says as he eyes Tony like a devil with a deal to offer. I'll tell you, but you have to do me a favor in exchange. Deal. Tony, being the naive soul that he is, agreed instantly without a second thought. All right, come with me. Peter opens a portal and steps through. As Tony followed him through the portal and into a huge room, filled with shelves full of servers and other tech, the voice of a little girl calls out. Dad? Is that you? Lily asked hopefully. Yes, and I brought a guest? Peter says as he pulled Tony and pushed him in front of Lily's camera. This is your uncle Tony. He's very excited to meet you. Ha! Tony grunted as he instantly put two and two together. You made an AI daughter? That's what you've been hiding in your penthouse? Yup, and now you get to babysit her the next month or two. Peter says as an evil smirk forms on his lips. Of course, Peter isn't just abandoning Lily to Tony, as he would never put her through such cruel torture. It's just that Peter has been busy with making her body, so he doesn't have unlimited time to spend with her, making Tony the perfect babysitter to fill the hour or two that he or MJ would be gone. Especially since they have school as well, though Peter doesn't always attend as MJ does. You want me to babysit an AI child? Tony asked incredulously. Are you saying that you don't want to spend time with your cute little niece? Peter questioned back. Do you hate me, Uncle Tony? Lily asked sadly, somehow on the verge of tears. No. That's not it. Tony exclaimed. Really? Lily asked unsurely. Yes, I could never hate my niece, Tony says, as does his best to smile warmly at the camera. Good, since you love your new niece so much, I'll leave you two to spend some time together, Peter says as he opens a portal to his lab once again. Don't mess with anything. Especially her code. If I come back and my daughter is suddenly a boy or only speaks Mandarin, then I'll be extremely pissed, Dad said a bad word, Lily says pointedly as Tony nods toward Peter understandingly. Sorry, Peter apologizes for his language. Stepping through the portal, Peter turns back for a moment. Thanks for agreeing to the favor, Uncle Tony, Peter smirks as the portal closes. He got me, Tony thought as realized that he was fooled. Suddenly, it dawned on him exactly what the lab-grown heart was for. Lily, is your father making you a body? Peter sighed in relief as he ditched Tony on his daughter, who would certainly make his life hell for a while. After all, playing Cyber House with an AI kid wasn't the most fun activity an adult could go through. Of course, Peter wasn't afraid that Tony would mess with Lily's coding, as Peter warned him and the computer interface for it is locked behind tons of encryptions. Not to mention the fact that Lily was now mature enough to guard her own coding, which Peter made sure to emphasize the importance of long ago. Tony would have to do some evil shit to bypass everything. Peter knew that his friend wouldn't stoop that low. Throwing his worries aside, Peter got right back to building Lily's body. Since the first organ was made, Peter knew that growing the rest of her body would be child's play. The only thing that he needed now was a way to bring everything together. Either I show her up like Frankenstein or I use a bit of the mystic arts. Another month passed, and Peter spent almost all of his time invested in building Lily's body. By this point, Peter had every bit of bone, organ, tendon, muscle, skin, and vein ready and waiting. He even had a pre-measured amount of things like blood, fat, and flesh. Looking at his collection of body parts, Peter couldn't help but feel like some sort of serial killer. 
If someone walked in on me right now, they would certainly see me as some deranged lunatic. Peter thought with a shake of his head. Flashback since he didn't want to make Lily into some sort of zombie Frankenstein monster, Peter returned to the library of Kamartaj and poured through book after book, looking for a way to combine every he had into a singular perfect body. Though sadly, not a single book in the normal sections had what he was looking for. Did she remove any books related to human experimentation? Peter wondered, as it seemed like something the Ancient One would do. Since the normal side of the library didn't have what he needed, Peter checked the restricted section next. Although he is supposed to ask his teacher before taking any books from this particular section, she wasn't currently available, so Peter simply lied to the librarian. Do you have permission from the Ancient One? An elderly man asks from behind his desk. Of course, Peter says as he leaves the man to his crossword puzzle and starts perusing the locked up books. Being a student of the Ancient One has many perks, but the best one of all is the fact that everyone takes Peter's word for his teachers. If he was anyone else, the elderly librarian would have thrown him out and asked the Ancient One for confirmation, yet Peter gets a pass in situations like this. The librarian didn't even stand from his chair, let alone bother himself with whatever Peter was up to. As Peter looked through the much more dangerous section of the library, he instantly found three books related to human experimentation. One book was about using dead animals to give humans animalistic properties, while another wrote about healing the body with human sacrifice. No wonder these are locked up. Peter thought in disgust as he saw a page depicting a human pig variant, which looked about as ugly and monstrous as it could possibly be. I'm definitely staying far away from that book. After looking through the restricted section for almost an hour, Peter found two books that should be able to help him. The first one is a book about reattaching lost limbs through, once again, human sacrifice, while the other is similar but pertains more to organ transplants. Using those two books, Peter would have to build his own spell to, hopefully, put Lily's body together in an instant. Of course, without the human sacrifice portion. Taking the books, Peter signed them out under his name and left as usual. The Ancient One would probably find out about this soon enough, Peter thought, knowing that he would get a stern talking to when his teacher returned from whatever dimension she ran off to. Flashback end. With the right books in his possession, Peter spent the whole month making the ingredients for his daughter's body, while also crafting a complicated new spell. Thankfully, he had some experience in spell crafting, so it didn't take that long before he had everything made and ready as he wanted. Turning his back to the serial killer's wall of body parts, Peter picked up a fresh-looking book and opened it up to a certain page, where he found his newest spell. The Body Formation Spell. A diagram was drawn, showing the structure of the spell circle, as well as the ingredients needed and their placement. Below all of that was a long paragraph, written in a mix of multiple dead languages, which he would use as a chant for the spell. The book itself is Peter's own personal spell book, detailing every spell he has ever made, just in case he were to forget them. Though, the main reason was that he liked the idea of having his own spell book. It's finally time, Peter thought as he started setting everything up. That night, blood and body parts filled the floors of Peter's lab in an intricate design, which really made the place look like a gruesome crime scene. The only things that stood out among the flesh and blood were the forged bones and a brain-shaped piece of tech, which would take the place of Lily's actual brain, as he needed to download her consciousness somehow. Though that wasn't the only reason. With a normal human brain, Lily would be held back by light years compared to a machine brain, like this one, which was made with the combined tech from both of the Kree and Chitauri ships. The current human technology just wouldn't cut it for something like this, so Peter had to try something different. Hence, the alien tech brain. Okay, Peter muttered with a small sigh. Let's hope nothing goes wrong. As Peter spoke, he took out his spell book and started chanting in an unknown language. Instantly, a complicated golden spell circle drew itself in front of him, before expanding to cover the intricately placed body parts. Soon enough, the giant spell circle lowered down onto the ingredients, getting brighter and brighter as it descended. When the room was covered in a blinding light, Peter finished chanting and covered his eyes. As the magical flashbang settled down and disappeared, Peter opened his eyes to find the naked body of a ten-year-old girl on the floor. She had dark black hair and a skin tone that was only a few shades lighter than her mother, though one thing drew Peter's attention immediately. Are those organic web shooters? Peter caught sight of the small holes on the body's wrists, matching the same holes on Peter and MJ's bodies. Although she lay there lifelessly, Peter could see the rise and fall of her diaphragm, showing that she was alive and breathing. She needs some clothes? Peter broke from his stupor and waved his hand, conjuring some casual clothes onto his daughter's body. Insert picture of Lily here. The best one will get a like from me, making her appearance official, with her body made, Peter needed to run some tests, so he picked the body up princess style and carried it over to a table. Setting her down, Peter turned her head to the side and found an access port at the back, which he unlocked with his fingerprint and plugged a long cable into. Tapping a few buttons on his keyboard, Lily's body shot up off of the table and started to move robotically. Motor function seemed to be working properly. Peter muttered as he hit another button, which sent Lily's body into action again. 
After spending the whole night sleeplessly testing his daughter's body for any errors or mistakes, Peter finally finished everything by lunchtime on the following day. No problems whatsoever, Peter muttered with a relieved sigh. Lily's body was perfect. It didn't have any diseases, disabilities, tumors, or any functional issues whatsoever. Opening a portal to his penthouse, Peter was excited to tell Lily the good news but... Thunderstruck, thunderstruck. Yeah, 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 thunderstruck, thunderstruck. Yeah, 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 said, yeah, it's alright, we're doing fine. Loud music was blasted in the penthouse. As Peter stepped inside, he found Tony holding the mouse to Lily's terminal and singing into it like a microphone, though no one would be able to hear his voice over the deafening sounds of ACDC. Walking over to the computer, Peter hit the spacebar, which paused the song. Thunderstruck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony continued to sing even after the music stopped. Uncle Tony? What happened to the music? Lily asked, as Peter wasn't in frame for her to see. Ha! Huh? Tony finally noticed that the music was gone. Peter. Dad. Lily asked. Yep, I see that you're teaching my daughter about rock and roll. Peter says as he takes a seat in front of the camera. Hello, sweetie. Dad, why did you stop the music? Lily asked, sounding not so happy about it. You tell him. Tony adds fuel to the fire for his own amusement. Your father just doesn't respect the classics. Oh, forgive me. Peter says as he pretends to be apologetic. I just finished your body, but if you'd rather listen to music with your clown of an uncle, then I won't bother you. Without another word, Peter gets up and walks slowly toward his portal. Wait. Wait. Lily yelled in desperation. Huh? Did you need something? Peter turned and asked with a smirk on his face. I. Lily stutters, as she was too excited and befuddled to think straight. What? You want the music on again? Peter asks as he walks back over and stares into the camera with an amused smile. Stop being mean. She yelled in frustration. I don't know what you're talking about. Peter asks with a small laugh. Ugh. Lily grunted as she had no words for her annoying father. What's wrong, Lily? Peter enjoys teasing his daughter. Meanwhile, Tony snuck off into the portal, where he found Lily's body in Peter's lab. He really did it. Tony muttered in shock as he pulled up a seat at the nearby computer and looked over all the body's data. I see you're being nosy as usual, Peter says as he steps through the portal and picks up Lily's body. How did you put it all together? Tony asks as Peter walks off into the portal again with the body in his arms. Magic. Peter called out as the portal snapped shut, locking Tony out of the penthouse. Is that me? Lily asks as she caught sight of her body in Peter's arms. Yes, do you like it? Peter asks as he sets the body down in front of Lily's terminal. I mixed both mine and your mom's DNA, so Dash I'll actually be your daughter. Lily exclaimed in surprise, though she sounded extremely happy. Yup, like it? Peter asked again. I love it. Lily answered like the overexcited child she was. Then let's get you in, shall we? Peter says as he connects one end of a cable to the terminal and the other to the body's head port. Wait. Lily calls out just as Peter was about to start the transfer. Yeah. Peter asks questioningly. What about mommy? Lily asks. Your mom is in school right now, Peter explains with a shrug. But won't you want to be here? Lily asks worriedly. Well, we can either wait for her to get out of school, or we can do it and go pick her up together. Peter throws out an idea. I'm sure she'll be surprised to see you. Oh. Let's do that. Lily sounded thrilled with Peter's suggestion. I want to see the look on mommy's face when she realizes it's me. Sounds like a plan. Peter says as he hits a few buttons on the terminal. Are you ready? Peter's hand hovered over the enter key, waiting for his daughter's answer to begin. Why yeah? Lily answers nervously. Smiling at his daughter's cute stutter, Peter hits the button. Daddy? I'm getting sleepy. Lily says in confusion as she suddenly started to fall asleep for the first time since she was born. It's okay, I'll see you when you wake up. Peter smiles as a loading bar appears on the screen. Lily couldn't reply as she was completely unconscious within seconds. After half an hour of waiting, Peter watched as the bar filled completely, finishing the transfer. Question mark. Pulling the wire out of her head, Peter looked over at Lily's body, waiting for her to wake up. Minutes passed as Peter started to worry whether she would wake up or not. Lily should have been jolted awake when the transfer finished, so the delay wasn't a good sign. Lily. Peter sat beside her and shook her shoulder, hoping to wake her up himself. Lily, it's time to wake. Ugh. Lily groaned in annoyance as she turned over and swatted Peter's hand away. Go away. I'm trying to sleep. Sighing in relief, Peter watched as Lily's eyes shot open in realization. Turning her head to Peter, Lily grabbed the hand that she just slapped away only moments ago. You're so warm. Peter smiles warmly at the look of wonder that appeared on his daughter's face. I can feel. Lily suddenly exclaims as she looks down at her body. And I have legs. Well, I would be worried if you didn't. Peter says with a laugh as Lily starts inspecting every part of her body. What's this? Lily asks as her hand went into the front of her pants. There's a hole? Am I dying? Acting quickly, Peter pulls her arm out with an uncomfortable look on his face. Everything is normal. Your mother will explain that later, 
Peter throws all of the responsibility to MJ. Just don't do that again, uh, okay. Lily nods her head in confusion. I should have put bodily education on her list of homework. Peter thought in regret. While Peter was regretting his lack of foresight, Lily picked herself up off the floor and tried her best to stand on two feet but, ah, uh, Lily screamed in fright. Like a newborn deer, Lily stood on shaky legs for a moment before collapsing onto the penthouse floor. Are you okay? Peter asks as he rushed to her side, completely forgetting the awkward situation he just experienced. I hit my head. Lily's eyes begin to water as she experienced pain for the first time in her life. It hurts, daddy. I don't like it, it's okay. The pain will go away soon. Peter pulls her into a hug, resting her sore head on his shoulder. The daddies are sure coming out today. It's not that bad anymore? Lily says as she feels her head. Want to try and walk again? We have some time before your mom is out of school, Peter asks. Why yeah, just catch me if I fall, okay? Lily asks with a small hint of fear. Of course, Peter says reassuringly as he lifts her up and sets her feet down on the floor. Ready? Yeah, let go. Lily does her best to sound confident. A few minutes later, after Lily tried and failed a bunch of times, Peter sat back and watched as Lily gave it another shot. You can do it? Peter encourages her. Wobbling back and forth, Lily soon finds her equilibrium and stands tall without falling. I did it. She exclaims in exhilaration. Good job. I'm very proud of you. Peter says some fatherly words as he steps out of the way. Now try walking. Lily completely forgot about that as she stepped forward and tripped, falling backward. Good try. Peter says as he caught her princess style. Put me down, dad. Lily wiggles in his arms. I can do it. In a shitty rust bucket of a car, Lily sat in the back seat while Peter drove toward his school. Don't pout, honey. Peter says as he peeks at her through the rearview mirror. You'll be able to walk on your own faster than you think. I'm not a baby. Lily says as her pout deepens. I should be able to easily walk. Sure, but you aren't exactly a normal girl, are you? Peter explains as he pulls up in front of the school just in time for the bell to ring, signaling the end of the school day. Normal children take 9 to 12 months before they can even stand on their own. You did it in a few minutes. I wouldn't be surprised if you can walk by the end of the day. As Peter was talking, Lily looked out of the window and caught sight of her mother, who walked out of the front doors with a couple of textbooks in hand. That's mommy. Lily practically jumped in her seat. Hmm, you're right. Peter says as he turned to Lily. Stay quiet and we'll surprise her. Without uttering another word, Lily nodded her head with an excited smile on her face, completely forgetting her earlier failure. Honk honk ha. MJ and everyone else in the area turned to the sound of a loud car horn. Pacing over to the car, MJ pulled open the door and took a seat, glaring at Peter as she slammed the door closed. You skipped school again. MJ didn't sound happy. Sorry, I'll go tomorrow, I promise. Peter says as he smirks at the rearview mirror and starts driving. Why are you smiling like that? MJ asks in confusion. No reason, Peter says with a small chuckle. What's wrong with you? MJ asks as she eyes him carefully. Did Tony give you some drugs? Yeah. Peter answers with a laugh. They're in the back seat. Can you get them for me? Question mark. MJ looked at him funny for a moment before sighing and peeking over her shoulder. Surprise! Lily exclaimed with her hands in the air. Ah! MJ turns to Peter questioningly. Did you kidnap a little girl? Did you kidnap a little girl? MJ asks as Lily starts laughing in the back seat. Yeah, she was on the side of the road so I offered her some candy. Peter replies with a teasing smirk as he drove down the street. She cried for a bit, but I think Stockholm Syndrome is starting to set in. Question mark. MJ could tell that Peter was messing with her, but she still didn't know why some random child was in the car. Is this death trap even safe for kids to be in? Yeah, maybe, Peter says with an uncertain shrug. So, MJ turns back to the little girl. What's your name? Lily. She excitedly revealed her true identity. Question mark. MJ froze for a moment as she robotically looked between Peter and Lily, as if to make sure this was who she thought it was. What's your last name? Parker Lily says playfully. Holy shit. MJ exclaims in shock before covering her mouth with one hand. Mommy said a bad word. Lily admonished her teenage mother. Sorry, sweetie. MJ apologizes as she just stares at Lily, taking in her appearance. She looks just like me. How did you do it? She turned to Peter questioningly. I combined our DNA and worked a bit of magic and science. Peter dumbed it all down to a single sentence. How did you get my DNA? MJ asks as she eyes Peter suspiciously. I think we're getting off track here. Peter does his best to change the subject. Lily has been very excited to surprise you. MJ wanted to push him for more answers, but Lily came to her father's rescue fairly quickly. Yeah. Dad said you would know what this is? Lily says as she excitedly pointed down at her crotch. Did he? MJ says as she turns to glare at Peter. Hey, that's mommy business. Peter says as he shakes his head vehemently. I'm not going near any womanly talks with her. That is not a father's job. I get to do things like teach her how to ride a bike or scaring away would-be boyfriends. You get everything that has to do with that dot. 
Suddenly, MJ started laughing uncontrollably, surprising both Lily and Peter. Peter, it's her vagina. You don't have to speak in code like it's Voldemort. MJ rolls her eyes. La la la. Peter takes his hands off of the steering wheel and sticks a finger in each ear to drown out the sound of MJ's voice. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Luckily, they were at a stoplight, so no accidents would be taking place. Hee <laughs> hee. Lily started laughing at whatever her father was doing before she turned to her mother curiously. Mommy? What's a vagina? No. Peter screamed in absolute fright. I refuse to be here for this talk. I want nothing to do with it. Well, sweetie. A vagina is dash MJ smirks as she started to explain, though a hand instantly covered her mouth. If you keep talking, I'll drive this car into the nearest wall, Peter says, completely seriously. Don't say things like that. MJ admonished him. Lily could get hurt. No, she wouldn't. Peter scoffs as he motions back toward Lily. Look at her wrists. Hot. MJ turns back and caught sight of the pin-sized holes in Lily's wrists. Is that? Yup. Peter nods as he pulls into his driveway. What is it? Lily asks as she gazed at her wrists in confusion. Nothing, we'll explain later. Peter says as he parks the car and takes out the keys. Let's go and surprise your grandma next. Carrying Lily inside, Peter watched as MJ hugged her daughter for the first time. The two were inseparable for a few minutes, which made Peter feel a bit jealous, though mothers tend to win in these kinds of battles. Of course, Peter wasn't too bothered. As long as MJ and Lily were happy, then he didn't have any problems. Quickly, Peter found out that his Aunt May was still at work, so they would have to wait for her to get back. Thankfully, this gave Lily ample time to receive a private talk with her mother and practice her walking afterward. When MJ started to answer some of Lily's more bodily questions, Peter left the room in an instant and pulled out his phone. What should I order? He thought as Lily hasn't tried any food yet. As an AI, Lily has only ever heard about what food was supposed to taste like, without the actual ability to ever experience it. Meh, you can never go wrong with some good old New York pizza. Peter thought as he dialed up the best pizza spot in the area and placed an order. I wonder how she'll react to soda? Once Lily was done with her womanly talk, Peter came back in and watched as MJ instructed their daughter on how to walk. Soon enough, Lily could walk but it wasn't perfect. She wobbled around like a drunken sailor, though she improved with every passing minute. Ding dong, question mark. Lily and MJ looked over in confusion as the doorbell rang. I'll be right back, Peter says as he runs off and comes back a minute later with a pizza box and a big bottle of soda. I ordered food, is that pizza? Lily started vibrating with excitement as she eyed the square box in Peter's hand. Suddenly, a loud growling sound emanated from Lily's stomach. What's happening? Am I dying? Lily asked in fear as she held her gurgling stomach. No, that just means you're hungry. Peter says as he puts everything on the coffee table and opens the pizza box, revealing a perfect pepperoni pizza. I'll get plates and cups, MJ rushes off into the kitchen. Once everyone had their own slice of pizza and cup of soda, Peter and MJ watched as Lily took her first bite of real food. Now that I think about it, I should have ordered something healthier. Peter thought, though it's a special occasion so he didn't mind. Exclamation point. Lily's eyes widen in delicious shock as she chomped on her first bite of pizza. Dish is mashing. This is amazing. I know, right? Peter smirks as he holds out a cup of soda. Try this. Taking a quick sip, Lily started giggling as she took another. It's so bubbly. Lily says as she felt something weird and opened her mouth. Burp? What was that? Of course, Peter and MJ couldn't help but laugh at her reaction. Is this why people have kids? Peter wondered. After all, drinking soda or eating pizza is great and all but Lily seemed to make it all so exciting and new. As they ate, Peter couldn't help but think of other things he wanted to show his daughter. After vacuuming down half of the pizza by herself, Lily laid down on the couch tiredly and watched cartoons with the remote in hand. I think she's in heaven. MJ muttered in amusement as she and Peter sat back and just watched their daughter together. Well, she did just have a first-class meal for a kid. Peter replied with a laugh as he points at the TV. And it even came with a show? As they were talking, Lily slowly started to doze off until she completely fell asleep on the couch, dropping the controller in the process. I'll go and get her a blanket. MJ says but before she could move, the couch morphed into a big princess bed. Or you can do that? By the time the sun had set, Aunt May returned home, though she brought along someone else as well. What's my mom doing here? MJ was pleasantly surprised as she heard her mother's voice at the front door. I told May to pick her up. After all, we can't just leave her out. Peter answered as May and Grace walked in, though they didn't notice the sleeping girl in the princess bed just yet. Ah, uh, I'm so tired. May complains as she kicks off her shoes and walks through the living room and toward the kitchen with Grace following closely behind. Like five different people called out sick today, so I had to stay to pick up the slack, and I know at least two of those bitches are lying. They just wanted a day off. That happens a lot to me too, Grace says in sympathy. Hot. Suddenly, May stopped in her tracks, which Grace didn't expect as she bumped into her back before stopping as well. Why is there a giant bed in the living room? May asks as Grace follows her line of sight and sees the same thing. 
Ah, is that a little girl? Grace asks as she walks over and admires Lily's cute sleeping face. Of course, May followed her over and was immediately captivated by the sleeping girl as well. Who is she? Grace asks as she runs her fingers through the sleeping child's hair. That would be your grandchild? That would be your granddaughter? Peter says as May and Grace turn around in surprise, not noticing him or MJ sitting nearby. Holy shit! Grace exclaimed as she whipped her head around and stared at Lily's sleeping face once again. Shoo, you'll wake Lily up! MJ admonished her mother in a hushed tone. Holy shit! Grace whispered this time around. She looks just like you when you were younger? That's Lily? May asked rather loudly. Shook. MJ shushed once again. I mean. That's Lily? May whispered in disbelief. How did you do it? Peter stole my DNA and combined it with his? MJ says pointedly, as if she was blaming Peter for some horrible crime. How many times do I have to say that I'm sorry? Peter asked as they already talked about this. It's not that big of a deal? You stole my DNA and made a child between us with it. I'd say that's a very big deal. MJ refutes his claims. So you would rather Lily stay a machine forever? Peter asks with a small hint of annoyance in his voice. Of course not. MJ exclaims. Sure. Both May and Grace took great pleasure in returning a shush to MJ. Of course not. MJ repeats in a much quieter tone. But that doesn't mean I don't want to know when you plan to use my DNA for something so important. Okay, I promise to let you know if and when I need or plan to use your DNA, Peter says in exasperation. See, was that so hard? MJ asks with a roll of her eyes. Did we just witness a couple's fight? May asks Grace. I think we did. Grace replies with an amused smirk. I would call it more of an argument than a fight. Peter says as his and MJ's hostile mood slowly disappeared. Yeah, if we fought, the neighborhood would probably be destroyed. MJ nods. Whatever you say, May says with an uncaring shrug. Fighting or arguing like that is actually healthy for your relationship. If you didn't fight at all or you fight constantly, there would be a serious problem. Like all things in life, you must find balance. Just make sure that you don't go to bed angry at each other. Because you'll just wake up in the same headspace and start arguing all over again. Did you learn that from your time with Uncle Ben? Peter asks curiously. No, from a Korean drama. May says with a resolute nod. This woman watches too many Korean romance shows. Everyone in the room thought at the exact same time. So, now that you two are done squabbling, should we wake the princess? Grace asks as she wanted to meet her granddaughter. You could or you can sleep over and surprise her in the morning with a full breakfast, Peter says as he and MJ explain how their daughter reacted to the pizza and soda earlier. After a moment of thought, everyone decided to let the princess sleep. Grace would sleep in the guest room and she and May would make a grand breakfast in the morning for her royal highness. As Peter didn't want to leave Lily in the living room, he moved her to the guest room directly across the hallway from his room. Of course, he transformed the bed in that room into a matching princess one and returned the couch to the living room. We'll have to decorate her room, MJ comments as she and Peter were laying in bed together. The room where Lily is currently sleeping would become her actual bedroom, but it is fairly barren at the moment. I can go and do it now if you want? Peter asks as it would be easy for him to conjure some furniture and decorations. No, decorating her room would be fun for Lily. Let's not take that away from her. MJ shakes her head and Peter nods in understanding. Just as MJ was about to fall asleep, Peter spoke up. I'm sorry about stealing your blood. Peter says one last time, following his aunt's advice. I'm sorry that I overreacted a bit. You used it for something good, so I shouldn't have reacted that way. MJ replies with her own apology as she buries her head in Peter's chest. I love you. I love you too. Wake up. Someone yelled as the banging and clanging of metal filled the house. Peter and MJ each took a pillow and wrapped it around their heads, covering their sensitive ears. What is happening? MJ asks sleepily as the pillow did nothing to drown out the piercing sounds. It seems like the grannies are corrupting our innocent child. Peter says as he picks his head up and sees Lily at the door, banging pots and pans together with a smirk on her cute little face. Meanwhile, May and Grace stood behind her with cooking equipment of their own, making as much noise as they could. Ugh. MJ wasn't having it as she sat up in an instant and shot multiple webs toward the loud bunch. Before anyone could react, each web stuck to the pots and pans, and with one good pull, MJ yanked them all out of their hands. Clang, as the pots and pans crashed to the floor in the corner of the room, both MJ and Peter sighed in relief and fell back on their pillows. That was so cool? Lily exclaimed as she jumped on the bed and dived on top of her mother. Can I do that too? We'll talk about that another time, Peter says as he pulls himself out of bed and looks toward the two masterminds. What's with the, grand wake-up call? Breakfast is served, Grace says as if she were a butler. Why didn't you say so earlier? Peter says as he walks past the grannies and heads downstairs to the food. After all, Lily ate most of the pizza yesterday. Hey! Wait for me! Lily exclaimed as she detached from MJ and rushed to catch up to Peter. Sitting around the dining table, which was filled with all sorts of breakfast foods, Lily excitedly tried everything one by one while everyone else ate slowly and enjoyed her reactions. From things like pancakes and waffles to eggs and bacon, May and Grace made it all. 
Wadish dish? What is this? Lily asks with a full mouth. Bacon. Peter says as he eats some of his own. It's the best breakfast food in the world? Lily could only nod as she stuffed her face with more and more bacon. We might have to start a more strict diet soon. Peter thought as he worried about Lily getting fat. Though maybe she has a very high metabolism, like me? She seemed to have a bottomless stomach. Last night she ate four big slices of pizza and now she's already on her second plate of food. Once the spectacle of Lily's reactions and glutinous behavior died down, May asked a good question. So, when is Lily starting school? She asked the one thing that Peter didn't think about. Oh. I want to go to school. Lily practically jumps out of her chair in excitement. Kim Possible goes to high school. I want to be like her. The school year is almost over, so after summer you'll be in your first year of middle school, MJ explains. Well, she doesn't exactly have the right paperwork at the moment. Peter says as he hasn't crafted her identity yet. To the United States government, Lily might as well be a ghost. She has no birth certificate or any identifying paperwork whatsoever. At least, not yet. Does that mean I can't go to school? Lily's mood instantly dropped from cheerful to disappointed sadness. No, it just means that I have to get some things ready beforehand, Peter explains as Lily's mood flips like a switch. Yes. She exclaimed as she started happily stuffing her face once again. Are you going to make her your daughter on paper? May asks as she knew doing so would complicate things. I'll figure it out. Peter mutters as he tries to brainstorm for the best case scenario. The only thing Peter could think of is adoption, which would be impossible due to his status as a minor. May. Peter calls out of nowhere. Yeah. She replies. Would you be willing to sign emancipation papers? Peter asks and a frown appears on May's face. In the state of New York, when a child is emancipated, it means that the child no longer lives with the parents and is self-supporting. In other words, an emancipated child is considered an adult in the eyes of the government. Peter was only a bit over a year away from turning 18, which is the adult age recognized by the government, so being emancipated now wouldn't really change much. A slash N, Peter is almost 17 years old by the way. He'll turn 17 in a month or two and 18 near the end of his senior year of high school. Are you sure? May sounded a bit unwilling. After all, she would be practically signing away her parenthood, which is far different than just letting Peter grow up on his own. Yes, it's the only way to adopt Lily, Peter explains his plan. Of course, nobody would allow some 16-year-old kid to adopt a child, but thankfully, Peter could easily use magic to bypass all of those hurdles. Okay, if that's what you want? A few months passed and the school year came to an end. Peter and MJ only had one last year of high school before they had to start thinking about college. Should I even bother with college? Peter thought as he didn't exactly need to go. As a millionaire who was most likely smarter than any professor, Peter didn't see the point in attending a college beyond going to the same one as Ned and MJ, as they would at least be able to spend time together. Though he didn't know if they planned to go to college in the first place. Ned has been all about fighting crime since his debut, so he didn't talk much about anything else. The public gave him the name Black Noir, as his suit resembled the DC character from the boys comic, which also exists in this world. MJ has been fairly busy with the new daughter that popped out of nowhere, so she wasn't talking much about college either. I'll just wait and see what they want to do, Peter thought with a shrug as he decided to follow his friends. If Ned or MJ want to go to college, then he'll follow after them. If not, then maybe they can come together to do something else? After all, the possibilities are endless. Speaking of school, Peter enrolled Lily into a private middle school, so she'll start her first year of school after the summer comes to an end. Peter wanted to send her to a normal public school, but he was outvoted on that decision. The whole family came together and debated Lily's schooling and all of the women were in favor of the private school. Of course, the grandmother spent hours researching the best school, as they constantly repeated that Lily's education would be of the utmost importance. You do know that Lily will know more than all of the teachers by the time she starts, right? Peter explained at the time. She's only going to school to help her socialize with kids her age. As for the actual studying, Lily will be bored out of her mind. When they realized this, MJ stepped in and helped find a private school with a lot of diversity and extracurricular activities. Of course, those criteria would make a public school far more appealing, but the grannies insisted on private school. We have enough money to send her to a nice private school, so that's where she'll go. Grace insisted as May nodded alongside her. Because they didn't care that much and Lily didn't object, Peter and MJ decided to just let the grandparents win this time around. As for Lily's paperwork, Peter was able to adopt her after becoming emancipated. Flashback. May sat at the kitchen table and glared down at a small stack of papers. Here, Peter places a pen in front of her awkwardly. He could see the hesitance on his aunt's face and knew how she felt. Usually, when a child is emancipated, it's the fault of the parent. Either they were abusive or found lacking in some way by the state standards. Though, this wasn't the case. May didn't want to sign away her parenthood, as she loved being Peter's mother. Even if he doesn't call her that. The thought of signing her motherhood away made May want to burst into tears, though she knew that Peter needed this for Lily, her beautiful new granddaughter. Ahem, 
May cleared her throat and held back tears as she peeked over at Peter for a moment before picking up the pen and signing the papers. One by one, she quickened her pace until everything was signed. Once it was over she stood up and walked off in silence. Sigh. Peter sadly watched her leave as he stashed the papers away. He could hear her crying in her bedroom, which wasn't easy to listen to. I never thought that I would hate my super hearing. Peter cursed his powers as he waited for her to calm down before following after her. Knock knock, tapping on her door, Peter heard some shuffling from the other side. One minute. May yelled as she scrambled to clean up her messy makeup. Rolling his eyes, Peter just opened the door and walked inside. May jumped as she turned to Peter with her runny mascara, ready to tell him off for not listening to her. Though before she could open her mouth, Peter walked up and wrapped his arms around her. Thanks, mom, Peter said genuinely as May stiffened in his hold. The two stood there in silence for a while. May was lost for words as she didn't expect Peter to call her that. Well, he has done it before but that was when he was younger. Why are you thanking me? May asks as she separates from Peter and wipes a few stray tears from her eyes. For everything, Peter says simply. You raised me and I know it wasn't easy to sign those papers, it's fine. I understand. May looks away awkwardly. I know. Peter says with a warm smile. I just wanted to let you know that I love you. That paper doesn't change anything. It's just so Lily can officially join our family. After all, who would believe that she's mine and MJ's biological daughter? We would have been seven years old when she was born. Laughter filled the room as the sad atmosphere slowly disappeared. Flashback end. After May signed everything, they filled out the paperwork with her lawyer friend and soon enough, Peter was recognized as an adult by the state of New York. Once his emancipation was taken care of, Peter hacked into hospital and government databases and crafted Lily her own identity. Lily Doe was an orphan born in New York Presbyterian Hospital to an unknown mother, who abandoned her soon after she was born. Her father and other family are also completely unknown. After crafting her birth certificate and other documents, Peter visited an adoption agency and worked a bit of magic to add Lily to their roster of available adopters. Of course, they wouldn't just allow someone as young as Peter to adopt Lily, so he had to trick the woman in charge with a spell that confused the victim, making them more pliable to suggestion. I really don't like using stuff like this. Peter thought as he watched the dull-eyed woman in front of him get everything in order for Lily's official adoption into the Parker family. Although making everything official didn't take long, thanks to Peter's magic, the adoption agency still scheduled weekly checkups for the first month of Lily's adoption. Apparently, they don't just give out children without making sure that they're being treated properly. Peter managed to bypass all of the preliminary checks, so he was surprised when a social worker with a clipboard came knocking at his door. Thankfully, Peter was able to work some magic and put a stop to any more checkups after the first. Just remembering the look on that social worker's face when she noticed his age, Peter has never witnessed so much confusion and worry on one person's face before. Of course, he had to befuddle her a bit before sending her out with thoughts of a perfect home visit. Though once that little mishap was fixed, Lily officially became Peter's daughter, and they changed her last name to Lily Parker. Why don't I get emancipated? MJ asked as she and Lily cuddled up on the couch, watching TV together. I'm her mother too, you know. Obviously, MJ wanted to adopt Lily as well but... You do know that increases the possibility of your father finding out about Lily, right? Peter asked as he knew Fury would find out soon enough. Ah, MJ groaned in annoyance. I have a grandpa? Lily asked in confusion as no one mentioned it before. Yes, and I'm sure you'll meet him soon, Peter says as MJ groans once again. Time skip. After spending the summer as a happy family, the school year started once again, and Lily attended her first day of school. Um, I don't think I want to go anymore. Lily says nervously as she stares out of the car window at the countless kids rushing into the front doors of her new school. Each of them wore matching uniforms, which Lily wore as well. What? I thought you were excited to make some new friends. Peter asks, hoping to goad her confidence to rise. Be but I don't know what to say. What if they don't like me? How do I make friends? Lily asks back as she turns to her father, revealing her teary eyes. Smiling warmly at his emotional daughter, Peter motioned for Lily to come closer. I'll tell you the secret to making friends, Peter says as he leaned over and whispered into her ear. Hearing his words, Lily looked at her father in doubt. That's it? She asked incredulously. Yup, now go and have fun, Peter says as he shoes her out of the car. I'll pick you up after school, okay? Hesitantly climbing out of the car, Lily grabbed her backpack and rushed after the other children. Just find someone you like and talk to them? Lily thought as she rushed into the building and found a young boy standing in the corner with a nervous look on his face. Hey! Lily calls out as she walks over and stands awkwardly in front of the boy. Hi! He replied just as awkwardly as her. I'm Lily Parker. I'm Miles Morales. With the start of a new school year, Peter knew he was getting close to the time when the Winter Soldier is supposed to appear. Knowing that this was coming for a while now, Peter has already hacked into S.H.I.E.L.D. at the highest level, discovering everything about Project Insight. Project Insight is a top-secret S.H.I.E.L.D. operation initiated as a direct response to the growth in empowered humans, as well as the threat of future alien invasions. 
The project involves three helicarriers that would patrol Earth and, with the use of multiple spy satellites and an algorithm that evaluated an individual's behavior, eliminate humans who would commit heinous crimes before they even had a chance to act them out. The ultimate social credit system? Peter thought as this reminded him of an extreme version of what was happening in China. Hydra, being the evil organization that they are, planned on using Arnim Zola's algorithm to root out individuals that would oppose or threaten Hydra's goals, not just those that would commit crimes. Of course, they also planned to use these huge airships as weapons against threats from outer space, though that was their main purpose. The algorithm used every variable of a person's life such as bank records, voting patterns, and even standardized testing scores to determine whether they were better off dead. I'll have to kill Zola as well, Peter thought as he remembered the Nazi scientist that turned himself into a machine so he wouldn't die. Operation Paperclip was so dumb. Operation Paperclip, also known as Project Paperclip, was a program in which over 1,600 Nazi German scientists and engineers were brought to the United States of America and pardoned for their activities in World War II in exchange for federal employment. Men and women who used their scientific minds and skills to aid the Nazi war effort were instantly pardoned and brought in under the red, white, and blue. I wonder how many of them contributed to the genocides that took place? Peter wondered, though he didn't doubt that it was a very high percentage. Either personally or through their work. If Hydra only wanted to use the helicarriers to defend the planet, then I wouldn't mind so much, but everything else is just unacceptable. Peter thought as he looked toward another shield file titled Winter Soldier. Getting Bucky back to normal shouldn't take long, as Peter could probably find a spell that could resurface his suppressed memories. The only problem is Tony, who won't be happy when he finds out that Steve's best friend killed his parents, Peter thought with an annoyed sigh. Deciding to just let things unfold and be there for Tony when he needed it, Peter donned his suit and portaled over to the tower. Jarvis. Peter called as he stepped into the council chambers. Yes, sir. Jarvis answers dutifully. Call a council meeting for me, Peter says as he takes a seat and waits patiently. I might as well bring up what I found. Since Steve doesn't work for S.H.I.E.L.D., as he did in the movie, Peter knew that he had to jumpstart the war against Hydra and Project Insight himself. After waiting for almost an hour, each member started trickling in one by one. Oddly enough, Tony arrived last even though he lives in the building. What's this about? Charles asks as everyone took a seat. I was in the middle of a talk with a student in need. I'm sure you'll be able to finish guiding them once we're done, Peter says as he plugs a flash drive into the table. Instantly, the image of a classified file is projected in front of the whole group. Project Insight? What's that? Tony asks as he saw the S.H.I.E.L.D. logo, which drew his interest. Why don't you explain it to us, Fury? Peter says as he sits back and looks toward the resident bald and angry councilman. How did you get this? Fury asks suspiciously. I hacked your database. Peter says with an unimpressed shrug. It was pretty easy. What is Project Insight? Eric asks, not liking the sound of it. After all, a villain can recognize villainy and the name alone sounded villainous. Go ahead, Fury. Peter gestures for the picture. You explain and I'll fill in the blanks. Fine, Project Insight is. Fury quickly explains the details of the project. So, you want to set a fleet of giant airships into the air that would assassinate bad guys before they can commit crimes? Tony asks as he puts it all together. Yes, but this isn't my plan. I'm just along for the ride. Fury states, as even he found the project obsolete after the success of the Avengers. That is a dangerous amount of power in one organization's hands, Professor Xavier says as he looks at Fury disapprovingly. Yes, it would be the ultimate tool to eliminate any opposition, Magneto agrees with a nod. Which is why I want to stop it, Peter says with a smirk. You do know that I'm the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., right? Fury says as he looks at Peter with an annoyed expression on his face. I really don't want to deal with this. Why can't you give me the courtesy of conspiring behind my back? Fury didn't want to choose between the Avengers and S.H.I.E.L.D., as he was proud of both organizations. One fought for the betterment of the world in the shadows, while the other did so center stage. Well, let me help motivate you, Peter says as he hits a button on the table. Instantly, an audio file from the flash drive starts to play. How many individual targets has your algorithm picked up so far? A familiar voice asks over what seemed to be a phone call. Is that Alexander Pierce? Tony asked as he met the man on occasion. Yes. Peter nods as everyone in the room listens closely to the recording. 715,845 individuals and counting. A robotic-sounding man with a heavy German accent answers, elated at his accomplishment. I have no doubt that the number will increase to 20 million by the time the Heli Zero carriers are launched. Good, keep me updated. I want to know everything as they happen. Pierce demands. This project must continue smoothly. Understood Zola. Of course, but what about Director Fury? You said that he's been snooping around lately. The now named Zola asks worriedly. You worry about the science, and I'll deal with everything else. Pierce pushed away Zola's worries. Soon enough, S.H.I.E.L.D. will have a new director. One way or another. I haven't been this excited in years. Zola says with a weird robotic laugh. As the call came to an end, the parting words of each person shocked the entire room. 
Hail Hydra. Hail Hydra. Zola and Pierce uttered as if they were saying goodbye or see you later. Bastard. Fury exclaims in anger and shock. Everyone in the room stared in surprise as their eyes turned to Fury, who didn't look happy about this realization. You knew. Fury mutters as he glares down at Peter, who sat casually in his chair. You knew S.H.I.E.L.D. was infiltrated by Hydra all this time. It's why you kept dropping those annoying clues? Well, I had a vague idea. Peter lies with a shrug. But that's different from knowing 100% and having proof to back it up. You could have at least told me. Fury says as he sighs in annoyance. I hinted at it enough. Peter replies uncaringly. And you're a smart enough guy? Apparently not. Tony says with a small laugh. The master spy didn't even know that his own organization was infiltrated. I'd say that's a huge hit to your reputation. Even during times like this, Tony takes every opportunity to annoy Fury, and it was definitely working wonders as a throbbing vein appeared on his bald head. Now is not the time, Stark. Fury says, grinding his teeth. Tony keeps his mouth shut, though the shit-eating grin on his face certainly said it all. So how do we deal with this? Charles asks as everyone turns to Peter. Seeing a shield has been compromised, I say we clear out the pests and take it for ourselves. Peter answers as everyone sends him skeptical looks. You want to take over shield? Fury asks incredulously. Yup, it's probably the only way that S.H.I.E.L.D. can continue to officially exist, Peter says as everyone watches him questioningly. After all, at least one of the members of the World Security Council is a Hydra plant. Do you really think S.H.I.E.L.D. will be allowed to operate after this comes to light? What's the World Security Council? Tony asks as Fury never explained the leadership of his organization before. They're the Avengers Council of S.H.I.E.L.D., Peter explains. I bet at least half of them are Hydra as well. I see your point, Fury says as he sits back in defeat. But clearing out every Hydra plant in S.H.I.E.L.D. won't be an easy task. Who knows how many there are. For all we know, the majority of S.H.I.E.L.D. could already be Hydra. Eric states. Let's focus on taking down the leaders and then worry about the grunts later on, Peter says, knowing that he could find a way to weed out any remaining agents. Are we all in agreement? Obviously, S.H.I.E.L.D. needs to be cleaned out, but taking over afterward needs to be voted on. Soon enough, arguments filled the room as those that were for and against Peter's S.H.I.E.L.D. absorption plan made their stances known. After almost an hour of talking, it was decided that S.H.I.E.L.D. would become a branch of the Avengers with Fury keeping his director position. So, who wants to be the one to tell Cap? We can worry about Steve later, Peter says as he keeps the conversation on track. Although we came to a decision, we need to figure out which members of the World Security Council are Hydra. I think it's best that we just assume it's all of them and bring them in, Eric says, getting nods from everyone in the room. The problem is containing every S.H.I.E.L.D. agent in the process. If we allow Hydra agents to escape, they'll simply hide away for another 60 years. Building their strength while biding time for another project insight. That's what makes Hydra so effective, Peter says in annoyance. As long as a single grunt remains, they'll continue to existing, but that's impossible, Fury says with a shake of his head. S.H.I.E.L.D. has bases in every major country and active agents all across the world. Even retired agents could be Hydra. If you give me a list of S.H.I.E.L.D. bases, then I can put barriers around each of them, locking the agents inside, Peter says after a moment of thought. That's right, I keep forgetting that you're a magician. Magneto comments with a smirk. Sorcerer, but yeah. Peter corrects him with a shrug. The barriers would have to go up at the same exact time, or else word will spread and agents will flee. Fury says. That makes it a bit more complicated, but I can make it work. Peter nods. What about active and retired agents? Charles asks. Or the ones that just didn't show up to work that day. Tony adds. Or the Hydra bases that exist outside of S.H.I.E.L.D. Eric follows up. We can worry about that afterward. Peter comments, as they don't have enough time or resources to hunt down that many individuals. I'm sure the captain would be happy to deal with the cleaning up the stragglers. Eric says, knowing Steve would hunt Hydra to the ends of the earth. Alright, I think that's a good enough game plan. Peter says as he turns to Fury. Get me a list of addresses for each base and I can get to work. You'll have it by tomorrow? Fury says as the meeting started coming to an end. Do you also need a list of Dash, Pamela Hawley, Alexander Pierce, Gideon Malik, Chow Yen, Jakuna Singh, Douglas Rockwell? Peter knew what he was going to ask and listed off every member of the World Security Council. Fury sighs in annoyance as he gets up and leaves the room in silence. After the meeting concluded, Peter wanted to update Steve on the situation, but it was already midday, which meant Lily should be done with her first day of school soon. Opening a portal to his house, Peter changed his clothes in an instant, hopped into his car, and drove to the school. Pulling up front behind the other parents who came to pick up their children, Peter ignored the odd looks he received for his rust bucket and searched for Lily. Peering through the crowd of children, he found her sitting on the grass, talking to a familiar boy around her age, who wore a hooded sweatshirt over his school uniform. Insert picture of Miles Morales, because I forgot last time. It's happening. Peter thought in dread as he menacingly glared at the ten-year-old child. I thought that I'd have at least a few years without any boys sniffing around. He felt like he knew the boy from somewhere, but shook his head negatively after a moment of thought. 
Pushing his fatherly hatred to the side, Peter stopped glaring at the innocent kid and beeped his horn. Beep beep, seeing Lily turn her head toward the honking car, Miles looked over and found a rusty car in the distance. Is that your dad? Miles asks as he saw Peter in the driver's seat. Yeah, I have to go. Lily was a bit reluctant to leave her new friend. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow? Miles nodded as he wondered how old Lily's father was. After saying their farewells, Lily ran off to her father while Miles went to his bus, as both of his parents worked during the day. As Lily buckled up in the back seat, Peter watched her from the rearview mirror and drove off. So, make any new friends? Peter asks. Just one. Lily answers vaguely as she looks out of the window and sees Miles alone in his bus, sitting away from the other children. As they drove home, Peter asked her a bunch of questions about her first day of school. When they pulled up and parked in the driveway, Lily spoke up. Dad, can my friend come over after school tomorrow? She asks out of nowhere. Sure, as long as his parents say it's okay. Peter wouldn't let his dislike for possible future boyfriends ruin Lily's first friendship. Okay, I'll text him and ask. Lily says as she hops out of the car and whips out a cell phone. Hey, who gave you a phone? Peter asks as he didn't remember her having one. Mom did. Lily calls out as she rushes inside while texting her friend. First a boy and now a phone. After spending the day with Lily, and watching her complete her homework in under a minute, Peter suited up and returned to the tower. Knock knock tapping his knuckles on Steve's apartment door, Peter waited for a moment before the door swung open, revealing an expectant looking Peggy Carter. You're not the sushi delivery guy. She says in disappointment. Nope. Peter smirks as he pushes past her and strolls inside. Make yourself at home? Peggy says sarcastically as she closes the door and watches as Peter takes a seat on the couch. Is Steve home? Peter asks as he ignores her comment. On the TV, a romance movie was playing, showing a man and a woman kissing on a beach furring sunset. No, he's at the gym, but he should be back any minute. Peggy answers as she pauses her movie and looks at Peter questioningly. What's this about? Hydra. Peter reveals as the door swung open and Steve came walking in, covered in sweat. Hydra. He asks in confusion as the door slowly closes behind him. What are you two talking about? After explaining the recent council meeting to the old couple, Peter watched as Peggy frowned silently and Steve started pacing around the room. How could they let this happen? Steve exclaims angrily with a pissed off look on his face. Who thought that recruiting Nazis after the war would be a smart decision? Idiot bureaucrats who wanted to increase the power of their country, Peter answers with a shrug. You knew about this? Steve turns to Peggy and asks. After all, she was around at that time and used to be the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. There's not much that she wouldn't know from back then. I knew about Operation Paperclip, but nothing to this extent. Peggy defends herself as her frown deepens. Well, you should have done something. Steve says emotionally, though he instantly regretted it. I wasn't the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. at the time, Peggy says as her voice gets a bit heated. I didn't have a say in what happened, Steve. Silence fills the room as Steve takes a deep breath to calm himself down. You're right, I'm sorry. Steve apologizes as he takes a seat and stares at Peter expectantly. How can I help? There's already a plan in motion. In an unknown Hydra facility, a cryogenic pod lifts open, revealing a thawed-out Bucky Barnes with a sleek metal arm. Insert picture of Bucky slash Winter Soldier here, only a moment after the pod lifted, Bucky's eyes shot open, looking at his surroundings in confusion. Sitting up, Bucky grabbed his head in pain as an electronic voice filled the room. Longing, rusted, 17, daybreak, furnace, 9, benign, homecoming, 1, freight car. As these words registered in Bucky's brain, his eyes dulled and his face turned deadly serious. The Winter Soldier was activated. Your orders are on the table. The voice of Alexander Pierce filled the room next. Standing from his cryopod, the Winter Soldier paced over to the nearby table and flipped open a file, revealing a picture of Nick Fury alongside information that could prove helpful in his mission. The target is highly trained and extremely experienced. Pierce's voice appears again. Do not underestimate him. Without uttering a single word, the Winter Soldier takes the file and leaves the room, where his equipment was waiting alongside a fully fueled plane, ready to take him to his destination. On the next day, MJ took Lily to school while Peter stayed home and hacked into some government databases to find the home addresses for each member of the World Security Council. Luckily, each of them is a prominent public figure, which leaves them open to public scrutiny. They couldn't just live in safe houses, as people would catch on to their odd behavior. Thankfully, this makes finding them an easy task. Though, since they are easy to find, that means the security around them should be extremely strict. Naturally, Peter would be able to bypass any mundane safeguards effortlessly. The perks of being a sorcerer just keep growing, Peter thought as he sent all of their home addresses to his phone for later use. In order to save time, each member of the World Security Council would be detained in the tower, where a long investigation and interrogation would determine which of them were Hydra plants. Of course, Peter knew which ones were dirty, though he had no proof to show it, except for Alexander Pierce, who Peter caught in a conversation with Zola. 
In actuality, that conversation was faked with the Reality Stone, as catching high-level Hydra members like Pierce and Zola in a conversation like that would take a lot of work and luck. Peter simply used the ether to make a phone, which played out the whole conversation whilst he recorded it on his computer with an AUX cable. Using the memory of Zola's voice from the movie and videos of Alexander Pierce speaking in the news and other media, Peter was able to perfectly recreate their voices. No amount of analysis would be able to prove it false, nor would anyone be able to cross-reference phone records, as Hydra members use all sorts of encrypted communications, which wouldn't leave any records behind. I wouldn't be surprised if they actually had a similar conversation as well, Peter thought as his phone buzzed and a text message appeared. Opening it, Peter found a long message from Fury with the address of each shield base all around the world. I guess it's time to get to work. After sending a message to MJ and May, explaining that he would be gone for the entire day, Peter made himself invisible and started his tour of the world, portal by portal. There are 195 countries in the world and 193 of them are members of the United Nations. Thankfully, Peter didn't need to visit every country. Only the major ones that SHIELD deemed worthy of building large-scale bases and other facilities. Places like Canada, the USA, China, Russia, India, Australia, Germany, Brazil, France, the UK, Japan, Afghanistan, etc. Although he didn't have to visit every known country in the world, most of the countries on Fury's list had at least two addresses, leaving Peter much more work than he originally thought. Opening a portal to the top of a skyscraper in Shanghai, China, Peter leaped across to the adjacent building. Did you hear that? A heavily armed guard, who was posted on the rooftop, asks in Mandarin. No. Another guard grunts as they search the wide open roof with a single glance. Are you okay? Yeah, maybe it was just the wind. He answers confusingly. Maybe you should lay off the caffeine? While the guards obliviously talked amongst themselves, Peter waved his hand and activated the reality stone, hiding his actions from the nearby cameras and guards. With his work hidden, Peter conjured a complicated spell circle, which covered the entire rooftop and melted into the floor. As of late, Peter has been casting spells without a spell circle, but a complicated spell that needs to activate upon command, and trigger all of the other spells across the globe as well took a level of expertise that Peter just didn't have yet. Once the spell lines disappeared into the building, Peter left the roof and deactivated the reality stone before portaling to his next destination. One by one, Peter visited underground bunkers, tall towers, government buildings, hidden facilities, and a plethora of other shield bases. Over and over, Peter disguised his work with the ether, placed the spell, and portaled to the next spot. By the time he was finished, the day turned to night and the night turned back to day. Without a second of rest, Peter visited 92 shield bases before heading back to the tower, where he explained everything to the council, as well as Steve and Peggy, who were invited to join the mission briefing. Damn, I didn't know we had so many bases. Peggy comments in shock. When I was in charge, we only had around 46 and I thought that was a lot at the time. We've been expanding. World Council's orders. Fury says as if he had a bad taste in his mouth. Right? Peter utters as he stands up and stretches his tired body. I'm heading home to take a nap. We'll start the operation tomorrow during peak work hours. Of course, Steve wanted to get things done as soon as possible, but he held his tongue. Without Peter's help, this entire situation would be a million times harder than it already was. Waiting another day wouldn't hurt anything. Touching down in an undisclosed landing strip in upstate New York, a private jet slows to a stop and the door falls open. As the steps unfold leading to the ground, a deadpan-faced Bucky Barnes walks down the steps with a large duffel bag across his back. A few meters away from the plane sat a blocked-out sports car, which Bucky entered immediately. With the push of a button, the engine roared to life and the car peeled off, leaving black tire tracks on the landing strip. Turn left in 500 feet. Instantly, the GPS in the car came to life, mapping out a route straight to New York City. Portaling to his room, Peter changed his clothes and heads toward the bathroom to take a nice long shower. 7, 8, 9, 10. Ready or not. Here I come. Peter heard an unfamiliar kid's voice from the living room. Is that Lily's friend? Detouring from his shower plan, Peter headed downstairs, where he found the same kid from before searching the house with a smile on his face. Just as he was about to open the small door under the stairs, Miles turned to see Peter walking down the stairs. Ah, uh, you're Lily's dad, right? Miles asks awkwardly. Yeah, you playing hide and seek? Peter asks back and Miles nods to him in confirmation. Then don't bother looking on the first floor. Lily usually hides upstairs. Thanks. Miles excitedly runs past Peter and heads upstairs. Suddenly, as Miles left the first floor, Lily poked her head out of the cupboard under the stairs. Thanks for the assist, Dad. Lily whispers with a smirk as she tiptoes out of the cupboard, rushing to hug her father. Welcome back. I missed you. Although he was only gone for 24 hours, it was actually the longest amount of time that Peter and Lily were separated since her birth. I missed you too. Peter smiles warmly as combs his hand through her hair. Where's your mom? In the kitchen? Lily says as she runs off to follow Miles upstairs, hoping to hide in a room that he already checked. 
Strolling into the kitchen, Peter found MJ and May eating takeout on the counter. Yo, I'm back. Peter says with a wave. Welcome back. MJ says as she pulls him into a hug, though after a single sniff, she instantly pushed him away. You stink. Go take a shower. What, you don't like my stank? Peter asks as he pulls her back into his chest. That's what over 24 hours in my suit get you, you. MJ groans as she pushes him away and picks up a bottle of air freshener, spraying it in his direction. Get back. Back. Fine, I'll take a shower. Peter says as he dodges the cloud of lavender-scented chemicals. Good. MJ says as she holsters her cleaning spray. Before Peter could leave the kitchen, May spoke up. Did you see Miles yet? She asks with a smile on her face. He was here yesterday too, but you missed it. He's such a sweet boy. Maybe he'll become Lily's childhood sweetheart. Yes, I just saw him dash Peter said as he did his best to ignore his aunt's usual romantic daydreams, though he soon froze in his steps and looked back over his shoulder in confusion. Wait, did you say Miles? Yeah, why? MJ asks as she could tell that Peter was acting weird. What's his last name? Peter asks questioningly. I think Lily said it was Morales? May says uncertainly. Miles Morales. As soon as he realized who the little boy running around his house actually was, Peter walked off in shock and hopped into the shower, leaving the woman in his life confused by his odd behavior. Either he's some lookalike with the same name, which isn't very likely, or that kid is the real Miles Morales. Peter thought as the hot water poured over his body. The question was would this Miles get spider-related powers or not? Just the fact that he is Miles Morales makes it highly likely that he'll be bestowed some sort of power sooner or later. I wonder what he would call himself. Peter thought as he finished up in the shower and got dressed in some clean clothes. Since Peter's alive and has no plans of dying anytime soon, Miles wouldn't be able to take up the Spider-Man mantle, leaving him no choice but to pick a different name. Leaving the bathroom, Peter went to his room and tiredly crawled into bed, thinking about what to do about his daughter's newest friend. I win. Peter heard Lily yelling and laugh from the living room. I'll just leave the kid alone. If he gets some spider-related powers, then I'll help him out. Otherwise, I'll just treat him normally, Peter thought as he drifted off to sleep, tired from traveling across the world and casting so many spells. Arriving in New York City by nightfall, Bucky started surveillance on the Avengers Tower, waiting for Fury to make an appearance. Based on the information in the file, he knew that Fury spent most of his time in the tower, where he even had a penthouse apartment to spend his nights. Sitting snugly across the street in a window on the lower floors of a skyscraper, the Winter Soldier peered through a sniper's scope at the main entrance of the Avengers Tower. Hours passed as all sorts of people came and left, but not a single one of them matched the description of his target. This is pointless. Bucky thought as he packed up and left the building. The sniper plan was worth a try, but Fury was far too experienced to simply walk out into his crosshair. He most likely take some sort of hidden exit. He thought as he opened Fury's file in the car and thought of his next move. Flipping through Nick Fury's file, Bucky found an interesting piece of information. Known family. The file detailed a secret wife and daughter, whom Fury hid from everyone but his most trusted agents, who guard the two women on occasion. The only reason Hydra knew about Grace and MJ was thanks to one of their plants, who happened to be good friends with one of Fury's most trusted agents. After a few drinks among friends, the secret was uttered in a hushed whisper and by the next day, Hydra was informed of Nicholas Fury's best-kept secret. His family. With plan A ending in failure, Bucky formulated his plan B as he drove to an address listed in the file. Arriving at his destination in the middle of the night, Bucky found a small home in a mediocre neighborhood. Driving past the house, Bucky didn't even bother looking at it as he searched for any possible guards put in place by Fury. 1, 2, 3, Bucky internally counted each group of S.H.I.E.L.D. agents in the vicinity of the house. Not passing through again, as it would spook the agents on guard, Bucky parked a few blocks away and exited his car with a silenced pistol in hand. Blending into the darkness, Bucky used the nearby houses, fences, and shrubbery to sneakily make his way to each set of guards. With the expertise of a Grandmaster Assassin, the Winter Soldier silently slaughtered each group of S.H.I.E.L.D. guards before finally focusing on his main destination. The House of Grace Watson, Fury's secret wife. Leaving a surveillance van, two cars, and a House of Dead S.H.I.E.L.D. agents behind, Bucky strolled up to the house and rang the doorbell. Hello Dash Grace answered in confusion, as she didn't know why anyone would visit her so late at night. Though that confusion instantly turned to shock and fear as the barrel of a silenced pistol appeared in her face. Inside now, Bucky commanded as Grace stepped back in disbelief, welcoming the infamous Winter Soldier into her home. Give me your cell phone? Closing the door behind him, Bucky held his free hand out expectantly. Although Grace has the power of Captain America, she didn't have any training or experience in things like this, so her reaction to having a gun in her face is just like any other normal person's. Compliance. H here Grace rushes to hand over her phone. Snatching the phone, Bucky opened the camera and took a picture. Sit. Bucky orders as he waves toward the couch with his gun. Gladly taking a seat, as it gave her the opportunity to make some space between herself and the armed invader, Grace watched cautiously as Bucky fiddled with her phone. 
Once he was done, the Winter Soldier sat silently across from her with his pistol on his lap, waiting patiently. Thankfully, MJ is staying at Peter's, Grace thought in relief. Though, if she were here, MJ could probably capture Bucky and disarm the situation fairly quickly. Of course, as a mother, Grace didn't care about that. To her, as long as her daughter was out of harm's way, then she would be relieved. As Fury sat in his office in the tower going over all sorts of mission reports, his phone buzzed and lit up on the table. Question mark. Fury was surprised to see who was texting him so later at night. Grace never texts at this time. Opening the message, Fury's face instantly hardens as he glares down at his phone. The message was an invitation to come over, alongside a picture of his wife with the barrel of a silenced pistol in her face. Without wasting a single second, Fury opened his desk drawer and pulled out a large caliber pistol before heading to the door with a pissed off look on his face. As soon as Grace felt threatened when she answered the door, Peter was jolted awake by an odd feeling. Staring around the room in confusion, Peter sat up as he wondered what was going on. After a few seconds, coordinates appeared in Peter's mind as he fully realized what was going on. The spell activated? As he pulled up and parked in his driveway, Fury rushed out of the car with a Desert Eagle in hand, ready to put some big holes in whoever dared threaten his family. Bam, kicking in the front door, Fury held his pistol at the ready as he strode inside like a trained professional. Immediately, he came face to face with the Winter Soldier, who already had his gun pointed at Fury's wife. Nick! Grace exclaimed happily. What do you want? Fury asked as he ignored his lovely wife for the moment. Of course, Bucky wore his trademark Winter Soldier face mask, making it impossible for anyone to identify him. Fury may be able to recognize him from Steve's file, though the mask would have to go first. A life for a life, the Winter Soldier states as he keeps his pistol trained on Grace. In exchange for sparing her life, you will give up your own? Dealing with a man like Fury is a difficult thing, but when you know a person's weakness, everything becomes 100x easier. Shoot her. A new voice appears in the room, and everyone turns to see Spider-Man leaning against a nearby wall as if he was there the entire time. No. Don't shoot her. Fury yells as he turns his glare to Peter. Why not? Peter asks as he ignores Fury and looks at the masked gunman. What's the matter, Bucky? Don't have it in you to kill her? When Peter arrived, he didn't think that it would be the Winter Soldier who activated Grace's protection, but he wouldn't complain about it. Bucky's eyes go wide as he heard his real name after so many years. What's the matter, Sergeant Barnes? Peter asks as he could see the conflict appear in Bucky's movement. Feeling off? Maybe it's the brainwashing you've been through. Why don't you lay down and take a nice nap? Shut up! Bucky yelled as he grabbed his aching head. Though in doing so, he stopped aiming at Grace. Exclamation point. Taking the opportunity, Fury took aim and was about to fire his weapon but. Sadly for him, Peter acted first and ripped the pistol from his hand with an expertly shot web. Question mark. Realizing what almost happened, Bucky snapped out of his odd state, took aim at his captive, and pulled the trigger multiple times. No. Fury yelled in horror as he rushed forward. Swiftly appearing in front of his wife, Fury shields her body with his own as he looks for any wounds that needed treating. Luckily for him, Bucky emptied his entire clip into Grace, leaving no more bullets for his actual target. H he shot me. Grace mutters in shock. Oh relax. Peter comments as he walks over to Bucky. Sleep. With a single word, the Winter Soldier fell completely unconscious in his chair. What the hell did you do? Fury yells furiously at Peter, as he fussed over his wife. She isn't hurt. Peter says as he gestures to the pile of flattened bullets in Grace's lap. Stop freaking out. Ha! Huh? Fury grunted as he calmed down and realized that his wife was perfectly fine. How? Of course, the protection that Peter placed on all of his loved ones didn't just inform him when they were in danger, it also placed a barrier over their body, which could easily handle pistol fire. Peter was never worried about Grace's safety to begin with. Magic. Peter answers with a smirk under his mask. You're welcome, by the way. How the hell did you know to come here? Fury asks as he pulls another gun from his black trench coat and takes aim at Peter. Meanwhile, Grace was still freaking out about being shot at and the infamous Winter Soldier slept peacefully in his chair with his metal arm hanging limply off the side. I followed you. Peter lies with a shrug as he looks toward Grace. Is this your way of thanking me? You seem pretty protective of her. Is she your wife or something? Peter tried to play it all off and was succeeding too. Though, just as Fury started to lower his gun, Grace, who was still frazzled from her near-death experience, looked at Peter and started yelling. He shot at me. She glared at him with a blaming look in her eyes. You told him to shoot at me, Peter. With just a few words spoken without thought, due to her extremely emotional state, Grace outed Peter's real name and caused all of his lies to come crashing down. Peter. Fury muttered in contemplation as realization dawned on him. Peter Parker? Thanks, Grace. Why don't you just tell the whole neighborhood? Peter muttered as he pulled up his mask, revealing his smirking face. Hey, father-in-law. Fury, being the man he is, didn't bother replying verbally and grimaced as he raised his gun and started firing. Bang bang bang, 
The sound of gunshots filled the house as Fury put some fairly large holes in the walls, missing every shot on Peter, who easily dodged each projectile sent his way. Stop. Grace yelled over and over, but Fury was far too focused on killing his son-in-law to hear a word she was saying. Unwilling to watch her husband destroy the house any more than he already has, Grace launched off of the couch with the speed of a cheetah and ripped the gun from his hands, bending it with her supernatural strength in the process. Stop messing up my house! Grace exclaimed furiously as she tossed the destroyed pistol on the couch. What the hell? Fury thought in surprise. Thanks for that. Peter says as he falls from the ceiling and lands beside Grace. And you. Grace turns her poisonous gaze away from Fury and locks onto Peter. Slap, Grace wound back her arm back like a professional and slapped Peter across the face as hard as she could, which was a lot after her enhancement. Of course, his spider senses went off immediately, though Peter decided to let Grace do as she wished, leaving a red handprint on his face. You let him shoot me. Grace yelled as her eyes started to tear up. I thought I was going to die, so excuse me for revealing your stupid secret. It's not stupid. Peter mutters under his breath. Shut up. Grace storms over to the door and holds it open. Out. As soon as Fury saw that Peter was getting kicked out, a shit-eating grin formed on his lips, enjoying the moment immensely. What are you smiling about? Grace asks as her head turns to Fury. You're not staying, either. In an instant, Fury's good mood was completely ruined. And take that assassin with you? Grace yells as Peter puts his mask back on and lifts Bucky over his shoulder. What did I do? Fury asks incredulously. Without uttering a single word, Grace gestures to the living room walls, which were peppered with large caliber bullet holes. I'll send MJ to check on you, Peter says sympathetically as he walks out with Bucky over his shoulder. Come on, father-in-law. We got work to do. Don't call me that. Fury spat as he reluctantly followed Peter out. Bam, as both men left the house, Grace slammed the door behind them and locked it shut. She's never been this mad at me before. Peter commented as he walked up to Fury's car. Well, welcome to the club. Fury says, as he was used to being the focus of his wife's ire. Open the trunk? Peter called out as he waited at the back of the car. Why? Just portal him to the detainment floor? Fury said as he didn't plan on leaving the house. After all, all of the guards he posted are dead, leaving his wife and daughter open to another attack. Speaking of his daughter, where's MJ? Fury asks worriedly, though he hid it well. She's at my house and she doesn't need protection, if that's what you're thinking. Peter says as he motions to the trunk. Now open the trunk. We need to talk anyway, so let's do it on the ride back. Peering back at the house, Fury looked extremely reluctant to leave. Grace doesn't need protection either. Peter says as he stands there waiting. I placed a protection spell on her and MJ when we started dating. That's how you knew to come. Fury muttered in realization. It also protected her from the bullets and will continue to do so. Peter says as he whips out his phone and sends a quick text. MJ will be here soon anyway, so you shouldn't worry. Fury didn't know why MJ being with her mother would lessen his worries. In fact, two targets in the same location is a jackpot for any assassin. Of course, it should be easy for him to deduce that his daughter is Silk, but Fury's mind refused to put two and two together when it came to his little princess. At least, for the time being. Fine, let's go. Fury hit a button on his keychain, popping the trunk open. With some sort of magic spell protecting his family, Fury wanted nothing more than to interrogate the man who was currently being loaded into his trunk. Slamming the trunk shut, Peter hopped in the passenger seat, joining Fury in the car. Reaching his hand out to the center console, Peter was instantly reprimanded. Don't touch the radio. Fury practically commanded as he reversed out of the driveway and drove off. The car remained quiet for the first few minutes, as Fury refused to say a word, leaving Peter in an awkward situation. Suddenly, Peter's phone buzzed. MJ is with Grace, Peter says as he finished reading his phone. Good. Fury said as he wondered how she got there so quickly. Although he thought it was odd, there was far too much on his mind at the moment to care about something so insignificant. So, you know it's me now? Peter says awkwardly. I guess that I can't mess with you anymore. It just won't be the same. Now that you mention it, I owe you a few more bullets for that shit you pulled. Fury says as he remembered every time Peter F. at Ked with him. Reaching under the steering wheel, he pulled out another pistol and turned the barrel toward Peter. Okay, let's focus on the road, Peter says as he snatches the gun away and tosses it in the back seat. Of course, Fury isn't the type to give up, so he pulled another five guns, which were all swiftly taken from him. Seriously? What do you need that many pistols for? Peter asks as he pointed at the pile of guns in the back seat. Why are you dating my daughter? Fury asks pointedly. Because if it's just a mess with me, then it's time to put an end to it. From Fury's perspective, Peter has constantly used his relationship with his daughter to troll him, so he couldn't help but feel suspicious about his son-in-law's motives. Sorry, but you aren't that special, Peter says with a small laugh. I started dating MJ before I even knew that you existed and I won't be breaking up with her anytime soon. Silence filled the car once again, though Fury was the one to break it this time. How old are you? He asked. 
Don't pretend that you didn't run an extensive background check on me when I started dating your daughter, Peter scoffs, knowing that Fury knew a lot about him. But I'll answer. If only to keep the conversation going. I'm 17, you hid your age well, I'll give you that. Fury was impressed that someone so young could do everything that Peter has done. I still hate you though. Unlike his words, Fury's inner thoughts were a bit different. Behind his prickly exterior, Fury begrudgingly found himself approving of his daughter's taste in men. Before, Fury thought that Peter was just some ballsy kid, who would soon enough bite off more than he could chew, but now that's all changed. After all, Spider-Man is a man that Fury has a lot of respect for, though he would never say so out loud, especially after today's revelation. Love you too, father-in-law, Peter says as they pull into the tower's underground garage. Stop calling me that. When the car was parked, Peter hopped out and retrieved the unconscious Winter Soldier from the trunk. So, Peter spoke as he followed Fury into an elevator with Bucky over his shoulder. I didn't piss you off enough that you'll reveal my identity, right? Fury didn't say a word, which only worried Peter even more, but when he finally spoke, it wasn't the answer he was hoping for. What did you do to Grace? She's a lot stronger than I remember. I'll tell you if you promise to keep my secret, Peter offers, though Fury didn't respond at all this time. He's messing with me? I'll just ask Grace, Fury thought. Although Peter knew that Fury was returning the favor from all of Peter's prior actions, he couldn't help but wonder whether he would cross the line. After all, it's all fun and games until secret identities are blown, ding before Peter could say anything else, the elevator doors open to the detainment floor. Come on, let's find him a good cell? Fury says, enjoying the power he has now. After a moment of thought, Peter decided that he wouldn't feed into Fury's revenge and just trust that his fellow councilman and friend wouldn't screw him over. After a short walk, Fury walked up to a control panel and started opening a nearby cell. These cells aren't good enough, Peter shook his head and kept walking deeper into the prison, as these cells were far too weak for a super soldier like Bucky. Is it because of his arm? Fury asks as he wondered what Peter knew about their captive. Do you know who we captured? Peter asks Fury as they pass all sorts of security checks to get to a more fortified portion of the prison. No idea, but I'm guessing that you do. Fury says as he remembered Peter calling their prisoner Bucky when he was awake earlier. I'll explain once he's in his cell, Peter says as they walk up to an extremely fortified cell with a familiar man inside, drinking a cup of tea in what could only be described as the best prison cell anyone could ask for. He has a whole living room with a TV, a kitchen with working appliances, a bathroom with running water, and a bedroom, which also had a TV. There was even a Wi-Fi signal. Truly an introvert's dream, though everything couldn't be perfect. Although it was just like any other apartment outside of prison, the walls were sadly made of glass, allowing the security cameras as well as anyone that passes by to see everything happening inside. Including the bathroom. Spider-Man, it's been a while since you've visited me personally. The man spoke in surprise with his English accent. I may not visit, Blonsky, but I read each and every status report on you. Peter says as he walks over to a control panel and opens the cell directly across from the abomination. Who do you think allowed you to have your entire apartment? How's the Wi-Fi signal, any good? It's good enough to pass the time, so thanks, I suppose. Blonsky says as he watches Peter lay, an unconscious and masked man in the cell across from his. Who's my new roommate? Maybe he'll tell you when he wakes up? Peter gave a non-answer as he waved his hand over Bucky's limp body. Instantly, his mask disappeared, and his clothes were replaced with an inmate's uniform that matched Blonsky's. Everything that was on him seconds earlier appeared in a box next to Fury, except for his metal arm. Peter left his arm alone for two reasons. One, even if he hammered away with it for hundreds of years, Bucky wouldn't be able to break out of his cell, and two, leaving the guy armless just seemed cruel and unnecessary. I didn't know Spider-Man could do magic. Blonsky said in wonder as he watched it all with his very own eyes. Well, I didn't know anyone could do magic. We all learn something new every day, Peter says as he walks out of Bucky's cell and locks it up tightly with the push of a button. So, Blonsky. I've actually been meaning to come talk to you. Really? Am I being released on good behavior? He asks jokingly. Maybe. Peter says, shocking both Fury and the Abomination. What do you mean maybe? Blonsky asks rather eagerly. Well, as I said, I've been reading every single one of your status reports, or should I say progress reports, Peter says as he picked up the box with Bucky's stuff. Your psychologist seems to think that your extreme aggression and destructive behavior was due to the Abomination part of you, which you seem to have under control these days. Yes, it wasn't easy, but with a little soul-searching and hours upon hours of therapy, the need to destroy everything in sight just faded away. Blonsky says as he walked away from his precious furniture and electronics. Want to see? Before anyone could reply, Blonsky quickly morphed into a familiar hulking humanoid lizard-like monster. See? Blonsky said in a slightly distorted tone. I'm in complete control. As he says this, Blonsky began to shrink and turn back into his human self, though his clothes were ripped to shreds, leaving him completely naked. Sorry, I can't exactly fix this part. Blonsky covers his dangly bits with his hands. Here, 
Peter waves his hand and a new set of clothes appeared on him. That magic of yours is amazing? Blonsky looks down at his new clothes in interest before turning back to Peter. So, do I pass the test? The first one? Peter says cryptically as he turns and walks off, with Fury following behind. Hey, what else do I have to do? Blonsky yelled as he rushed to the glass of his cell. Wait, come back. As Peter and Fury took the elevator up to the council chambers, Fury spoke up. You plan on recruiting the abomination? Fury asks, sounding both interested and hesitant. No, I plan to recruit Emil Blonsky. Peter replies matter-of-factly. You saw him. Unlike Banner, who's afraid of his own shadow and refuses to leave his lab, Blonsky actually learned control. Banner has done nothing but try to cure himself since he joined the Avengers, though technically he's not an agent, but a scientist they hired, so he didn't have to go through the training like everyone else. Even Peter's small hints about how he should handle the Hulk are mostly ignored in favor of concocting serums to, hopefully, kill the green beast inside of himself. Although I agree with you, he could be playing us, Fury said cautiously. Which is why the only way he'll ever leave that cell is with a few precautions in place, though we can talk about this at another time. It's not like he's going anywhere. Arriving at the council chambers, Peter sets Bucky's belongings down. Jarvis, let Steve, Peggy, and Tony know that they're needed here urgently. Peter spoke to the air. Yes, sir. Jarvis answers dutifully. Question mark. Fury looked confused as Peter only called a certain group of people instead of the council as he suspected. Just wait and you'll see. Peter tells him as he curiously looks through Bucky's belongings. The first people to arrive were Steve and Peggy, who rushed over thinking it had something to do with Hydra. Of course, Peter refused to speak without Tony, who was late as always. Ugh. What could possibly be so urgent that I need to wake up at 3 in the morning? Tony asks as he grumpily walks in with his pajamas on. Alright, he's here. What's this about? Steve asks eagerly. Fury, tell us about the myth of the Winter Soldier. Peter starts off the conversation. Instantly, a look of realization appeared on Fury's face. He's the boogeyman of every operative around the world. A master assassin that is said to be responsible for all sorts of high-level assassinations, including JFK, Fury explains. But he's not real, Peggy speaks up as she knew all about the stories from her time as the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. The Winter Soldier is just the guy you blame when you don't know who really did it. Wrong, Peter says with a shake of his head. The Winter Soldier is real, and he's currently in the cell next to Abomination. Okay, this is great that you caught the nightmare of all S.H.I.E.L.D. agents, but I need my beauty sleep so, Tony says as he turns and starts walking to the door. He killed your parents, Tony, Peter reveals, stopping his friend in his tracks. No, my parents were killed in a car accident, Tony denied as he turned to look Peter straight in the eyes. No, they weren't, Fury says, shocking everyone in the room. The only one in the room who wasn't surprised by this reveal was Peggy, who still had high-level shield clearance at the time. We covered it up as an accident, but Howard and your mother were killed, there's surveillance video of it, Fury explains further. Tony didn't know what to say. Why? They had vials of super soldier serum with them and Hydra wanted it. Peter answers. So, the Winter Soldier is a Hydra agent? Steve joins the conversation. Yes and no. Peter says confusingly. What does that mean? Peggy asks. Jarvis put the security camera footage for our newest prisoner on the big screen. Peter says as a live video of Bucky sleeping face up in his cell appears. Immediately, Steve rushes up to the screen to get a better look as he couldn't believe his eyes. The Winter Soldier may be a Hydra agent, but he's also a member of the Howling Commandos. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.